Web novel fanfiction TG the good. The latest of the latest. Chapter 1. Darkness. It was all the human eye could see. No matter where one looked it would follow as if it was infinite. No beginning nor end. If a person had to describe such a place then it would without a doubt be null or abyss. As one stared into the abyss, a sense of unease would start to creep up on them. The darkness seemed to be alive, pulsing with malevolent energy that seemed to be reaching out to grab at the very essence of their being. The air was cold and clammy, almost suffocating, as if there was no oxygen to breathe. There were no sounds, no movement, no signs of life. It was as if time had stood still, frozen in an eternal moment of emptiness. The darkness was so complete that it was impossible to see one's own hand in front of their face. Even if one were to scream at the top of their lungs, their voice would be swallowed up by the void, leaving them with only their thoughts as their company. As one continued to gaze into the abyss, one might start to feel a sense of vertigo or disorientation, as if one were falling through an endless void. It was a sensation that could only be described as a deep, existential dread as if one were being consumed by the darkness itself. It was a place where all hope seems lost, where the only thing left was the endless expanse of nothingness. A place where one's mind could easily wander, trapped in an eternal loop of despair and hopelessness. It was a place where even the bravest of souls would falter, and only the strongest would be able to hold on to their sanity. In the end, the abyss was a place of darkness, a place where nothing could thrive, and where only the void reigned supreme. It was a reminder of the infinite power of emptiness and the fragility of life in the face of nothingness. But despite all this, there floating in the abyss was a soul. The soul had been floating in the abyss for what seemed like an eternity. At first, there was a sense of panic, confusion, and denial about what had happened. But as time passed, the soul began to accept the reality of their situation. They had died, and this was their afterlife. To pass the time, the soul began to recall all their memories of manga and anime. They remembered the stories, the characters, and the worlds they had been immersed in. It was a welcome distraction from the emptiness that surrounded them. As the years passed, the soul's memories began to blend together, creating a new world in their mind. A world where he lived his life to the fullest, free from everything that shackled him down in his past life. But something began to change within the soul. As he spent more and more time in the abyss, his essence began to shift. The pure white light that had once defined them began to fade, replaced by a swirling mixture of purple and black. It was as if the darkness was seeping into their very being, transforming them from the inside out. Months had passed since the soul had begun its descent into the abyss, its essence slowly transforming into a darker, more ominous energy. As time went on, the once pure light became a distant memory, replaced by a swirling, chaotic mixture of purple and black. But just as the soul thought it was lost forever in the darkness, something unexpected happened. Without warning, a rift tore open in the fabric of space, and a humanoid figure emerged from within. The figure stood tall and imposing, with an aura of power and authority emanating from its very being. The humanoid figure stood there, gazing intently at the swirling mass of dark energy that was the soul. As the two beings stared at each other, a sense of curiosity seemed to pass between them. The humanoid figure's expression was unreadable, and the soul was unsure if it was being judged or simply observed. For what felt like an eternity, the two beings remained locked in their silent gaze. The soul felt as if it was being stripped bare as if the figure could see every thought and memory that had ever passed through its mind. As the seconds ticked by, the soul found itself wanting to know more about the figure. Who was it? What was it doing there? And most importantly, was there a way out of the abyss? Just as the soul was about to speak, something unexpected happened. I apologize for the delay. Finding someone in this vast space isn't an easy task, the figure said, surprising the soul. I understand that you have questions, and I'm here to answer them. However, I think it would be better if we changed our surroundings first, he continued, snapping his fingers. As he did so, a portal began to form in front of them, causing the space to ripple and warp. The soul hesitated for a moment, unsure of what lay beyond the portal. But the figure seemed trustworthy, and the soul was desperate for answers. Without a second thought, the
the soul stepped through the portal, feeling a rush of energy as it passed through. On the other side, the darkness had dissipated, replaced by a vast expanse of blue skies and clouds. It was a breathtaking sight, one that the soul had never seen before. The figure turned towards the soul and spoke, Welcome to my humble personal realm. This is a place that transcends time and space, a domain where I reign supreme. I have been known by many names over the eons, God, Death, the Grim Reaper, the Big Bang, the One above all, but most mortals simply refer to me as Rob. A God huh? The soul muttered as he began to think. I never believed in things that people didn't have proof of or things I never saw before. But even I would have to admit that something supernatural had to happen with humans. People say that Adam and Eve were the first humans, but is that true? And if so, how do we know if this is true? Like Eisen said, all living things believe in someone superior to them, and cannot live unless they blindly follow them. Then, the objects of their faith try to escape this crushing pressure by seeking another being that is superior to them to believe in. And they, in turn, seek a stronger being still. That is how all kings are born. That is how. All gods are born. Am I here to be judged whether I go to heaven or hell? The soul asked tentatively. The figure, who introduced himself as Rob, let out a small laugh. No, you are not here to be judged, he said, shaking his head. It's partially my fault you ended up in such a situation. You see, I manage what you mortals call the cycle of reincarnation. It is my duty to ensure that souls do not stray from that cycle. The soul breathed a sigh of relief at the reassurance that it wasn't facing judgment. So, what happens now? It asked, seeking clarity. Sending you back won't be possible any longer, Rob replied with a hint of regret. Straying away from the cycle of reincarnation results in most cases in death. The void that you were in is a place that's even dangerous for gods, so your entire existence in itself is extraordinary. Instead of getting corrupted or going mad, you instead became accustomed to the point of absorbing its essence, he spoke with a sense of both admiration and curiosity. As the soul sat there digesting all this new information Rob continued. I understand that this may seem like a convenient plot device, but that's beside the point. Unfortunately, you cannot be sent back to the cycle of reincarnation, nor can you stay here. Instead, I will be sending you to a random anime world of my choosing. It won't be any world you have seen before, so you will be completely in the dark about what's happening around you. It will be up to you to get stronger and live your life to the fullest in this new world. The soul sat motionless, with its non-existent eyes closed, processing all the information that had just been imparted to it. After a few moments of silence, the soul asked, Will the darkness that I have absorbed have any negative impact on me? No, it won't have any negative effects on you. On the contrary, it will help you significantly in the world I will be sending you. You might feel some immediate changes in your personality, although the changes in you would only be a bit enhanced when dealing with certain situations or people. Overall, it will benefit you. I suggest you embrace and accept this new power. Taking a sigh of relief the soul thanked Rob for what he did for him. It's no problem, replied Rob, casually waving off the thanks. In fact, I'll be transmigrating you into a brand new world. You also won't be getting new parents or anything like that, since you have no need for them right? To which the soul nodded in agreement. Once you wake up, you'll find yourself as a baby, in front of the orphanage. You don't have to worry about figuring out when or where the plot starts as I'll make sure to send you a message when it's time to jump into action. As the soul listened to Rob's unsettling words, a wave of alarm washed over him. What do you mean by, jump into action? Am I nothing more than a pawn in some twisted game? Rob chuckled, his eyes glinting with a mixture of amusement and world-weary boredom. Well, you could say that. After living for as long as I have, things tend to lose their luster. Sending you into a random world adds a touch of excitement to my existence. Consider it a diversion, a way to pass the time. But before you rudely interrupted me, he continued, a mischievous smile playing on his lips, seventeen years may seem like an eternity, but trust me, it will pass by in the blink of an eye. So, my dear Reiji Sukahiro, make sure you prepare yourself well for the trials that await. And remember this, your potential is as deep as the abyss. 
never limit yourself. With those final words, Rob snapped his fingers, and in an instant, everything was enveloped in a blinding flash of light. Reiji's senses were overwhelmed as the world around him vanished into nothingness. Chapter 2 17 Years Later Location, Somewhere Above Tokyo Inside a plane flying above the clouds was our protagonist, Reiji. Contrary to people's expectations, instead of waking up in Japan, he found himself in South Korea, lying inside a cradle in front of an orphanage. The situation left him confused and disoriented, especially since he didn't understand the language spoken around him. However, thanks to his adaptable infant mind, he quickly learned to adapt to the language. When Reiji reached the suitable age of eight, he began preparing for the world's plot. It didn't take a genius to understand that Reiji was in a fantasy world. This realization was reinforced when Rob, the one who bestowed powers upon him, advised, I suggest you accept this power and get stronger. Even in a normal world, Reiji knew that such intense training would benefit him in the long run. Reiji made the most of his time, dedicating himself to rigorous workouts that pushed his body to its limits. He diligently followed the caped baldies workout and explored various other training techniques. Additionally, he spent countless hours honing his skills with the spear, recognizing it as his weapon of choice. The simplicity of the spear's design allowed him to unleash his creativity, leading him to devise unique variations of the weapon. He even experimented with adding attachments like the kuzurigama. Given that South Korea hosted numerous sojitsu martial art tournaments, Reiji participated in as many as possible, earning recognition and even acquiring a title for his exceptional fighting style though that tale deserves its own telling. To repay the orphanage for what they did for him, Reiji helped out by acquiring a job and babysitting the other kids when the caretakers needed a break or were completing other tasks. It never bothered him too much, as Reiji's soft spot for kids had transferred over from his past life. As Reiji gazed out the window, he noticed the plane was preparing for landing. He had received a message from Rob, which both surprised and stunned him. He had always known that he would eventually have to leave, but he never expected it to be in Japan. When he informed the orphanage of his departure, they questioned him about it, but he simply said it was due to an offer he received after winning a tournament. Their farewell was rather heartfelt, and Reiji promised to visit them annually and stay in touch. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now on final approach to Narita Airport. The landing gear has been lowered, and we will be touching down shortly. Please remain seated with your seatbelt securely fastened until the aircraft comes to a complete stop at the gate. Thank you for flying with us, and we hope you enjoy your stay in Tokyo. Sighing in relief, Reiji leaned back into his seat in contentment. While staying seated for almost three hours isn't much, it still stiffens the body to an uncomfortable degree. As the wheels of the aircraft touched down, Reiji felt a slight jolt. The plane taxied toward the gate, and the passengers waited patiently for it to come to a complete stop. Once the plane halted, the seatbelt signs turned off, and Reiji got up from his seat to retrieve his belongings from the overhead compartment. He swiftly made his way out of the plane and into the airport. The cool air conditioning hit his face as he walked towards the immigration area, where a long queue had already formed. He patiently waited in line, showing his passport and visa when asked, before finally being allowed to enter Japan. Reiji let out a sigh of relief as he walked towards the luggage carousel. He could see his luggage already being placed on the conveyor belt. Once he retrieved his luggage, he headed towards the exit, where a throng of people was waiting to receive their loved ones. Making his way to a taxi stand, he hailed a cab and provided the driver with the address of the apartment he had previously arranged. The apartment was conveniently located near the school known as Returnees High School, as Rob had informed him. Reiji had researched about the school and at first glance, the school appeared like any other, but Reiji knew there was more to it. It was the setting where the protagonist of this world resided, and where the plot would unfold. As the taxi pulled up to the apartment, Reiji paid the driver and grabbed his belongings from the trunk. He walked into the building, eager to rest and prepare for the next day. Little did he know, his arrival would be the catalyst for a series of events that would change his perception of the world he had been thrown into. The next morning, Reiji woke up early and prepared for his first day of school. 
He got dressed in his school uniform which consisted of a polo blue blazer with white outlines along the collar and pockets, the school insignia on his left breast pocket, a white shirt, and gray pants. Reiji quickly ate a simple breakfast of toast and scrambled eggs, brushed his teeth, made his lunch, put on his shoes, and checked the time. It was around 7 a.m., so he grabbed his school bag and headed out the door. The cool morning air was refreshing as Reiji made his way to Returnee's high school. He walked along the quiet streets, taking in the sights and sounds of his new surroundings. The buildings and shops were different from what he was used to, but he found them intriguing. As he approached the school gates, he noticed a few students already there, chatting and laughing with each other. Adjusting the strap of his backpack, Reiji stepped forward entering the school premises and into the school. As he walked through the halls of the school, Reiji paid no mind to the numerous stares and whispers he received from the other students. He had expected this, as a foreigner after all. Reiji had only one objective in mind, to pick up his class schedules from the faculty room. Walking through the bustling corridors, the sound of the bell echoed through the school, signaling the start of the day. Students began to disperse, hurrying to their respective classrooms. Reiji found himself in the midst of the moving crowd, observing their interactions and trying to navigate his way through. Reiji found himself amidst a crowd of rushing students when he spotted a passing girl with striking brown eyes and black hair. With a quick decision, he approached her and asked, Excuse me, could you give me directions to the faculty room? I'm a new transfer student, and while navigating using room signs is easy, I can't exactly do much with all these students hurrying to class. The girl paused, looking at Reiji with curiosity before flashing a friendly smile. Sure, you just have to continue forward at the end of the hall and turn right. The faculty room will be the first room on your left side. Reiji thanked the girl and made his way to the faculty room. He found it easily enough and entered, where he was greeted by a kind-looking middle-aged woman sitting at a desk. Good morning, how may I help you? She asked with a warm smile. Good morning, I'm a new transfer student. My name is Reiji, and I'm here to pick up my class schedules, he replied. Ah, yes, Reiji Kuen. Welcome to Returnee's High School. Let me get your schedules for you, the woman said, shuffling through some papers on her desk before handing Reiji a packet. Your first class is with Mashima Sensei, and I'll inform him of your arrival. Classes are in session right now, so please be quiet when passing by other classrooms. The room number is labeled on your schedule. Do you have any questions? Reiji shook his head. No, thank you. I have everything I need. Thank you for the help and have a nice day. Great. Well, have a nice first day at school. Don't hesitate to ask if you need anything, she said cheerfully, waving him off as he walked away, gently closing the door behind him. Location, Classroom In the quiet classroom, Mishima Sensei stood at the front of the class, preparing to make an announcement. The students sat at their desks, some chatting amongst themselves, others lost in their own thoughts. Good morning, everyone, Mishima Sensei began, his voice echoing throughout the room. I have some news to share with you all. We have a new transfer student joining us today. As the students' murmurs began to quiet down, a soft knock on the classroom door interrupted the stillness. Mishima Sensei turned towards the door and gestured for the new transfer student to come in. Come in, please, he said, his voice welcoming. The door creaked open, and all eyes turned toward the figure that stepped into the classroom. It was a young man, with sharp, angular features and piercing violet eyes that seemed to scan the room. His jet black hair was styled neatly with a slight wave falling over his forehead. Please introduce yourself to the class, Mishima said. Reiji stared at the class in an observing manner and introduced himself. My name is Reiji Sukahiro. I just moved here from South Korea. My hobbies consist of sleeping, sojitsu, eating sweets, and trying new things. Nice to meet you. Now does anyone have any questions for our new classmate? Mishima asked, looking around the classroom. The students were curious about their new classmates, and questions began pouring in. Reiji answered them all, ranging from his favorite sweets, Mitarashi Dango ice cream, to how he was adjusting to life in Japan. The students were impressed by his fluency in Japanese and his openness to trying new things. 
After several minutes of questioning, Mishima interrupted the chatter. Thank you for answering all of our questions, Reiji. Please take a seat in the middle next to Shirasaki. Reiji made his way to the open seat and was greeted by Kori, a black-haired girl with striking brown eyes. Greeting her, Reiji sat down at his desk as Mishima began teaching and quietly listened to the lecture. Chapter 3 Lunch Break As the lunch bell resounded through the air, Reiji let out a tired sigh and deftly picked up his lunchbox, eager to indulge in a well-earned meal. The lecture was boring while reviewing something already learned may be refreshing to some, others would say it's tiring. Upon opening his lunchbox, Reiji was greeted by a delicious aroma that wafted up to his nose. He smiled as he gazed at the neatly arranged food. Reiji was always meticulous in preparing his lunch, and he took pride in it. Ah, your lunch is so cute. Did you make it yourself, Reiji? A sweet voice asked curiously. Turning his head to the right, he recognized her as the girl who helped him earlier in the hallway. Nodding, Reiji replied, yeah, I made my lunch. Though it's a bit childish, huh? I used to make my siblings lunches when our caretakers were busy, so I kind of did this out of habit. While the majority of Reiji's lunch looked ordinary, his onajirai had a distinctive koala face shape, and his tamagoiki had adorable panda faces peeking out of them. The girl giggled and leaned closer to get a better look at the cute lunch creations. Childish or not, it's absolutely adorable. I wish I had your talent for making such creative lunches. Reiji chuckled, thanking her for the compliment. By the way, I never properly introduced myself. Although you already know this, I'll say it again. I'm Reiji. Reiji Sukahiro. It's a pleasure to meet you. Kori, she finished with a slight smile. I'm Kori Shirasaki. It's also a pleasure meeting you, Reiji. As they continued their conversation, Reiji noticed a boy approaching them. He was the epitome of an Ike man, with short, silky brown hair, piercing light blue eyes, and a slim build that concealed a surprisingly muscular frame. Reiji couldn't help but notice the subtle contractions of his muscles beneath his school uniform. As the boy approached, he spoke up, Kaori, we've been looking all over for you. We thought you might have gone to the cafeteria again if you forgot your lunch. Kaori apologized, I'm sorry about that, Cookie. I was actually talking to Reiji about our hobbies and such, and I wasn't paying attention. Hey, Reiji, why don't you join us? Reiji was taken aback. Is that okay with you? I don't want to intrude on your group. Kori shook her head and assured him that it was fine and that they wanted to get to know him better. Agreeing with her request, Reiji stood up from his seat and grabbed his lunch. Feeling a piercing gaze on him, Reiji looked over and saw Cookie staring at him. Annoyed by it, Reiji asked, Is there a problem, Cookie? Cookie awkwardly laughed and scraped the back of his head, his gaze shifting towards Kori who was grabbing her lunch. No problem at all. Sorry if it creeped you out. It's just that you're new, and, well, I like to observe people before I get to know them, he explained, trying to justify his staring. Reiji simply replied with an aha, uh -huh, suspecting that Cookie was hiding some truth. However, he chose not to call him out on it. Turning towards Kori, he asked, are you ready? Kori nodded, yes, I'm ready. Let's go. Reiji followed Kori's lead as they walked towards a vacant table in the corner of the classroom. Cookie joined them, his earlier awkwardness replaced with a more relaxed demeanor. As they settled down, Reiji couldn't help but notice that Cookie and Kori seemed quite popular among their classmates, with several students greeting them as they passed by. It made him wonder how much influence they held within the class. As he was thinking, two other students from the class approached their table. One was a girl with long black hair and red eyes, and the other was a boy with spiky brown hair and a serious expression. The girl with long black hair and red eyes spoke first, Hey, Kaori, Cookie, she greeted with a smile before turning her attention to Reiji. And you must be the new transfer student. Hi, I'm Shizuku. Nice to meet you. Reiji nodded in response, returning her smile. Nice to meet you too, Shizuku. Next, the boy with spiky hair introduced himself. I'm Ryuturu Sakagami. He maintained his serious expression as he spoke. 
Unfazed by it, Reiji greeted him back with a smile and introduced himself to the two. I'm Reiji Sukahiro, the new transfer student. Nice to meet you both. Reiji looked around the table, noticing that the atmosphere had become a bit awkward with Ryutaru's serious demeanor. Taking control of the conversation, Reiji decided to lighten the tense atmosphere. Do you do martial arts or any sports, Ryutaru? You have quite the physique, Reiji complimented, throwing him off guard. Grinning in pride, he replied, of course, I do martial arts. Karate, to be exact. Reiji raised an eyebrow in interest, Karate? That's impressive. I've always wanted to try it myself. Maybe you can teach me some moves sometime. Ryutaru's serious expression broke into a small smile. Sure, I'd be happy to show you some basics. As the conversation flowed smoothly, the atmosphere around the table had lightened considerably. Reiji learned a lot about his classmates, Kuki was gifted both academically and physically, Ryutaru practiced martial arts and was Kuki's best friend, and Kaori, Shizuku, and Kuki shared a past as childhood friends. Kaori suddenly got up from her seat, catching the attention of the others at the table. Excuse me, I'll be right back, she said with a smile before walking towards a boy who was sitting alone in the classroom. Cookie watched her for a moment before getting up and following her. Wait up, Kaori, he called out. Reiji observed as the two approached a lone boy sitting in the front of the class. Curious, he turned towards Shizuku and Ryutaru and asked, who's the boy Kaori is walking to? And why is Kuki trying to intervene? His name is Hajime Nagumo, Shizuku answered. As far as I know, he's reclusive and pretty quiet. There isn't anything really special about him other than being referred to as an outcast. Ryutaru nodded in agreement and added, he spends all his time sleeping and doesn't do anything at all. He finished with a disdainful sigh. Reiji furrowed his brows in confusion. Why is Cookie trying to stop Kori from socializing with him then? Shizuku shrugged. I'm not really sure. Maybe Cookie knows something we don't. Or maybe he just doesn't want Kori getting involved with someone like him. Ryutaru nodded in agreement. Cookie's always been protective of Kori. He probably just wants to make sure she doesn't get hurt. While the group chatted, Reiji couldn't help but ponder what set Hajime apart from the rest of the class. Hajime appeared to be generally disliked by his peers, although Shizuku didn't seem to hold any strong opinions about him, she was neutral. However, it was unlikely that everyone felt the same way. He observed Kaori and Kuki approaching the solitary boy, curious about what would unfold. That's rare, Nagumo Kuen. You're still in the classroom. Did you not bring lunch? If you'd like, you can have some of mine, Kaori kindly offered. Ah, thanks for the invitation, Shirasaki san But I've already finished eating my lunch, so why not eat with Amanagawa Kuen instead? Hajime showed Kaori the remnants of his packaged lunch as he made his response. The rest of his classmates might have resented him for declining, but it was better than enduring a lunch break filled with discomfort. Beads of cold sweat trickled down Hajime's back as the pressure continued to mount, but he finally found his saviors in the form of Kuki, Ryutaru, and Reiji. Kori, let's all eat lunch together. It seems that Nagumo needs some more sleep. And I won't allow anyone to eat Kori's delicious handmade lunch while half asleep. Kuki flashed Kori a dazzling smile as he delivered his pretentious line, but Kori simply looked puzzled. Being a bit slow or perhaps just an airhead, Kori failed to grasp Cookie's handsome appeal. Ha! Huh. Why do I need your permission to share my lunch, Cookie Kuen? Shizuku and Reiji couldn't help but snicker involuntarily at Kori's earnest question. Cookie laughed awkwardly, attempting to change the subject. However, the crucial point was that the four, now five, most famous individuals in school were now sitting together with Hajime, much to the displeasure of the rest of the class. Then out of nowhere was a glowing silver circle engraved with various geometric patterns glowing in front of Reiji, at Hajime's feet. The rest of the students all saw the strange circle as well. Everyone was frozen in place, staring at the weird glowing pattern that, for lack of a better word, looked just like a magic circle. Reiji considered the situation, so this world is an eye sky. Reiji thought, staying composed. 
Reiji wouldn't know what to expect of this new world it could be more like Berserk or Akame G.A. Kill, full of darkness and danger lurking around every corner or it could be a go-happy one like Konosuba or No Game No Life. Knowing he needed more information before making any moves, Reiji decided to be cautious. Without knowing what's to come, he would have to react and respond, making quick plans for every situation that arises and using them to his advantage. With this in mind, he steeled himself mentally for what was to come. The magic circle began to glow brighter and brighter until its light enveloped the entire classroom. The circle itself began expanding as well, and when it finally grew big enough to cover Hajime's feet, everyone finally became unfrozen and started screaming. Quickly grabbing his lunchbox, Reiji held on to it. Aiko-sensei, who had remained in the classroom, yelled, Everyone! Get out of the classroom! At the same time the magic circle flared up in a brilliant explosion of light. After a few seconds, or maybe a few minutes, the light finally began to fade, and color returned to the classroom. However, the room was now deserted. Some chairs were knocked over, half-eaten lunch boxes were sitting on desks, and chopsticks and plastic bottles were scattered across the room. The classroom had everything still left in it except the people. Chapter 4 Tortues In a rather spacious chamber constructed with white stones that resembled marble. Towering and imposing columns with intricate sculptures stretched towards the grand arched ceiling. Numerous priests adorned in white robes embellished with golden ornaments stood gathered at the center of the room. They were chanting something in an unknown language, their hands folded across their chests. The whole room, together with the priests, gave off the aura of a cathedral. Seconds later, a dimly illuminated pentagram glowed with a mowing light before numerous archaic symbols ran in the magic circle. The luminous pentagram dimmed, and thirty individuals were ejected from within. Some of them fell onto their buttocks and faces, losing their balance. However, Reiji's cat-like reflexes allowed him to twist and contort his body midair, using his arms and legs to balance himself before landing on his feet. After taking a moment to catch his breath and survey the unfamiliar surroundings, Reiji noticed a statue. The figure depicted in the statue had blonde hair flowing freely behind them and wore a faint smile. They were wreathed in a halo and had both arms spread wide as if trying to grab hold of the beautiful landscape of plains, lakes, and mountains depicted in the background. It was a truly beautiful work of art, but Reiji felt a chill run down his spine, and his hair stood on end as he gazed upon it. He jumped back in wariness and his thoughts raced with countless possibilities. Is it a surveillance artifact? Is it alive? Is it a golem? Who exactly is that statue? After calming down his thoughts, Reiji walked away from the statue and examined the rest of the room. He finally became aware of the priests standing in the center. They were adorned in white robes with intricate gold ornaments, and their presence added to the grandeur of the room. Eventually, one of the priests stepped forward. He was an old man in his seventies, dressed even more extravagantly than his companions. He wore a magnificently adorned monk's cap that stood approximately thirty centimeters tall. It could be said that old was not the most fitting word to describe him. If not for his deeply wrinkled face and aged eyes, one might think him a man in his early fifties. As he walked, his staff jingled, producing clear and soothing notes that echoed throughout the halls. Eventually, he spoke, saying, Welcome to Tortus, brave heroes. It is our pleasure to welcome you here. I am the Pope of the Holy Church, Ishtar Langbard. It is an honor to make your acquaintance, said the old man, who introduced himself as Ishtar, as he broke into a warm and friendly smile. The still confused group of students was led by Ishtar into another room, which was furnished with numerous chairs and long tables. He explained that it would be easier to speak calmly there. The new room was just as lavishly built as the first, with exemplary craftsmanship displayed in the furniture and tapestries hanging on the walls. The layout suggested that it was some kind of banquet hall. Aiko Hadayama and Cookie's group of four took seats at the forefront of their designated tables, and their followers positioned themselves around them accordingly. Hajime ended up at the very end of his table with Reiji sitting next to him, leaning back into his chair, with his eyes fixed on Ishtar. The reason why no one had made a fuss so far was that everyone was still too busy processing what had just happened. Furthermore, since Ishtar had promised to provide an explanation regarding the recent events, 
Cookie, with his high level of charisma, had successfully pacified everyone. Aiko-sensei had tears in her eyes as she watched a student perform a task that should have been the responsibility of the teacher. As soon as everyone had finished seating themselves, the double doors opened, and a number of carts entered the room, pushed along by an entourage of maids. The men, though confused by their current situation, looked at the maidservants with lustful gazes. To them, real-life maidens were something they had only read about in fantasy books. But they soon averted their gaze with a cold sweat running down their back as they felt the girls glare in a manner cold enough to freeze hell. The maid's presence was completely ignored by Reiji as he fixed his attention solely on Ishtar. Despite the possibility that Ishtar might harbor negative intentions towards them, he knew there must be some truth in his words. Finally, once everyone had been served their refreshments, Ishtar began to speak. Now then, I am certain you all must be feeling very confused about the situation you found yourselves in. I shall explain everything, starting from the beginning. Please bear with me and listen attentively until the end, he requested. To summarize, his first revelation was that the world they were in was called Tortus. Tortus was home to three distinct races, humans, demons, and demi-humans. The northern half of the continent was inhabited by humans, the southern half by demons, and the demi-humans resided far to the east in a vast forest. The humans and demons had a tumultuous relationship and had been engaged in a long-standing war for centuries. Despite the humans having a greater number, the demons' individual strength surpassed that of most humans, evening out the odds. Currently, both sides were at a standstill, and there hadn't been a significant battle in decades. However, recent unsettling developments among the demons had occurred, namely, their ability to subdue monsters. The Pope halted his explanation momentarily, observing the reaction of everyone present like a cunning fox. At the sight of Cookie, his aged and languid eyes lit up with a gleam of excitement. He had realized that Cookie had the most influence over his companions and started formulating plans in his mind to bring him over to his side, making it easier to convince the others. The Divine Lord Ihit came to the realization that humanity was on the brink of destruction and thus summoned you here to avert such a catastrophic fate. You, heroes, are humans from a world far greater than ours, and so you carry within you a strength that surpasses the humans of this world. With a transfixed expression, Ishtar beseeched, I implore you to fulfill Lord Ihit's request. Defeat the demons and rescue the human race from the brink of destruction. Ishtar explained that in this world, more than 90% of the population worshipped Ihit, and those who received his divine revelations were granted high positions in the Holy Church. You can't possibly be serious. You're telling these students to go fight in a war. That's absolutely unacceptable. As a teacher, I cannot allow it. Aiko-sensei exclaimed in outrage. Send us back immediately. These kids have families back home who must be agonizing over their disappearance. You can't simply abduct them like this. Aiko-sensei protested vehemently. However, Ishtar's following words heaped despair upon her already burdened shoulders. I understand your feelings, however. I am incapable of returning you to your world at the present, Ishtar calmly stated. The revelation left all the students, including Aiko, utterly incredulous as they gazed upon Ishtar in disbelief. The oppressive silence was shattered by Akko's shout. Wh what do you mean? You're unable. If you had the power to bring us here, surely you can send us back. It wasn't our doing that brought you here, but Lord Ahit himself, explained the Pope in a calm manner. Our purpose in that room was solely to greet you and offer prayers to our deity. Unfortunately, we humans lack the ability to meddle with other worlds. Your return is ultimately in the hands of Lord Ihit's will. At these words, Aiko's spirit faltered and she slumped into her seat, bereft of all energy. The other students all started to shout, saying things like you've got to be kidding me. Or return us to our world. The whole class fell into a panic. Reiji observed Ishtar's expression and internally sighed, noticing the look of contempt in the depths of his eyes. It was as if Ishtar were thinking, you were chosen by the venerable god. Why don't you kneel and rejoice that you were chosen as his hero? As Ishtar wanted, Cookie sprang up from his chair and pounded his fist on the table, drawing the attention of his classmates, including Reiji. Everyone, there's no point in complaining to Ishtar. 
There's nothing he can do about it now. And. And I, at least, have decided to stand and fight. These people are about to be annihilated, declared Cookie with determination. How can I possibly abandon them to such a tragic fate? Besides, if we have been summoned here to save humanity, there may be a chance that we can return home after fulfilling our duty. Ishtar San, do you believe this to be possible? He asked with a glimmer of hope in his voice. Ishtar calmly responded, as you say, Lord Ahit wouldn't disregard a request from his chosen heroes. Cookie, brimming with excitement, remarked, we've all acquired incredible abilities since arriving here, haven't we? I feel so much stronger. Yes, that is correct, confirmed Ishtar with a nod. It would be safe to assume that each of you has the equivalent strength of anywhere from a few to a few dozen regular men. All right then, we should be fine. I will fight, Cookie declared, his fists clenched tightly as a dazzling smile spread across his face. We can save everyone and return home. Watch me, I'll save us all. His overwhelming charisma began to take effect as he spoke. The students who were despairing mere moments ago began to regain their sense of composure. All eyes were fixed on Cookie with a sense of wonder as if they were staring at hope itself. Many of the female students gazed upon him with a mix of admiration and adoration. I had a hunch you'd say that, Ryuteru said with a small grin on his face. However, I'm not comfortable with the idea of you going alone. That's why I'll be accompanying you. Ryuteru. It looks like we don't have much of a choice right now, remarked Shizuku, a hint of annoyance in her tone. It bothers me that we're not given much say in the matter, but nevertheless, I'm willing to help. I if Shizuku is going to fight, then count me in too. Kori declared, stammering a bit. The usual group of friends all chimed in their support for Cookie, their voices ringing with excitement and adrenaline. After that, the rest of their classmates also expressed their approval and went with the flow. The air was thick with the energy of mob mentality, the students caught up in a dangerous fervor that they didn't fully understand. The group had gone around, each expressing their approval or disagreement with the plan to save the world from the demons. Those who remained silent were then asked, and fearing ostracization or being seen as a traitor, they agreed to the plan. Reiji, who had been sitting silently with his eyes closed, processing all the information that had been presented to him, was finally asked for his opinion. What about you, Reiji? Will you help us save this world from the demons? Cookie inquired. As Reiji opened his eyes, his violet orbs scanned the room, observing the expressions of everyone present. The silence was so profound that one could hear a pin drop. Then, he spoke up, do you even know what you're getting into? Pausing for a moment, he let his words hang in the air before continuing, you talk of fighting in a war, but do you truly understand what that entails? War is a merciless and savage affair that leaves nothing but devastation and despair in its wake. It causes pillaging, enslavement, rape, murder, and countless other atrocities. Reiji's piercing stare bore into Cookie, his words laden with accusation. It's amusing, isn't it? Who would have thought the class leader would lead his classmates into something that could very well result in their deaths? And what of the scheming old man who orchestrated it all? What do you stand to gain from this? As his words hung in the air, the room was plunged into a tense silence. Reiji let out a heavy sigh, realizing he wasn't going to get an answer. Standing up from his seat, however, he made sure to impart a harsh reality check to the rest of the class. And what about the rest of you? He asked, capturing their attention. Are you truly prepared to take another's life? Yes, they may be demons, but they are living beings all the same. To end a life, you must be ready to sacrifice your own. Are any of you willing to die for a world you never even knew existed? Reiji's gaze shifted towards Cookie, his eyes filled with cold contempt. And you, Cookie. You had better be prepared to shoulder the responsibility of leading them into battle. If they are killed like worthless cattle, their blood will be on your hands. But I highly doubt that you can bear such a heavy burden, given your lack of ability. You're nothing but a liability, Cookie, and I have no interest in following a leader who can't even comprehend the consequences of their actions. The silence hung heavy once again, and Reiji made his way to the door. But as he reached it, Cookie spoke through gritted teeth. And what of you? 
You are nothing but a mere transfer student, an outcast. Do not act so high and mighty. At least I am trying to calm everyone down and do some good. All you're doing is spouting nonsense and sowing discord in the class. You'll only be a hindrance and a liability in this world. Reiji paused at the doorway and turned to face Cookie. You see that's where you're wrong. Huh? Cookie unconsciously said, among the other students. Allow me to clarify, Reiji began. I have not declined to participate in this war. However, my motives for doing so are personal in nature. While I am a member of this group, I do not consider myself fully integrated into it. Rather, I view myself as an individual within the larger collective, he explained in a clear and concise manner. Why? With an unreadable expression, Reiji swung open the door and slowly walked outside, his eyes scanning the church as he spoke. I don't expect you to understand, Cookie. This isn't about the church or its war. I have my own reasons for getting involved, and they have nothing to do with any of you. I'm not here to make friends or enemies. Just know that when the dust settles, I'll be standing tall, and no one will be able to hold me back. So save your judgment for someone who cares, because frankly, I don't. As the last word left his lips, Reiji abruptly walked out the door, and the heavy wooden door slammed shut with a resounding bang. The sound echoed through the room, leaving everyone inside in stunned silence. Chapter 5 As the last word left his lips, Reiji abruptly walked out the door, and the heavy wooden door slammed shut with a resounding bang. The sound echoed through the room, leaving everyone inside in stunned silence. How? Ishtar murmured in disbelief, his expression revealing his surprise. He regained his composure and put on his usual kind demeanor as he reflected on what had just happened. Glancing around the room, he noted the uncertainty etched on the faces of even those under Cookie's sway. He managed to sow seeds of doubt even in the minds of those influenced by Cookie, he thought to himself. His charisma, logical reasoning, and intelligence are on an impressive level. With proper training and resources, he could become a valuable asset. He paused, his thoughts taking a more ominous turn. However, his confidence unsettles me, and his true intentions remain a mystery. Can I trust him? Should I eliminate him? No, that is not the solution. He has expressed his desire to join the war, and that presents an opportunity. If I can manipulate him to my advantage, and gain control over his actions, he could be a powerful ally or a dangerous enemy. I must uncover his goals, understand his motives, and establish my influence before it's too late. Near Holy Church Sitting beneath a tree was the main character, Reiji, who was eating the last bit of his bento with a thoughtful expression on his face as he reviewed what had just occurred. I must acknowledge that Ishtar's speech was well-crafted and highly informative. His ability to manipulate others is evidently impressive, as even individuals like Cookie, who are renowned for their academic prowess, can be easily influenced. However, I shouldn't be overly surprised, as Cookie's naivety played a significant role in succumbing to Ishtar's influence. That's why I gave the rest of the students a reality check, to save their poor souls, though it seems that it didn't get through to everyone. While some may harbor doubts, it is likely that these concerns will eventually be overshadowed or disregarded. Considering my status as a transfer student, I understand that I lack the level of trust and credibility bestowed upon Cookie. Nevertheless, this is no longer a matter of concern for me, Reiji thought to himself as he calmly enjoyed his onajirai. With things as they are, Ishtar may be frustrated with me, but it's their obligation to provide us with the necessary resources to learn how to fight. It's unreasonable to expect a group of teenagers to go to war without any fighting skills. And as for gaining knowledge, I could easily visit a library if there's one in the kingdom. Reiji thought about the potential obstacles ahead, but he believed finding a library wouldn't pose too much of a challenge. The only obstacles would be the scrutiny from both the church and the kingdom, as well as the potential resentment from the class. And even then that's highly unlikely. Pausing briefly, a determined glint appeared in his eyes. With the Pope preoccupied with rallying the other students, it should give me a brief window of opportunity. His mind already strategizing, he continued, besides, there are ways to address these issues and overcome them. Simply put, there's a lot of work to do. 
Time skip. As the students left the room and stepped outside, they immediately noticed Reiji sitting under a tree near the church. While some flinched at the memory of what he said, Reiji had received some grateful nods from the few who now had doubts about the situation. Nodding back, Reiji walked over to the group and positioned himself at the back of the class. Ishtar then briefed the students that the Hilai kingdom was ready to receive them. According to legend, one of Ahit's descendants, Sharam Vaughn, had founded the kingdom, which was located at the foot of the Divine Mountain. The temple they were in was the head temple of the Holy Church that stood at the summit of the mountain. The kingdom had a strong bond with the Holy Church, and it was said to have the richest history of all the human kingdoms. The fact that the church's most sacred temple was situated in the kingdom's backyard was a testament to the depth of their connection. Ishtar led Reiji and his companions to the main gate of the temple. As they passed through the towering arches that formed the entrance, they were greeted by a breathtaking view of an endless expanse of cloud stretching out before them. Beautiful. Reiji muttered, his eyes fixed on the breathtaking sight before him. Though he had witnessed a scene more mesmerizing than this, there was no denying the enchanting beauty of the sight that lay before him. Ishtar gazed proudly as the group stared in wonder, and then urged them forward. They walked through a grand hallway made of the same white stone as the cathedral and stepped up onto a massive circular pedestal, surrounded by a fence. The stone of the pedestal was engraved with a large magic circle. On the other side of the fence was a sheer drop to the clouds below, so most students huddled close to the center of the pedestal out of fear. Despite their anxiety, they couldn't help but glance curiously around their surroundings. As they did, Ishtar began to chant, Faith is the key that opens the road to heaven's celestial path. As Ishtar finished his chant, the magic circle engraved on the pedestal lit up with blinding brightness. It was as if the chant had been an activation signal, as the entire pedestal began to glide down toward the ground, seemingly attached to an invisible cable. Excited murmurs and chatter erupted from the students as they witnessed their first display of magic. Reiji was not an exception, but his reaction was more contemplative than chatty. Could I create my own magic spell? How does magic function? Are there various types of magic? And if there are, how can I tap into them? These questions plagued Reiji incessantly but without any answers. All he could do was wait patiently until he found a library. Reiji's gaze shifted downward and he noticed a small kingdom in the distance. The kingdom was circular in shape and surrounded by high walls, making it appear impenetrable. In the center of the kingdom, stood a colossal castle that resembled the ancient castles of his own world. A few moments later, Reiji and his companions landed on top of the massive palace and were soon escorted to the throne room. The corridors were as majestic as the temple had been. Along the way, they passed knights, maids, and even nobles, who all gazed at the students with a mixture of awe and wonder. It was clear that most people were aware of who they were. Reiji's sense of curiosity was continuously increasing as he observed everything around him. The party soon found themselves standing before a pair of massive double doors, into which numerous beautiful designs had been engraved. Ishtar led the way as they entered the throne room, where they were greeted by the king and queen of the kingdom. Two guards stood at attention on either side of the door and announced the group's arrival to whoever was waiting inside. Without waiting for a reply, they swung the doors open. Ishtar strolled into the room, seemingly at ease. The students followed behind him timidly, except for Reiji and Cookie's group, who were unfazed by the grandeur around them. A long red carpet stretched across the room, leading to a magnificent chair or rather, a throne. Standing in front of it was a middle-aged man exuding an aura of solemn dignity. Standing next to the middle-aged man was presumably the queen, and next to her were a boy and a girl, both with blonde hair and striking blue eyes. The boy, who was the younger of the two, seemed no more than ten years old, while the girl appeared to be around fourteen or fifteen. On the left side of the carpet stood a line of soldiers, all clad in armor and uniform, while on the right stood a line of civil officers and wizards. Altogether, there were probably around thirty people waiting in the room, creating an impressive sight. As they approached the throne, Ishtar stepped forward and left the students behind, making his way to the king and extending his hand. The king reverently took Ishtar's hand and pressed his lips to it, which made Reiji internally sign in exhaustion. 
Fantastic, Reiji thought sarcastically as he looked at the ongoing situation. Just what I needed, a kingdom under the church's control. This is going to be so much fun, he thought with a wry smile. The king was named Elihades. Hailai, and his wife was called Luluaria. The blonde boy was Prince Lundel, and the girl was Princess Liliana. After introductions, there was a great banquet held inside the palace, where everyone could take a seat and enjoy the food, except for Reiji who had just eaten earlier. The disapproving gazes of the nobles didn't escape Reiji's notice, but he paid them no mind. Instead, his attention was drawn to the badges held by some of the soldiers and wizards. Status plates, perhaps. Reiji pondered, his curiosity growing. Or maybe they indicate rankings within their army. The overwhelming flood of unanswered questions was starting to wear on him, testing his patience. However, compared to the infinite reserve of patience he had for his siblings back at home, this was but a trivial challenge. In his previous life, Reiji didn't have any siblings, so he never truly grasped the value of patience. However, since arriving in this new world and dealing with his younger brothers and sisters, he has come to understand its importance. The countless hours he spent guiding them, answering their endless questions, and patiently explaining the mysteries of the world have all helped him to remain calm in uncertain situations. Hmm. Reiji sensed someone approaching and turned his head to find a weary Shizuku making her way toward him. He gestured to the empty seat beside him, and she sank into it, leaning back. Are you alright? Reiji asked with concern in his voice. Letting out a sigh, she opened her eyes and replied, Yeah, I'm alright. Just tired. It's been a long day. Getting summoned to another world, discussions of war, and now a banquet. I really need some sleep. You can rest on my lap, you know. Reiji offered as Shizuku shot him an unamused stare. I meant as a lap pillow. She sat there contemplating it for a moment before sighing. I'll take you up on that offer, she said, positioning herself appropriately and resting her head on his lap. But remember, if you try anything, I'll cut it off, she added with a sweet smile. Duly noted, Reiji simply responded, recognizing the threat in Shizuku's words. He had no intention of angering the woman lying so close to his vulnerable spot. Doing so would be akin to suicide. Moreover, Shizuku and Cookie's group had spent the entire day trying to calm down their classmates and acting as representatives. The exhaustion had undoubtedly taken its toll on her, leaving her unable to think clearly and placing her trust in a stranger. It was the same person who had warned the class about the dangers but had also caused discord. Reiji didn't envy that position, so instead of making it worse for the poor girl, he offered her a place to rest. It didn't take long for Shizuku to succumb to the inevitable curse of sleep. With caution, Reiji removed his blazer and gently placed it over her, providing some warmth and comfort. Ignoring the jealous glares from the other boys, Reiji sat in silence, deep in contemplation about his next course of action. The banquet eventually came to an end, and Reiji gently woke up Shizuku. It was time for the class to meet the instructors who would guide their training in exchange for accommodation and meals provided by the palace. These instructors were carefully chosen from the ranks of active duty knights and court magicians. After the introductions concluded, each person was escorted to their respective rooms. Considering Shizuku's lingering drowsiness, Reiji assisted her in reaching her room before bidding her good night. As he wandered through the serene corridors, following the maid, Reiji couldn't help but admire the enchanting moon casting its gentle glow upon the night sky. Fantasy worlds truly are beautiful, aren't they? Reiji silently pondered to himself. After a short walk, Reiji and the maid arrived at his room. Upon entering, he was greeted by a grandiose, canopied bed that would fit perfectly in any castle interior. Grateful for the maid's assistance, Reiji thanked her before bidding her good night. Once alone, he closed the door and locked it, drew the curtains closed, and changed into his pajamas before finally laying down on the comfortable bed. Knowing that tomorrow was going to be a long day, he decided to get some shut-eye to be in optimal condition. Before he knew it, he had fallen asleep. Chapter 6 Reiji rose early in the morning, a routine he had become accustomed to during his time in South Korea. As he got out of bed, he went through his familiar morning ritual before stepping into the inviting bathtub. The warmth of the water enveloped his body, 
offering a soothing sensation that eased his sleeping muscles. With a contented sigh, he closed his eyes, allowing himself to fully relax in the comforting embrace of the water. Reiji basked in the warmth of the water, letting his mind wander to the events of the previous day. He replayed the moment when he and his classmates were summoned to the other world, how they ended up causing discord within the class, and the shocking revelation that the kingdom was being controlled by the church. It added another layer of complexity to the already intricate situation. Lost in his thoughts, Reiji contemplated the path he would need to navigate in this unfamiliar world. The pieces of the puzzle were slowly coming together, and he realized that he would need to be cautious and strategic in his actions. Reiji acknowledged that the decisions he made in this new world would undoubtedly have consequences. However, he also understood that it was up to him to navigate and mitigate those consequences. He couldn't control everything, but he could control his own actions and choices. If he were to make a mistake, Reiji knew that he would have to accept the consequences and live with it. After finishing his bath, Reiji stepped out of the bathtub and wrapped himself in a fluffy towel. He then headed back into the main room and spotted the training outfit that the kingdom had provided for him. The clothes consisted of a white, sleeveless tunic paired with black pants featuring a red stripe running down the sides. The tunic had a high collar with a red ribbon tied around the neck and was designed to be comfortable and non-restrictive during training. Reiji quickly changed into the outfit and prepared himself for the day's training. Reiji emerged from his room and made his way down the silent hallway, the rhythmic sound of his footsteps reverberating through the stillness, serving as a stark reminder of the early hour. With each step he took, his mind was consumed by thoughts of the mistake he had made the day before. I shouldn't have done that in the dining room, Reiji thought to himself, sighing. While I don't regret addressing the effects of war to my classmates, there was no reason to state my apathy towards this world and its inhabitants. He continued his train of thought, I wasn't lying when I said I didn't care. It's the truth, after all. We had no knowledge that another world existed like this, and this world summoned us out of the blue and is now requesting us to join a war we had no knowledge about. While some may say it's morally wrong not to lend a hand in such a situation, would call them fools. But that's beside the point, Reiji mused. I could have just stayed silent and laid low, mindlessly agreeing with Cookie's idea of participating in the war and gathering information. But I don't trust the kingdom nor the church. And if they were to somehow want information about my capabilities, then I would either have to lie or refuse. But even then, it could attract attention towards me. There's no way to know if they have a means of detecting falsehood. It seems like there's no advantageous outcome for me, only minor benefits and drawbacks, Reiji pondered as he eventually reached the training grounds. Reiji let out a sigh, knowing that his situation was not ideal. He had to be careful and make calculated decisions, or else, he could end up in a worse predicament. The field was spacious, stretching about 100 square meters. In every direction, Reiji saw humanoid targets made of straw and wood, meant for the mages and soldiers to practice their combat skills with. It was a simple but effective training ground, allowing for the practice of a wide variety of techniques. As Captain Meld noticed Reiji's presence, he raised his hand and waved in greeting, wearing a casual smile on his face. Reiji returned the greeting and took a walk around, examining the rest of the area. After a few more minutes, the students finally arrived, following Cookie and Aiko like ducklings following their mothers. Most of them wore tense expressions, while others attempted to appear superficially calm. All the students greeted Captain Meld and Reiji. It seemed that they had gotten over the facts Reiji stated and either accepted them or buried them. Whichever it was, Reiji wouldn't know, but he was relieved to see that his sacrifice meant something. As Reiji was going through his revelation, Captain Meld proceeded to hand each of them a silver rectangle badge that fit perfectly in one hand, along with a sharp pin. Captain Meld inquired, pointing towards the status plates, do you know what these plates do? They measure different parameters and provide quantified data for you. They also serve as identification cards. Just make sure you hang on to them tightly, alright? With these plates, you'll be fine even if you get lost somewhere, he continued, pausing for emphasis. If you examine one side of the plate, you'll notice a magic circle engraved on it. Use the needles I passed out to prick your finger and let some blood drip onto the circle. That will identify you as the owner of the plate. 
After that, when you say, open status, your current stats will be displayed on the plate. Oh, and don't bother asking me how it works. I've got no clue. These items are remnants from ancient eras. Artifacts? Cookie asked, stumbling over the unfamiliar word. Artifacts refer to powerful magical items that we no longer have the technology to reproduce. They were supposedly all made during the Age of the Gods when the descendants of the Creator still walked the earth. The status plates you all hold are also artifacts from that era, but they're the only artifacts that still see widespread use to this day. Most other artifacts are coveted national treasures, but there are enough of these plates that even average citizens own one. It's helpful since they serve as reliable identification. The artifacts that produce these still exist and are under the strict supervision and control of the Holy Church, Captain Meld explained. The students all nodded in affirmation as they listened to his explanation. All right then. Everyone, do as I told you before, prick your fingers and let your blood come in contact with the magic inscription on the plaque. Captain Meld instructed. Using the needle, Reiji pricked his finger and allowed a droplet of his blood to fall onto the plate. The plate immediately reacted, its woolen surface absorbing the blood and causing a bright amethyst color with a hint of black to spread across it. As Captain Meld proceeded with his explanation of the plates, he unveiled that every individual possessed a distinct color of mana, and once their data was registered on the plates, the color would correspond. The plates were highly reliable identification cards because the color of the plate and the color of the owner's mana were always the same. What a beautiful color, Reiji thought to himself, a sense of amusement washing over him. The significance of the colors was not lost on him, and he had to admit that it was impressive. It also sparked a sense of wonder within him. What exactly was his power? And how would it manifest in his hands? The mere thought of it excited Reiji, and he eagerly anticipated the moment and they would teach him about mana. Observing his peers, Reiji noticed that Cookie's status plate had the expected pure white color. Ryuteru was a deep shade of green, Kori's a light and delicate purple, and Shizuku's was a rich blue hue, resembling the color of lapis lazuli. Captain Meld gave a wry smile and reminded the students not to forget to check their stats. I know you all must be impressed, but don't forget to confirm your stats, okay? Captain Meld reminded the students, bringing them back to reality. They quickly checked their stats and gave Meld a brief nod of acknowledgement. Reiji returned his own gaze back down to his status plate. On it, he found written. Name Reiji Sukahiro Age, 17 male level, 1. Job, Dark Lord. Strength, 130. Vitality, 120. Defense, 100. Agility, 110. Magic, 150. Magic Defense, 100. Magic Skills, Language Comprehension, Physical Resistance, Dark Magic Efficiency, Spear Proficiency, Darkness Affinity, Darkness Manipulation. Increased Mana Recovery, Stealth, Image Composition, Necromancy, Shadow Manipulation, Foresight, Detect Presence, Detect Magic, Dark Lords Hockey. The Above Information. Whistling in amazement at his stats and skills, a satisfied smile adorned Reiji's face. All the preparations he had made had paid off. Although he acknowledged that most of his skills came from his inherited power, it was now up to Reiji to master it. Everyone had a chance to check their stats. Great. Now, let me explain it to you from the beginning. First, we have your level. It indicates how much you have grown and is closely linked to your other stats. The maximum level is 100, which signifies the pinnacle of human capability. In other words, your current level indicates how much of your potential you have realized. Reaching level 100 means unlocking all of your latent abilities, and it's a rare feat that only a few people achieve, Meld explained. Reiji's face contorted into a frown as he heard the statement. It implied that only humans were subject to a specific level cap, while other species' limits remained unknown. The concept of being constrained by limitations did not sit well with Reiji at all. However, his initial dissatisfaction gradually dissipated, and he began to feel a sense of realization. As the true meaning of those parting words sank in, Reiji couldn't help but widen his eyes in realization. Your potential is as deep as the abyss. Never limit yourself, he repeated to himself. 
It was a welcome surprise to such a problem, and Reiji felt grateful for it. Your statistics will naturally increase as you train. Additionally, you can use magic or magic imbued items to raise your stats. Furthermore, those with a high magic stat will grow faster than others. Although we don't know exactly why, we assume it's because a person's mana assists in the growth of other stats. Later on, you will have the opportunity to select equipment that aligns with your stats. The items in our treasury will be at your disposal. After all, you are the heroes who are going to save our kingdom. Based on Captain Melt's explanation, it was clear that defeating a monster wouldn't magically increase one's stats. Instead, everyone had to rely on the old-fashioned way of training, which Reiji had no problem with. Moving on, do you see the little box that says, Job? That refers to your natural aptitude. It is directly linked to the skills box at the bottom, and your job determines the type of skills you can learn. However, few people possess a job. Jobs are split into combat-based and non-combat-based disciplines. Combat jobs are exceedingly rare. Only one in every thousand, or ten thousand depending on the job, people have a combat-based job. Non-combat jobs are technically rare too, but... Well, one in every hundred people has one. Some of them are even prevalent enough that one in every ten individuals possesses one. There are many people who have jobs that are not combat or production-oriented. Captain Mel proceeded to request the status badges of all the summoned individuals for inspection. As per usual, Cookie eagerly stepped forward and presented his badge to the captain. Name Cookie Amanagawa Age, 17 Male Level, 1. Job, Hero. Strength, 100. Vitality, 100. Defense, 100. Agility, 100. Magic, 100. Magic Defense, 100. Magic Skills, Elemental Affinity, Elemental Resistance, Physical Resistance, Advanced Sorcery, Swordsmanship, Superhuman Strength. Armor Proficiency, Foresight, Increased Mana Recovery, Detect Presence, Detect Magic, Limit Break, Language Comprehension. Wow, you are truly a hero, exclaimed Captain Meld as he examined Cookie's badge. Even at level 1, your stats are in the triple digits. Most people only acquire two or three skills, but you have surpassed the norm. You are a highly dependable hero. Cookie blushed and scratched his head in embarrassment as he accepted the captain's praise. Subsequently, the captain proceeded to review each summon status badge and elucidate their respective job specialties. Although each individual possessed their own unique strength and expertise, there was one particular standout. When Hajime approached Captain Meld with his status badge, the captain's excited expression quickly turned to confusion. He tapped the plate with his knuckles and inspected it closely as if trying to find an error. Eventually, he returned the badge to Hajime with a complicated look on his face. Um, well, you see. A synergist is sort of like a blacksmith. It might be useful if you plan to open a forge, but otherwise. Captain Meld stumbled through an inadequate explanation of Hajime's class. Daisuke Hayama sneered at Hajime and jeered, Hey, Nagumo. You didn't seriously get a non-combat job, did you? How is a blacksmith going to fight monsters? Meld, is this synergist thing a rare job? No, not really. One in ten people has the class. All the craftsmen employed by the kingdom have it, Captain Meld replied. Give me a break, Nagumo. You're going to fight with something like that? Hayama taunted, folding his arms. Hajime surveyed the room and noticed that most of his classmates, particularly the boys, were laughing at him. Except for Reiji, that is. Chapter 7 Reiji sat there, his expression unnerved. He had already garnered enough attention, and involving himself in a situation that wouldn't benefit him seemed pointless. Besides, he knew it wouldn't be long before Aiko stepped in to handle it. Hey! Stop laughing at him. I won't allow anyone to laugh at their classmates on my watch. As a teacher, I absolutely will not condone it. Now return the Gumokuin's status plate this instant. The boys were all taken aback by how much anger was visible in Aiko Sensei's small frame. They hurriedly returned Hajime's plate to avoid her wrath. Aiko-sensei turned to Hajime and gave him an encouraging pat on the shoulder. 
Nagumo Kuen, don't worry about your job. Look, I got a non combat job too. And aside from my job, most of my stats are pretty average too. You're not alone. Aiko sensei then showed her pink colored plate to Hajime, saying, Here, look. Soon after, Hajime's eyes took on the vacant gaze of a dead fish as he finished reading Aiko's plate. Reiji observed with curiosity, wondering just how low Hajime's stats must be to elicit such a reaction. All right, everyone, let's continue with the status inspection, and then you can explore the castle or spend time together. But remember to rest. Our real training begins tomorrow, Captain Meld reminded the group. He proceeded to check the remaining statuses until he reached the last person. Captain Meld extended his hand, signaling for Reiji to hand over his plate. Reiji furrowed his brow. It was too early to simply divulge information about his capabilities. In defiance, he slipped his status plate into his pocket and stared at Captain Meld. What exactly is the purpose of this procedure? You say it's to build a suitable training regimen for us, but is that really true? I want to know who exactly holds my information if I were to share it with you, Reiji asked assertively. Raising an eyebrow, Captain Meld replied, Yes, we check your status plates to create suitable training regimens for you heroes and bring out your full potential. And the only people who have access to your information and that of others are myself, nobles, other high officials, the king, and the pope, of course. Reiji let out a sigh and locked eyes with Captain Meld, conveying his message. I have no interest in showing my status plate to you or anyone else, he said firmly. With a dawning realization, Captain Meld focused his gaze on Reiji. You don't trust us? He questioned. Reiji sidestepped the question and let out a weary sigh. Look, let's put this into perspective. Imagine yourself in our shoes. You're a teenager, still in the midst of adolescence, with no real-world experience or combat skills. Then suddenly, you're whisked away to a fantasy world and expected to fight in a war. Would you blindly believe everything they tell you and willingly join the battle? Ye Captain Meld began, but he was swiftly interrupted. Captain Meld, be serious. You had no prior knowledge of such a world even existing. Would you truly risk your life for a world you had no understanding of? Set aside your morals, ethics, and emotional attachments, and consider it from a logical standpoint. Captain Meld pondered for a moment before shaking his head. No, I suppose I wouldn't trust everything they said right off the bat. Exactly, Reiji nodded. Now, I'm not saying that I don't trust you, but I don't know you well enough to just hand over my personal information like that. It's not personal, it's just a matter of caution and self-preservation. Captain Meld looked at Reiji for a moment before nodding. I understand. We'll work with what we have just remember that we're here to help you all become the best heroes you can be. If you ever need anything, don't hesitate to ask. However, I still need to report this to the Pope and King. I hope you understand. Reiji nodded in understanding. It's all right. You're just doing your duty after all, he said calmly. Thanking him for his understanding, Captain Meld then dismissed the class, reminding them to rest well and be prepared for the real training that would begin the following day. In Reiji's room, lying down on his bed, he stared at the ceiling, sighing as he contemplated the events that had transpired. He considered himself fortunate that Captain Meld had been open-minded and understanding. Otherwise, the situation could have escalated further. By crafting a believable and logical explanation, he had managed to quell Captain Meld's suspicions, at least for the time being. However, Reiji was well aware that his fabricated story would eventually reach the ears of the Pope. As he lay there, Reiji's mind was consumed with swirling thoughts. He had only arrived a day ago and was already faced with seemingly insurmountable problems. He had no influence, no strength, no knowledge, and no leverage against the enemy. The only thing keeping him alive was his status as a hero and his reputation among the others. If he were to suddenly disappear, it would raise eyebrows and cause distrust towards the kingdom and the Pope for not protecting their heroes well enough. This was the only leverage, the only advantage that Reiji had over the Pope and King. He intended to make the most of it. Although there might be consequences, such as being confined to his room or a similar punishment, they couldn't simply eliminate him. 
As long as he didn't do anything extreme like killing innocents or directly insulting the king and pope, it shouldn't be too severe. Grabbing his status plate, he examined it once more. Name Reiji Sukahiro Age, 17 male level, 1. Job, Dark Lord. Strength, 130. Vitality, 120. Defense, 100. Agility, 110. Magic, 150. Magic Defense, 100. Magic Skills, Language Comprehension, Physical Resistance, Dark Magic Efficiency, Spear Proficiency, Darkness Affinity, Darkness Manipulation. Increased Mana Recovery, Stealth, Image Composition, Necromancy, Shadow Manipulation, Foresight, Detect Presence, Detect Magic, Dark Lord's Hockey. Reiji's element was the very same abyss from which he had emerged 17 years ago. His skills were versatile, designed for both offense and defense, as well as close and long-range combat. Reiji had already brainstormed a few ideas for skills and magic, but he needed to know how to create them. He possessed the image composition skill, but he wasn't sure whether he still needed to use chants and magic circles to cast a spell. Image composition allows him to create and manipulate images in his mind, which he can then project onto the physical world. Now, what you may be thinking is, how exactly does Reiji know this, right? When Reiji had dropped his blood on his status and it shimmered, a surge of information regarding his skills flooded his mind. It provided an immediate, almost innate intuition on how to use them, along with basic knowledge about each skill. It is reasonable to assume that the same phenomenon occurred for the others as well. However, this does not imply that Reiji and his peers know how to effectively utilize their abilities. Like any other skill or talent, harnessing magic requires practice, training, and experience. Even those with mage job classes must acquire the skills to control and manipulate their mana, mastering the art of casting spells and employing various techniques. Reiji rose from his bed and quickly headed to the bathroom to take a refreshing bath. After getting out, he changed into some comfortable clothes. Since it was still early, he decided to go get some breakfast before meeting up with Shizuku. Reiji was curious about what was happening within the class since he hadn't interacted with anyone in a while. While he wasn't certain if there would be any significant benefits to knowing, he found it comforting to be aware of what was going on around him. Reiji walked through the castle's long hallways until he arrived at the cafeteria. The room was vast and spacious, with high ceilings that gave it an airy feel. The cafeteria was filled with rows of long tables and chairs arranged in a grid pattern with a central aisle running down the middle. The tables were made of polished wood and paired with matching chairs that looked comfortable enough to sit in for hours. The walls of the cafeteria were adorned with simple yet elegant tapestries and paintings, adding a touch of sophistication to the room. The windows lining the walls allowed plenty of natural light to flood in, casting warm shadows across the polished wooden floors. A large fireplace was situated at one end of the cafeteria, providing warmth and a cozy atmosphere during colder months. The kitchen area at the other end of the room was bustling with activity as chefs prepared and served meals to the castle residents. The cafeteria was filled with the sound of chatter and laughter as Reiji made his way towards the food stations to pick up his dishes. He eventually spotted Shizuku and Kori sitting at a moderate distance and approached them, causing both of them to startle. Are you guys alright? You seem to be deep in thought, Reiji asked. Shizuku let out a sigh and nodded, replying, Yeah, we're okay, just processing all the information we got. Kori agreed, Yeah. Although we already know we're in some fantasy world, I feel like this really hit home for some others. As Reiji looked around, he could see various students sitting and talking excitedly about their job classes and skills. As they started eating, Reiji asked, other than the reality check for the class, is anything else happening within the class? Groaning in frustration, Shizuku stabbed her fork into the meat before eating it, then sent a light glare at Reiji. There's a schism between the class now due to your speech yesterday. There are some who agree with what you said and others who still want to fight anyway. Reiji processed the information with a hum, prompting Shizuku to snap, don't hum me. Because of you, Kori and the rest of us had to deal with constant bickering between the two. Although those that want to participate in the war outnumber those who don't, they show no signs of letting up. Well, sorry, not sorry. 
I don't think pointing out the consequences of war is necessarily a bad thing, do you? Reiji responded, shrugging. Shizuku nodded in agreement. Kori suddenly became curious and asked, Reiji, what's your job class? This piqued Shizuku's interest as well. While we have heard about the other job classes, we haven't heard of yours at all, she added. Reiji smiled mysteriously and replied. Who knows? Meanwhile. Location, throne room. And thus concludes my report for today, your majesty. Captain Meld knelt on the floor, concluding his report for the day, with the king in Popishtar in attendance. The atmosphere was tense as the two leaders contemplated the information they had just received. What course of action do you recommend, Popishtar? The king asked. Captain Meld's report had revealed that Reiji did not trust them, which was a significant problem for the kingdom. They needed the hero's support to win the war against the demons, and any mistrust could prove to be detrimental to their cause. I suggest that we allow him some time to build trust with us, your majesty, Ishtar replied, his hand stroking his beard in contemplation. He then turned towards Captain Meld and addressed him directly. Captain Meld, it is imperative that we gain Reiji's trust. I want you to build a rapport with him, help him train, and offer your guidance. Our goal is for him to see us as allies, not as adversaries. Remember, our success in this war depends on unity, and without it, we will be defeated. Understood, Your Excellency, Captain Meld replied. I have already taken the liberty of enlisting him in some of my training sessions. The king nodded in agreement with Pope Ishtar's plan, his eyes focused on the captain. Very well, Captain Meld. You have your orders. See to it that they are carried out with utmost diligence. Captain Meld bowed his head in acknowledgement, his face betraying no emotion. Yes, your majesty. I will do everything in my power to ensure that Reiji sees us as his allies. Good. You are dismissed, Captain, the king said, waving his hand in dismissal. Captain Meld rose from his kneeling position and silently departed, leaving the tense atmosphere of the room behind. Once the captain was out of earshot, Pope Ishtar turned towards the king and spoke with a serious tone. While Captain Meld focuses on gaining Reiji's trust, it falls upon us to address the concerns of the other students, Ishtar stated. Reiji's speech has planted seeds of doubt within their minds, and we cannot afford to have anyone stray from the cause. Unity is paramount in our war against the demons, and we must work to maintain it. The king nodded in agreement, his expression grave What course of action do you suggest, Pope Ishtar? At present, our best course of action is to exercise patience and wait for the situation to calm down, Ishtar replied, his gaze fixed on the clock. The students are currently in a state of panic and are unable to think rationally. Once the situation has stabilized and the students are more composed, we can then intervene and quell their worries. We must remember that they are young and impressionable, and their doubts and fears can easily spread like wildfire if not addressed promptly. The king concurred, acknowledging the validity of Ishtar's statement. Very well, Your Excellency. If you would excuse me, I have some paperwork to attend to at the Holy Church. The king nodded in acknowledgement of Ishtar's request, and with a final bow, he exited the room. He ascended the stairs of the castle, eventually arriving at the top, where he could see the sprawling kingdom below. Faith is the key that opens the road to heaven's celestial path. As Ishtar finished his chant, the magic circle engraved on the pedestal lit up with blinding brightness. Location Ishtar's Office the room was bathed in a soft, inviting glow emanating from the candles, creating an intimate atmosphere. Adorning the walls were intricate carvings and murals, depicting various religious stories and myths. The ceiling, which was arched, boasted golden chandeliers, lending a touch of grandeur to the room and providing extra light. At the center of the room stood a large throne adorned with gold accents and fine silks, exuding an air of authority and power. Seated upon it was Ishtar himself, his mask dropped and a frown etched onto his face. He tapped his fingers in frustration on the throne's armrest and muttered, Reiji, as if in a trance. This young man has truly done it this time. He has outmaneuvered me, using his classmates as a shield. Well done, I can't help but be impressed. He's so young, yet brimming with potential, Ishtar thought, offering praise, 
before his expression morphed into one of insatiable greed. That's precisely why I must bring him under my control. Raising his hand as a signal, a black hooded figure appeared out of nowhere, kneeling in front of Ishtar. Looking at the person, Ishtar said, keep an eye on the hero named Reiji. This is strictly information gathering. I don't care how you do it, but I will tell you this, don't harm him. Ishtar emphasized his point to make it clear. Yes, Ishtar Sama, the hooded figure obliged. Smiling contentedly, Ishtar gave a final warning to the hooded figure before they left. You better not fail this mission. You know what happens to those who fail in the Inquisition. With sweat running down the figure's back, they nodded and left as fast as they had arrived. Chapter 8 Unaware of Ishtar's schemes, Reiji lay content in his bed, reflecting on his day. Earlier, Kaori and Shizuku had convinced him to explore the training grounds with them. While Reiji had initially intended to visit the castle library, he saw potential benefits in their proposal and agreed to join them. Together, they had combed through every nook and cranny of the training grounds, exploring each building and area they could access. In the center of the grounds, they discovered a large circular arena made of sturdy stone blocks, surrounded by stands for spectators to watch the training exercises. Various training equipment, including dummies, target boards, and obstacles, were scattered around the arena for the trainees to use to hone their combat skills. On one side of the training grounds lay a large lake with crystal clear water that reflected the blue sky above. The lake was surrounded by a rocky outcropping, which provided a natural obstacle for the trainees to practice their climbing and balancing skills. On the other side of the grounds, they saw a dense and sprawling forest with towering trees that seemed to stretch up to the sky. The branches interwove, forming a thick canopy overhead, blocking out much of the sunlight. Though they never ventured into the forest, signs of wild animals and potential monsters were shown near the forest's edge. Today had proven to be both informative and relaxing for Reiji. His plan to create a divide among his classmates had surprisingly worked, despite his initial doubts. He hadn't expected it to be this successful due to the factors of influence and status. Naturally, people tend to trust those they have known for a longer time, as familiarity breeds comfort. Nevertheless, the schism within the class had granted him a longer moment of freedom, affording him additional time to concentrate on his objectives. Another aspect that caught Reiji's attention was the variety of job classes present within the class. Kori, in particular, proved to be a valuable social network, providing him with access to a wealth of information. Having knowledge about his peers' job classes could prove to be advantageous in the future, if utilized correctly. Moreover, he appreciated the opportunity to take a break from constant thinking and planning. Spending the day exploring the castle and hanging out with Shizuku and Kori allowed him to relax and clear his head. The constant mental strain of strategizing was becoming burdensome, and this respite provided a much-needed reprieve. Today has certainly been full of pleasant surprises, Reiji mused, his lips curving into a small smile. But I can't let my guard down just yet. Who knows what Ishtar has planned next and when he'll strike. However, there's no use dwelling on it now, though. Tomorrow marks the official start of our training, and I must be in top condition for it. Closing his eyes, it didn't take long before Reiji's breath slowed, becoming steady and soft as he drifted into a peaceful slumber. On the following day, all of the students lined up in anticipation. Captain Meld, along with the other instructors, had made the decision to divide them into eight groups of five. Reiji stood among his classmates, his eyes fixed on the captain, who stood at the forefront of the training ground. Captain Meld cleared his throat, his voice projected with authority. Attention, everyone. I will now announce the groups you will be assigned to. Listen carefully for your names. The air was filled with a mix of excitement and nervousness as the students awaited their fate. Standing within the group of students, Reiji's eyes scanned the area, taking in the sight of the various instructors standing around the training ground. As he observed the instructors, he noticed one of them staring intently in his direction. Their eyes met briefly, causing Reiji to pause. But as he looked back a second time, he realized that the instructor was no longer looking at him and had shifted their focus to the other students. Reiji couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off, but he decided to brush it off for the time being and focus on the task at hand. Group 1, Kaori, 
Suzu, Hajime, Kosuka, and Yuka. Group 2, Eri, Daisuki, Yashiki, Nana, and Sakura. Group 3, Shimizu, Kentaro, Akito, Shinji, and Mao. Group 4, Kotone, Shori, Kana, Mei, and Yuya. Group 5, Ayako, Yugo, Rika, Shoyuta, and Teiko. Group 6, Atsushi, Noburu, Nao, Reichi, and Ren. Group 7, Shizuku, Kuki, Ryutaru, and Reiji. Groups 1 to 5, you will be following some of the instructors to the obstacle course. These groups are based on your stats, so your main focus will be building stamina and strength, Captain Meld continued, addressing the designated groups. While the rest of the groups will be refining technique and skills. Reiji listened intently, taking note of the group he had been assigned to. It was relatively easy to discern why they had placed him in this particular group. Though he had not revealed his status, there were several students present who could potentially be interrogated for information about him. Furthermore, his introduction could serve as a basis for assessing his proficiency in sojitsu, which would be a significant indicator of his physical abilities. The groups made their way inside the entrance of the arena, passing through a long, dimly lit corridor before finally emerging into the bright sunlight of the arena. Reiji shielded his eyes for a moment, adjusting to the sudden change in brightness. All right then, Captain Meld began, addressing the group. Since all of you already possess exceptional physical attributes, we will focus on refining your skills and techniques. He gestured towards a group of instructors who had assembled nearby. We have several specialists here who will be teaching you various weapon techniques, as well as a weapon specialist who was personally selected by the king and pope due to his impressive accomplishments within the kingdom. Reiji's gaze followed Captain Melt's gesture to the weapon specialist, and he recognized the man who had been staring at him earlier. The specialist had striking spiked red hair and a muscular build, which was emphasized by his armor. The armor covered his chest and upper abdomen but left his arms, shoulders, and back exposed. It was made of brown leather and had silver-colored metal plates on the shoulders and chest, giving it a distinct look. The specialist exuded a strong aura, though it wasn't quite as potent as Captain Melt's. As the man was introduced as being selected by the Pope and King, Reiji couldn't help but feel suspicious. After all, he was against both the Pope and King. However, it was also possible that it was just a coincidence. Reiji decided to keep his guard up around the man. You are free to choose any instructor you wish to learn from today, Captain Meld announced to the group. However, Cookie, I will personally be training you myself. Cookie's surprise was evident, and he nodded with a smile on his face. As Captain Meld spoke, the other students began to disperse, each one seeking out an instructor to train with. They moved towards the various groups of instructors, their eyes shining with anticipation and eagerness to learn. Reiji wasted no time in searching for an instructor to learn from. Although he was confident in his spear skills, he knew that there was always room for improvement and inspiration to add to his style. Scanning the area, he quickly spotted an instructor holding a spear and made his way towards him, weaving through the other students. Well, aren't you something, a voice suddenly said from behind Reiji. Adrenaline burst through his body as Reiji hurriedly turned around and threw a kick at the person. However, upon realizing who it was, he held back before the kick could make contact. The man blocked Reiji's kick with his forearm, grinning as he felt the impact. Not bad, though it could be better, right? He said. With a blank face, Reiji didn't say anything and just stared at the man who stood before him. This was the weapon specialist Captain Meld had introduced to him earlier. Even with Reiji's detect presence skill, he was unable to sense the man's presence. This meant that the man either possessed an ability to conceal his presence or was simply that much stronger than Reiji. No need to be so wary, the man said, waving his hand dismissively, still grinning. I just thought I would greet the most interesting person here. Although flattered, I'm sorry to inform you that I'm straight and only interested in women, Reiji replied dryly. The man's grin faltered for a moment, and an irked expression appeared on his forehead. That's not what I meant, he said shaking his head. I meant that you're the most interesting person here in terms of mystery. I heard that nobody here knows your job class, not even the king. So. Reiji replied dismissively. Although he knew what the man was insinuating, 
he had no interest in humoring him. I want to know what's behind that veil of mystery. So, to discover the unknown, I ask for a spar. All I need is one fight, and I'm pretty sure I'll be able to figure you out with just that, the man proposed. However. I refuse, Reiji stated firmly. I find no reason to humor you, nor do I gain anything from doing so. And stating that you'll be able to figure me out with a fight is foolish. While discerning a fighting style and behavior in a fight can reveal someone's personality and tendencies, it's not always the case. Especially if they know how to hide their intentions and emotions, Reiji thought. However, instead of being disheartened by Reiji's refusal, the man's grin widened. So, you'll fight me if I just offer something in return, right? Then, I offer you this, three favors. If you beat me, then I'll complete any three favors you ask of me. Initially hesitant, Reiji couldn't deny the value of such an offer. The potential benefits were too great to ignore. With enough careful consideration, he could use the favors to further his own goals and gain leverage against Ishtar. Moreover, showcasing his proficiency with the spear wouldn't necessarily be a disadvantage. The class is already aware of Reiji's training with the spear, and with Ishtar confirming that they had gained a tenfold boost in basic stats like strength, Reiji could exhibit his skills without revealing too much about himself. Fine, Reiji said, nodding his head in agreement. I accept your challenge. The man's grin only widened upon hearing Reiji's rejection of his initial offer. Well, how about this, he said, his tone becoming more playful. I'll sweeten the deal. I'll give you three favors if you beat me. Anything you want, and I'll do it for you. After a brief moment of contemplation, Reiji nodded his head in agreement. Very well. I accept your challenge. But first, I believe you should introduce yourself. The man's grin widened as he gave a small bow. Of course, how rude of me. My name is Tatsuya, a weapon specialist, and the one who will win this spar, he stated confidently. Is that so? Well, we'll just have to find out in the match, Reiji said as they walked toward the rack holding all the wooden weapons. But first, I have a question for you. Sure, go ahead, Tatsuya replied. Reiji paused for a moment before speaking. Can I trust that you will uphold your end of the deal if I happen to win? Meaning that if I can ask for a facility, maid, instructor, or a specialized weapon, can you procure it for me without any problems? He asked. Tatsuya gave a small chuckle. Of course. I always keep my promises, he replied confidently. Is that so? Reiji asked, receiving a nod in response. Then you wouldn't mind if Captain Meld is involved in this, would you? While I don't doubt your word, I want to be cautious. As a foreigner in this world, I know that war and discrimination occur here, and I see no reason why deceit wouldn't happen here as well. Tatsuya frowned at Reiji's response and turned towards him, asking, You don't trust me? Without a word, Reiji grabbed a wooden spear off the rack and simply replied, Not in the slightest. Tatsuya let out a small chuckle. I suppose that's fair, he said, grabbing a wooden sword from the rack. But I can assure you, I'm a man of my word. Reiji was silent as he examined the spear. It was decently made, comparable to those in his old world, although it fell short in some aspects. It was somewhat primitive, but its durability was excellent. He swung it amateurishly, getting a sense of its weight and adjusting to it. Satisfied, he surveyed the arena and spotted Captain Meld conversing with Cookie in the distance. Let's go, Reiji said to Tatsuya as they headed toward Captain Meld. Hey, Captain Meld. Tatsuya called out cheerfully, waving his hand to catch the attention of the approaching captain and Cookie. As the two turned their heads toward them, Tatsuya quickly wrapped his arm around Captain Meld's shoulder and gestured toward Reiji. Captain Meld raised an eyebrow at Tatsuya's gesture but then turned to face Reiji and asked, What can I do for you? I just wanted you to spectate this match as well to make sure that if I win against Tatsuya, you'll be able to ensure that he upholds his end of the deal, Reiji replied. Captain Meld's interest was piqued, and he crossed his arms. And what is this deal you speak of? If I win, Tatsuya owes me three favors. No questions asked as long as the request is reasonable. And if he wins, he gets the satisfaction of beating me in a fair fight. 
All right, I'll spectate your match and ensure that Tatsuya upholds his end of the deal if you win. But what are you going to use your favors for? Captain Meld asked curiously. Who knows? Chapter 9 In the center of the arena, Reiji and Tatsuya stood with their wooden weapons in hand, surrounded by instructors and students who watched with great interest, anticipation, and excitement. Captain Meld, acting as the referee, positioned himself in the middle outside the circular boundary they had created. Before we begin, let's have a quick introduction, Captain Meld announced, addressing both Reiji and Tatsuya. Tell us your names and status. Smirking, Tatsuya gave a slight bow as he introduced himself to the crowd. I'm Tatsuya, one of the instructors here, and a weapon specialist, he said, his tone dripping with confidence. And I can assure you that I'm going to win this match. The crowd murmured in response to Tatsuya's bold statement. Some were impressed by his confidence, while others found him arrogant and irritating. Reiji, on the other hand, remained calm and focused, his face blank, and his eyes revealing nothing. I'm Reiji, also known as Kim Min Joon from South Korea, Reiji announced, tightening his grip on his spear and getting ready for the start of the match. As soon as he mentioned his Korean name, some of the students' eyes widened in surprise. Wait, as in that Kim Min Joon. There's no way we would forget someone famous in our own class, muttered a student. Are you an idiot? His face was never revealed as he was always wearing a mask, another student responded, smacking the other across the head. It didn't take long for the others to join in the muttering. Meanwhile, the instructors watched curiously, wondering if Reiji's other name held any significance. Despite his curiosity, Captain Meld remained focused on his duty. The rules are simple. If either of you uses mana or steps out of the boundary, you lose. If one forfeit or is knocked unconscious, you lose. The stakes of this duel have already been decided beforehand. If you have any questions, ask now, declared Captain Meld. Reiji and Tatsuya remained silent. Well then, let the match begin. Captain Meld announced, signaling the start of the duel. Reiji and Tatsuya faced each other, analyzing their opponent, waiting for someone to make the first move. The tense silence dragged on for what felt like minutes until Tatsuya charged at Reiji with incredible speed. If you're not making the first move, then I will. Tatsuya shouted, brandishing his sword. He charged at Reiji with incredible speed and swung his sword in a wide vertical arc. Reiji narrowly dodged it by stepping to the side and then spun his spear, thrusting it towards Tatsuya's solar plexus. Swinging his sword in a diagonal motion, Tatsuya deflected Reiji's attack and struck his spear upwards, leaving Reiji momentarily vulnerable. Taking advantage of the opening, Tatsuya swung his sword in a wide diagonal arc, aiming for Reiji's torso. Reiji reacted quickly, sidestepping and parrying Tatsuya's attack with his spear. Jumping back, he created distance between them, bringing the whole ordeal back to a stalemate. The crowd was in awe at the scene they had just witnessed. While they had expected the weapon specialist to be skilled, the fact that a student was evenly matched with him was amazing, to say the least. However, that was not the case for the instructors and other experienced martial artists in the crowd. Captain Meld observed the match with a sharp eye, analyzing each move made by Reiji and Tatsuya. Captain Meld watched the match with a keen gaze, his mind racing with thoughts. Reiji's technique with the spear is remarkable for someone his age, but it's still inferior to Tatsuya's, he pondered. His physical condition is also top-notch, superior to that of a soldier in our army, and he hasn't even fully developed yet. He'll be a real monster with proper training when he reaches his peak age. However, I can't help but wonder, Captain Meld furrowed his brow, lost in thought. Captain Meld watched the match with a discerning eye, considering, based on what I've heard and seen, Reiji is an intelligent person, so I can't see why he would agree to a losing battle. I only mentioned that Tatsuya was a weapon specialist to encourage students to seek him out for guidance, implying that he holds significant influence in the kingdom. So why would he accept this spar? Although I agreed to oversee this wager due to my growing interest in the boy and Pope Ishtar's request, now that I'm here, I can't help but wonder. As Captain Meld observed the boy's stoic expression, he suddenly had a moment of realization. His eyes widened as he considered a possibility that he had previously dismissed as absurd. 
could it be that Reiji has an ulterior motive? Regrettably for Captain Meld, there was no one to provide answers to his questions. Opting to keep his thoughts to himself, he continued to observe the match with a vigilant eye. You have impressive skills with the spear, I must admit, Tatsuya remarked. It's no surprise we were evenly matched in our first exchange. But don't get too comfortable, because things are going to get tougher from here on out. Assuming a stance, Tatsuya crouched down with his left leg extended behind him and his right leg bent at the knee. He held his sword in his right hand and positioned it diagonally in front of him with the tip pointing downward. Here I come. Tatsuya announced before disappearing from his spot. Reiji widened his eyes in surprise, feeling his hair stand up before he instinctively ducked, doing a split as a sword slashed at his initial position. Flexible, aren't ya? Tatsuya commented. Positioning his foot firmly on the ground, he swung his sword at Reiji who had already gotten up. Stepping back, he narrowly dodged the tip of his blade. Tightening the grip on his spear, Reiji replied, I have to be flexible in order to survive. Tatsuya grinned, pleased with Reiji's response. Good answer, he said. But let's see if you're as flexible in battle as you are in words. Do as you please, Reiji replied before rushing towards Tatsuya. Spinning his spear in an intricate and complex pattern, Reiji advanced, his footwork light and nimble as he ran across the hard and sturdy ground. Tatsuya smirked and taunted Reiji as he approached, oh. You're approaching me. Instead of running away, you come right to me. But Reiji remained focused and ignored his words, his eyes narrowing as he quickly slashed his sword vertically toward Tatsuya's head. Tatsuya moved quickly, sidestepping the attack with ease. Before he could even comment on Reiji's failed attempt, a foot appeared out of nowhere, striking him hard in the face. The impact sent Tatsuya flying back a full two meters, his body slamming hard into the ground. Reiji yanked his spear out of the ground and turned to face Captain Meld. That isn't against the rules, right? Captain Meld, who had been momentarily stunned by Reiji's action, snapped out of it and replied, Nope. I've already stated the rules, and as such, you're safe. Nodding to himself, Reiji kept his focus on Tatsuya. He knew that his attacks would not inflict much damage on an experienced fighter like him, but he also recognized this as an opportunity to learn. Reiji had gained some insight into Tatsuya's style and realized that it would be best to incorporate some of it into his own style soon. There was no point in hiding his proficiency with the spear since everyone in the class already knew about it. As for his strength, it had been stated that all the heroes had their strength multiplied by 10 upon arriving, but Reiji was still holding back a bit. He didn't want to reveal that he was stronger than the hero himself and give the enemy more information. Ultimately, Reiji knew that the most powerful weapon in this world was magic, and as long as he possessed it, he would be able to hold his own. As the dust settled, Tatsuya appeared from it, rolling his shoulders and popping his neck. You really do have a lot of strength, he remarked with a slight laugh, but then his expression turned serious. I've already said this, but I'll say it again. From now on, I'll be going all out at 100%. Saying nothing, Reiji shot from his spot and appeared in front of Tatsuya who was already positioned accordingly. With his spear overhead, he slammed it down upon Tatsuya's who just parried it to the right. Taking advantage of his own momentum, Reiji twirled his spear behind his back and switched his grip, now holding it with his left hand as he swung it at Tatsuya's head. Once again, Tatsuya blocked the attack, and in one fluid motion, he used the momentum to kick the spear toward the ground and then stepped on it, using it as a platform to launch himself toward Reiji and deliver a powerful kick to his chest. Reiji's eyes widened in shock as he felt the full impact of Tatsuya's kick, sending him back even further than he had anticipated. Gasping for air, Reiji managed to dodge Tatsuya's neck strike just in time. Quickly recovering, Reiji positioned his forearms on the ground and pushed himself up to his feet. He then jumped back to create some distance between himself and Tatsuya before tightly gripping his spear and assuming a stance. Tatsuya continued his pursuit, leaping into the air and preparing to strike Reiji with a powerful blow as he readied his stance. This is the end. Tatsuya yelled as he brought his sword down. Locking eyes with Tatsuya, Reiji's gaze became sharp as he suddenly shifted his stance. Spinning his spear in a counterclockwise motion, he took a deep breath, 
clearing his mind of all distractions. The thoughts of Ishtar, the king, and the crowd faded away, leaving only Reiji, his spear, and his opponent in the present moment. Reiji focused his mind as he prepared to execute his next move. First configuration, he thought to himself as he aimed his spear toward his target. With a powerful thrust, the spear sliced through the air, extending past Tatsuya's sword, and struck its intended mark with a satisfying thud, causing Tatsuya's shoulder to dislocate. Compass needle, Reiji muttered under his breath, content that he had hit his target. However, his moment of triumph was short-lived as Tatsuya surprised him by quickly switching his sword to his other hand and launching an attack. Reacting quickly, Reiji dodged the swing and attempted to retaliate with a counter-attack. But Tatsuya was too fast. With his lightning-fast reflexes, he kicked Reiji in the abdomen, causing him to stagger back a few steps. Recovering quickly, Reiji returned to his fighting stance, observing as Tatsuya realigned his shoulder with ease. Not bad, Tatsuya complimented. Not bad at all. However, if you believe that attack could take me down, you are sorely mistaken. I never expected it to stop you, Reiji stated calmly. I just wanted to get a hit in. Tatsuya smirked at that. What are you going to do about it? You know that my skills, durability, and experience are greater than yours, so what will you do? Even the crowd doesn't believe you're going to win. The spectators are irrelevant. They have no say or sway over my actions or decisions here. But since you want to bring up skills, have you gotten an idea of what type of person I am? After all, this is why you wanted to spar with me, isn't it? Reiji taunted. Without answering, Tatsuya charged at Reiji with even more ferocity than before. Bringing his sword down, he aimed it straight at Reiji, but the latter brought up his spear just in time to block the attack, bringing them to a standstill. Did I perhaps hit the mark? Reiji taunted sarcastically. However, Tatsuya was undeterred and pushed more strength into his blow, striking down on Reiji once more. The force of the attack caused him to buckle and strain, almost buckling a knee to the ground. You talk too much for someone on the losing side, Tatsuya commented as he brought his sword up and roundhouse kicked Reiji in the chest, sending him flying towards the boundary line. Contorting his body midair, Reiji twisted his waist, keeping his back straight and his grip on his spear tight. He used the force to spin and landed safely on the ground. As he picked up his spear, he gazed at Tatsuya's irritated expression. Suddenly, Reiji coughed up a bit of blood. It seems that I used a little too much force. Oh well, there are healers for a reason. As long as I don't hurt him too badly, then I'll be in the clear, Tatsuya muttered as he glanced toward Captain Meld, who was frowning. Checking his body, Reiji realized he had two broken ribs from the attack. Steadily standing back up, he gritted his teeth and grabbed his spear once more, facing Tatsuya. Although his body was tired and in pain, he knew that his endurance and durability had increased thanks to the mana coursing through his body. Wow, I must commend you. Standing up despite all that pain. Truly remarkable for a kid your age, Tatsuya complimented. Taking a quick breath, Reiji replied, this match isn't over yet, you know. Neither one of us is unconscious or outside the boundary line. Slyly smiling, Tatsuya rested his sword on his shoulder in a relaxed position. Then I just need to change that, don't I? Assuming a lunge position, Tatsuya spoke once more. Don't worry, Reiji. It won't take too long. I wouldn't be too sure about that, Reiji suddenly said. Everyone was confused, and rightfully so. To them, this match was over, and what Reiji was saying could be seen as nonsense. Furrowing his brows in suspicion, Tatsuya asked, What do you mean? Only to be met with silence and a gesture from Reiji to come at him. Obliging, he dashed at Reiji with caution, something he hadn't done once since the beginning of the match. There was a dark, foreboding feeling he had gotten since he kicked Reiji in the chest. It unnerved him, to say the least. However, contrary to his expectations and the crowds, Reiji ran away from him. The action left everyone befuddled, except Tatsuya who laughed in glee. I don't know what you're planning, but if it's just a random goose chase then you should know shooting off from the ground, he appeared next to Reiji. I'm faster. Saying nothing, 
Reiji brandished his spear and slashed upward toward Tatsuya's head. Moving his head out of the way, Tatsuya dodged the attack. Not letting up, Reiji twirled his spear and delivered a horizontal slash at Tatsuya. Contorting his body, Tatsuya moved his sword to his other hand and blocked the attack. However, due to his body being positioned uncomfortably, he couldn't fully block it, allowing Reiji an opening to deliver a blow. Fifth configuration, gripping his spear with one hand, Reiji spun it and delivered a diagonal slash at Tatsuya's torso, only for it to be blocked. He kept up the attack, slightly jumping and swinging his spear in an uppercut, forcing Tatsuya's sword upward. After landing on the ground, Reiji spun around, twirling his spear above his head and gripping it tightly as he swung it in a wide horizontal arc, before delivering another uppercut. Tatsuya barely managed to block the attack while trying to maintain his balance. Using the momentum, he delivered consecutive attacks with the blunt side of his spear before finishing with a final blow using the tip, successfully breaking Tatsuya's defense, and blowing him back a few feet unbalanced. Sticking his spear into the ground, Reiji vaulted into a flip as he spun and contorted his body, gathering as much kinetic energy as possible before slamming his spear down on Tatsuya. The impact picked up dust, masking themselves and the audience from the fight. Releasing his breath, Reiji muttered, Chaotic Eclipse. Chapter 10 As the dust continued to swirl, the audience grew increasingly rowdy. They hadn't expected Reiji to retaliate in such a manner since he was previously shown to stay on the defense and counter. With the dust obscuring their view, anticipation gnawed at them. The crowd had split into groups, and the class factions quickly separated. The instructors, led by Captain Meld, formed a tight-knit cluster while Cookie's group, except for Cory, sat nearby. I must say, Captain Meld, this is quite fascinating, remarked one of the female instructors. Who could have imagined that such a young man would possess such a remarkable move in his arsenal? He truly is a genius, isn't he? I hope he requests to train under me. Although my weapon choice differs from his, experience is something he can't afford to lose, a male instructor added, brandishing his sword. Another female instructor chimed in, right? He's super cute as well. I wonder if he has a girlfriend. Her dangerous glint didn't go unnoticed, as everyone looked at her funny. Realizing the mood, she saved herself, waving her hands and saying, it's just a joke, all right? Just a joke. She wasn't joking, the instructors all thought to themselves. They were unsure of how to react to the inappropriate comment, but before they could say or do anything, Captain Melt stepped in. I would advise you not to try anything against the students, I am, Captain Meld informed, not shifting his position but giving her a glance that meant this was a warning and not one to be taken lightly. My my, Captain Meld, whatever do you mean by that? I am asked in a playful tone. When she received no response, she continued, all right, I won't do anything. But if he wants to train under me, you can't stop him, all right? Captain Meld's expression remained unchanged as he replied, I have no intention of stopping any of the students from choosing their path. However, I trust that you will not let your personal interests interfere with their development as heroes. I am smile remained fixed as she replied, of course, Captain. I only have their best interests at heart. But the other instructors could tell that she had ulterior motives, and they exchanged uneasy glances. Meanwhile, Reiji found himself surrounded by a cloud of dust and was short of breath, indicating his exhaustion. Ha, ha, he gasped, the toll from his previous attack catching up with him. As he peered forward, the unmistakable outline of Tatsuya emerged from the dust cloud. My, my, Reiji. You look exhausted, Tatsuya taunted, his voice dripping with arrogance. Simply fatigued, it would seem that you should forfeit this match, right? As you can see, I'm pretty much unscathed from your brilliant counterattack. Simply marvelous, I tell you. Reiji didn't reply but took a deep breath and tightened his grip on his spear. You don't seem to understand the situation you put yourself in, he said, twirling his weapon as his mind began to clear and his senses heightened. You know, for a weapon specialist, you're pretty dumb, aren't you? Tatsuya's expression turned sour as he glared at Reiji with disdain. Ignoring Tatsuya's hostility, Reiji continued, you know, it's quite amusing. 
An adolescent teen holds more skill than the weapon specialist who was recognized by the king himself. It would make for a funny story, wouldn't you agree? Dodging Tatsuya's sudden strike, Reiji continued his provocations, Wow, is this the best you can do? If I were the king, I would have taken away your title in a heartbeat. As Tatsuya picked up speed, his attacks became more ferocious but lost their technique. The force behind his strikes began to fan the dust, revealing the grounds once more. The two continued to exchange blows, with Reiji deftly pivoting to the side and angling his spear, using the shaft to redirect the force of Tatsuya's sword away from his body and using the force to throw it off course. However, each blow from Tatsuya's sword sent shockwaves through Reiji's arms and shoulders, threatening to jar his grip on his spear loose, leaving him with little choice but to dodge and parry. Seizing an opportunity, Reiji added his own force to Tatsuya's swing, slamming it to the side and causing Tatsuya's body to follow before quickly unleashing a powerful kick that sent Tatsuya flying into the distance. The blow wafted away some of the dust. Contorting his body quickly, Tatsuya landed on his feet before glaring at Reiji. Quit running away and come face me, you coward. He bellowed, his face seething with resentment. You're nothing but a fake a phony warrior. A scared boy afraid of facing me head on. Have some honor and fight me. Reiji stood still, gazing at Tatsuya, unnerved by his hostility. Although I've said it once, I'll say it again so that it sticks. You're pretty dumb for a weapon specialist. If you thought your tantrum was going to magically change my mind, then you're sorely mistaken. As Reiji spoke, Tatsuya grew increasingly frustrated, his mana unconsciously leaking in minuscule amounts, unbeknownst to himself. Unaware of this, Reiji continued, why should I have to face you head-on like a hothead? There's no such thing as fair or unfair in battle. There is only victory or, in your case, defeat. What are you talking about? Tatsuya growled, his fists clenching and his grip tightening on his sword. Even now, you can't comprehend it, Reiji commented, shaking his head. Look down from where you're standing. Begrudgingly following Reiji's instructions, Tatsuya's eyes widened, threatening to pop out of his sockets as a mixture of shock, confusion, and anger overwhelmed him. You see it now, don't you? Reiji asked sarcastically, watching as Tatsuya looked down and saw that he was standing outside the boundary line. And since you're finally aware of your status, you should realize by now that the dust cloud cleared up just recently. The whole crowd is aware of this very moment, so saving yourself is impossible. In other words, you lost. Tatsuya's face twisted into a mask of fury at Reiji's words, his rage palpable. Without a second thought, his mana exploded, and he moved faster than Reiji could see, closing the distance between them in an instant. Tatsuya raised his sword, preparing to strike with all his might, but before he could land a blow, Captain Meld appeared between them, intervening before things could turn dangerous. That's enough, Tatsuya. Captain Meld ordered sternly. Tatsuya hesitated for a moment, his sword still raised, before slowly lowering it. His mana slowly dissipated, and he took a step back, still glaring at Reiji. Fixing Reiji with a stern look, Captain Meld addressed him in a no-nonsense tone. Reiji, you were aware that Tatsuya had stepped outside the boundary line, yet you still provoked him. That was a reckless move and could have resulted in serious harm, Captain Meld reprimanded. Reiji shrugged with indifference. He needed to learn his place. I'm not one of his toys he could humiliate to gain clout. Besides, he wouldn't have been able to hurt me anyway. I knew you would intervene if it got too hectic. Your gaze isn't exactly hard to catch on to, you know. Anyway, could you call over a healer before I go and sit down? Tatsuya's kick may have broken a rib or two. Captain Meld nodded in agreement. I'll cash in those favors at a later date. So if you'll excuse me, I'll go sit down before my adrenaline wears off and I fatigue. As Reiji departed to the sidelines, Tatsuya was left seething with anger. Captain Meld turned to him and said, Tatsuya, you should know better than to let your emotions get the best of you. You're an instructor here, so you need to present yourself accordingly. With how you acted today, the students here won't take you seriously. It's up to you to fix that. Do you understand? Tatsuya gritted his teeth, still glaring at Reiji's retreating figure. I know, Captain. I'll try. 
With a deep breath, Tatsuya took a step back, trying to calm himself down. He knew that Reiji's words were meant to provoke him, but that didn't make it any easier to swallow. As the healer arrived to tend to Reiji's injuries, he leaned back against the wall in a mixture of satisfaction and exhaustion. There were several reasons why Reiji had emerged victorious in the fight, but he was too tired to articulate them at the moment. As he drifted into a state of light sleep, he felt the cool touch of the healer's hand hovering around his abdomen. Chapter 11 I guess that design should work, Reiji muttered, seemingly satisfied. He dropped his pen and closed the notebook before crawling into bed, eager to get some sleep after the long day he had. It didn't take long for him to fall into a slumber, reflecting on how he had won his match against Tatsuya. Although Tatsuya is a competent fighter who has earned the title of a weapon specialist for the kingdom, he lost to Reiji despite having more experience, better stats, and superior skills. The reason for his defeat can be summed up in two words, spatial awareness. Tatsuya's fighting style favored brute force over finesse, with a focus on powerful strikes rather than graceful technique and control. His wide swings suggested that he lacked experience in boundary-type matches. In contrast, Reiji had much more experience in boundary-type matches, having participated in tournaments in South Korea. Reiji never planned to face Tatsuya head-on. He knew that he couldn't win in endurance, speed, or strength against Tatsuya. So instead, when Tatsuya's ego had reached its limit, Reiji implemented a plan that was effective against him due to his weakness. Running away and then creating a dust cloud to blind everyone, provoking him to make him lose the little skill he had to make a mistake and then finally kicking him out of the boundary line. It was solely due to Tatsuya's arrogance and ego that he didn't take the match seriously at the beginning, ultimately costing himself the match and the wager. Reiji achieved all of his objectives in the match with minimal drawbacks, three favors, reputation influence within the class, and interest from other instructors. The only demerits were the definite of spy action against him and being repeatedly annoyed by his class. Reiji's status is safe as Ishtar's words could be used against him, and they have no idea what job class he belongs to. They can make assumptions based on the way he fought and strength he exhibited, but as previously stated, magic reigns supreme in this world. The next day. Reiji unwrapped the bandages tightly wound around his torso and examined himself in the mirror. Magic is truly something, he whistled, noticing that his skin showed no signs of being broken or bruised, as if the fight had never even happened. After dressing himself in his training uniform, he walked out of his room and shut the door behind him before making his way to the training grounds. Today, they were finally going to be learning magic, and Reiji was very much looking forward to it. As Reiji approached the training grounds, he noticed the students exchanging curious glances and whispering amongst themselves. It was evident that yesterday's events were still fresh in their minds, and they were discussing his identity from Korea and the outcome of the fight with Tatsuya. Captain Melt's voice broke through the murmurs, All right everyone, quiet down. He then introduced the magic instructors standing behind him. Today, we will be learning about magic. The groups will remain the same, and I want to emphasize that there will be no horseplay. Magic is very dangerous, and we must be careful to avoid any injuries. After Captain Melt's instructions, the students dispersed to find their respective instructors and groups. Reiji quickly found his group, who were standing in front of their instructor. He examined her closely. The instructor in front of Reiji's group was a tall woman with fair skin and striking jade-colored eyes. Her shoulder-length hair was wavy and a light honey-brown color, tied in a loose side ponytail. She wore a flowing purple and white dress with open slits at the sides, adorned with gold embroidery. Black gloves with pale purple trim, a large witch's hat, black lace stockings, and black high heels completed her attire. A visible earring adorned one ear, while a gold necklace with her vision clasped to the collar of her dress completed her look. A pale purple rose was pinned to her hat, and a similar one on the tie of her ponytail. At her hip, a large ornamental golden rose was attached to her belt. Reiji couldn't help but be impressed by her elegant and powerful presence. Are you done checking me out, young man? The woman asked in a teasing tone, facing Reiji and prompting the others to do the same. Without missing a beat, Reiji shrugged his shoulders and responded, Is it wrong to appreciate a woman's beauty? He asked with a small smile. 
Grinning in response, the woman shook her head and replied, not at all. Just don't expect me to return the favor. Reiji chuckled softly. Fair enough. But may I know the name of the enchantress who graces us with her presence? The name is Lisa Mincy, she replied with a playful twirl of her hair. And I already know who you are, Reiji her voice was laced with flirtation, causing a few students to gape and whisper amongst themselves. As they looked at each other with amusement, Lisa and Reiji let out a snicker in response to the students' gossip. The others watched with confusion and shock, while Captain Meld shook his head in exasperation. Lisa, let's focus on the lesson, and Reiji, please don't encourage her behavior, he said, bringing a sigh of relief from the group. However, jealous glances continued to be cast in Reiji's direction. Lisa wiped away her tears and responded, Oh Captain, it was just a friendly greeting. Right, Reiji? Reiji nodded in agreement and added, Yeah, it's good to have a little fun once in a while. This was especially true for Reiji, who had been doing nothing but strategizing and preparing. And after the fight with Tatsuya yesterday, his brain was in need of a break. Sighing, Captain Meld went back to his post with a sigh, while Lisa turned towards Reiji's group. All right then. As you have already heard, I'm Lisa, your magic instructor. I'll be teaching you everything you need to know about mana and magic. The group nodded in response and listened attentively as Lisa began explaining what mana was and how it worked. To put it simply, mana is a type of energy that exists in most living beings in the world. It's considered the main source that allows people to use magic and is commonly utilized by both humans and demons. However, beast men are typically unable to wield it due to their biological makeup. For a long time, mana was seen as a gift from the gods. Because of this belief, beast men were often treated poorly by other races, who saw them as godless and heretical. If a beast man is born with mana, they are deemed cursed and usually put to death. To cast magic, one must typically chant an incantation, which transfers their mana into a magic circle. This, in turn, allows the spell inscribed within the circle to be cast. The length of the incantation is directly related to the amount of mana that can be poured into the circle, and therefore, the effectiveness of the spell is directly related to the amount of mana used to cast it. Lisa Sensei, is it possible to cast magic without incantations and magic circles? Cookie asked curiously. It was a question that Reiji also had in mind but was reluctant to ask, though now he didn't have to. It's possible. However, to do so, one must possess the skill mana manipulation. If someone has this skill, they can freely manipulate the flow of their mana without chanting, Lisa explained. Then, is it possible to learn it? Shizuku asked. Lisa nodded and replied, yes, it is indeed possible. However, it takes time and lots of practice. Those with higher affinities towards mana will typically have an easier time controlling it. However, even if a person is capable of wielding mana, they may not be able to use magic unless they have the right affinity for a particular element. Shizuku raised a question, aren't our elemental affinities listed on our status plates? Reiji had also wondered about this. Lisa's explanation suggested that one could use all elements, but it seemed unlikely. Lisa smiled and responded to Shizuku's inquiry, magic is categorized into various basic elements, including light, dark, earth, wind, fire, water, ice, and thunder. Several magic spells belong to one of these element categories, such as barrier and healing spells that belong to the light element. She handed out a few sheets of paper to the group and said, these are magic affinity papers. Transfer some mana into it, and it will show if you have an affinity for a particular element. The paper will react if you possess the affinity. You can check it later if you wish. Fire, the paper will catch on fire and turn into ash. Wind, the paper will split in half. Thunder, the paper will wrinkle. Earth, the paper will turn to dirt and crumble away. Water, the paper will become damp. Ice, the paper will freeze. Light, the paper will brighten. Dark, the paper will darken. Status plates don't necessarily list all of your affinities, but rather the main one at which you'll excel. Pay close attention, as this information is crucial, Lisa instructed. She then proceeded to delve into the various uses of mana, emphasizing its versatility. 
It can be converted into various forms of energy, such as healing, stamina, and kinetic, and sometimes even into bioenergy, such as electricity. If a person is low on mana due to prolonged use, they can take supplements or potions to replenish it. However, if a person has too much mana in their body with no means to regulate it, they can suffer from a medical condition called mana overload, which can only be cured by consuming a powdered form of a special mineral known as still stone. If left untreated, mana overload can be fatal. Lisa also mentioned that animals are capable of wielding mana, but since they cannot cast magic, many of them would either die from mana overload or have their mana turn into crystals within them, transforming them into monsters. All monsters have the ability to freely control their mana and possess a unique magical skill. Unlike other races that have their own unique color of mana, every monster's mana is typically a dark shade of red. Lisa announced with a grin, there's still a bit more to learn, but I've already covered the basics and important parts of magic. Now it's time for you to put it to the test. We'll be doing target practice. Arena As the groups entered the arena's entrance, the students who had been doing obstacle courses the day before whispered among themselves in awe at the sight of the arena. In the center were the same humanoid targets that Reiji had noticed on the first day of training. The weapon rack had been replaced with wands and staffs for those who didn't possess the image composition skill. This skill allowed the user to create an imaginary magic circle in their mind, eliminating the need for either a spell paper or magical equipment. Reiji, however, decided to use a staff instead. He didn't want to reveal his trump card so early. Even those with physical jobs like Shizuku were capable of using magic, so it would be suspicious if Reiji couldn't do the same. Your objective is to hit the target three times. Once you achieve this, you're done for the day and can spend the rest of your time as you wish, announced Captain Meld. His words motivated the less capable students who found the lecture boring and mentally draining. Pick up a staff and stand behind the line. We will all be using the basic fire spell Fireball. The incantation is, O oh flame, be born and consume all. Fireball. Reiji had never cringed as much as he did just now. There's no way in hell I'm saying that out loud. I'd rather die. Even my configurations aren't as cringy as that, he thought to himself. Raising his hand, Captain Meld nodded at him, indicating he could speak. Captain Meld, is it possible to say the chant in our head? I can confidently say that I and some others definitely don't want to say that out loud, Reiji asked, and a few of his peers nodded in agreement. Though Captain Meld was confused, he answered. Yes, you can. It won't affect the spell in any way. A collective sigh of relief was released from Reiji and his peers. Gripping his staff tightly, Reiji focused on the target before starting to chant the spell silently in his mind. O oh flame, be born and consume all. As he chanted the spell, a magic circle appeared before him, resembling his mana color of amethyst and purple. Mana coursed through his body, reaching his fingertips as he channeled it through the staff, which acted as a conduit. The magic circle brightened as Reiji aimed at his target, feeding on the mana and growing stronger. Finally, he finished his chant and exclaimed, Fireball! A bright ball of flames erupted from the tip of his staff and hurtled towards the humanoid target. The ball struck the target with an explosion, leaving a smoking hole in its chest. Wo Reiji muttered. It was a feeling he had never experienced before, but he had to admit it felt good. Surveying his peers, it seemed that they had achieved similar results to him, except for the fact that some of them had missed their targets. However, Cookie and Hayama seemed to excel, probably due to their affinity for the element. It didn't take long before Reiji completed the training objective. After returning the staff to the weapon rack, he informed Captain Meld and Lisa, I have completed today's objective. Already? Captain Meld asked, clearly surprised. He had expected the group to have some difficulty with the training. However, he brushed it off and smiled, saying, Huh, you might have a talent for magic, Reiji. You finished even before those with mage classes. I don't think so, Reiji replied, trying to downplay the assumption. The only reason I beat them was because they lacked the proper skill to stay steady and aim accordingly. As someone who wields a spear, I have to have sharp eyes, which helped me in this case. There's no need to be so modest, 
Reiji, Lisa interjected with a smile. You looked really good out there. It makes me wonder what else you're good at. Reiji, in return, just shrugged his shoulders and responded with his ultimate move for getting out of these situations. Who knows? Chapter 12 Upon entering the castle, Reiji made his way back to his room and sat on his bed in a meditative position. After using his spell, he realized that he had a better understanding and control of mana than he initially thought. It was possible that the power he inherited from the abyss, or his own natural talent, contributed to this newfound ability. Being someone who was not native to this world, Reiji knew there were various ways to train and master control over his energy. It was best to start early and consistently work towards improvement. He closed his eyes and began to breathe deeply, letting his thoughts drift away as he focused on the sensation of his mana coursing through his body. He concentrated on controlling the flow of mana, directing it to different parts of his body and feeling it respond to his will. Reiji could feel his power growing stronger and his control becoming more precise with each passing moment. He began to visualize his energy as a dark, glowing orb that pulsated and throbbed with raw power. Each time he breathed, the orb grew larger and more intense, moving towards different parts of his body and flooding him with a surge of power and clarity. As the clock ticked, the orb continued to expand and engulf Reiji's entire being. Eventually, he opened his eyes and was startled to see that it was already noon. He was surprised to find that he was drenched in sweat, as was his clothing, but he knew that his efforts had been worth it. Glancing at his arm, he saw that it was now glowing with a black and purple aura, and he grinned in satisfaction. Body Augmentation This is the most I can do for now. My mana is already being drained like crazy, which is to be expected since the mana is being evenly distributed throughout my body, and my mind is buzzing. Using image composition to visualize the flow of my mana, I was able to complete this. However, my physique and mental strength need more training, and my control needs to improve otherwise, this form is useless. I feel around 2-3x stronger, so it can be used as my trump card. I wonder if I can create a super scion ability. After rising from the bed, Reiji replaced his damp sheets with fresh ones and proceeded to take a much needed bath. Reiji sank into the warm water, letting out a contented sigh as he felt the tension in his muscles slowly melt away. His mind felt numb from the strain of the experiment, but the warm water was doing wonders for his headache. Closing his eyes, he leaned back and let himself float, the sound of the water lapping against the sides of the tub lulling him into a state of relaxation. I should go to the cafeteria, he thought to himself as his stomach let out a loud growl. Reiji had finally come to understand why shonen protagonists were always depicted as hungry after their training sessions, especially characters like Goku and Naruto. The act of controlling energy sources was incredibly draining. After his refreshing bath, Reiji wrapped a towel around his waist and dried off his body before changing into comfortable clothing. He then stepped out of his room, making sure to close the door behind him before heading towards the cafeteria. Reiji arrived at the cafeteria in no time, feeling his stomach grumble with hunger. He picked up his favorite dishes from the counter and sat down at a nearby table to enjoy his meal. As he ate, he pulled out his notebook and resumed his work, carefully drawing and labeling his wants and needs for a spear. As he sketched and ate, Reiji felt a presence approaching him. Looking up, he saw Lisa and several other instructors he had taken note of due to their distinctive appearances and auras. Sitting at his table, Lisa greeted him. Hey, Reiji. I hope you don't mind if we sit here. Lisa asked, taking a seat before Reiji could even respond. Reiji simply nodded in response and observed her company. He couldn't help but feel awe at the signatures of mana radiating off the instructors sitting with Lisa. They were just like monsters to him. He couldn't help but wonder just how strong Captain Meld, who was deemed the strongest in the kingdom, was if the instructors were already this powerful. It made him wonder how much stronger the demons were for them to request help from heroes. A rather old man interrupted, so are you going to introduce us to this young man, Lisa? Reiji observed that the man seemed like one of those monster-like old men, reminiscent of Yamamoto and Rashi. Another woman cried out in annoyance, Yeah, Lisa. You said you were going to introduce him to me. Even Captain Mel tried to hide him from me. Reiji watched them both with a mix of confusion and interest. 
Reiji sensed that they were both strong, possibly even stronger than Tatsuya, at least according to his instincts. All right, all right, she said, waving her hand in dismissal before turning towards Reiji. The old man sitting beside me is Seabass. He specializes in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He's a master in physical training, and as such, you didn't see him during your fight with Tatsuya because he was supervising the other group on the obstacle course. Seabass was dressed as an elderly butler, and he exuded an air of grace in his traditional black uniform. His hair and beard were both entirely white, and he had visible wrinkles on his gentle face, though his eyes were as sharp as an eagle's. And this girl beside me is Ayam. She specializes in the weapon known as a kuzurigama. Your classmates were shocked to see it and asked about it, so we looked it up. She used to be an adventurer before being hired by the kingdom a few years ago for unknown reasons. It was never stated, and she herself doesn't like to talk about it, but she's now an instructor due to her skills, Lisa explained to Reiji. Ayam was dressed in a rather revealing outfit that highlighted her slender and athletic build, which wasn't ignored by Reiji. Her wavy scarlet hair flowed down to her lower back and her eyes were a beautiful pink. While she seemed to be as outgoing as Lisa, there was a strange feeling about her that Reiji didn't like, so he decided to be on guard around her. The way Lisa had introduced her had also raised an eyebrow, but he didn't call her out on it. It's nice to meet you both. As you already know, I'm Reiji, one of the summoned heroes, and I specialize in the spear, Reiji introduced himself. Lisa, with her curious nature pointed at Reiji's notebook and asked, I don't mean to pry, but what were you drawing in your sketchbook when we approached? Reiji didn't see any harm in answering Lisa's question, so he responded, It's just a design for a spear I want to have made using one of the favors I received from Tatsuya. It shouldn't be too difficult to obtain, as he said he could get it without any issues. However, since I have no idea where he is at the moment, I'll have to ask Captain Meld for help. Their interest was piqued, and they were curious to see what the young man had designed. Can we see the design? Seabass asked, and Reiji handed it over. The three examined the design, satisfying their curiosity. There wasn't much to be shown other than the drawing. Reiji hadn't gone into further detail about how he wanted the spear done, just the appearance and color. He was going to keep that information to himself, until it was time to cash in the favor. This is really detailed, Reiji. Even the color shadings and outlines are impressive. I wonder what it would look like when it's made, I am exclaimed, with Seabass and Lisa nodding in agreement. Thank you for the compliment. However, I was wondering, have any of you recently seen Captain Meld? Reiji asked, changing the subject. Lisa shook her head, no, we haven't. But he should be back soon. I can ask around if you want. That won't be necessary. I'll just wait for him, Reiji replied with a smile. Anyway, thank you for your help. I'll be going now. He picked up his sketchbook, threw away his trash, and left the cafeteria. Chapter 13 So this is the library, Reiji murmured. He thanked the maid who had shown him the way and watched as she bowed before continuing on with her duties. Reiji took a few steps forward, examining his surroundings. Stepping into the library, he marveled at its grandeur. The circular room was lined with towering bookshelves from floor to ceiling, filled with books of various shapes and sizes, some of them appearing ancient and worn out. The soft golden light that illuminated the room added to the warm and inviting atmosphere. Tables and chairs were scattered throughout the space, providing ample seating for readers. In the center of the room stood an ornate desk manned by a beautiful librarian, ready to assist anyone in search of the perfect book. The library held a wide range of reading materials, including novels, historical tomes, and spellbooks. It was a peaceful and enchanting place that called out to book lovers to explore its vast collection. Despite its inviting ambience, the library was not a frequently visited place in the world of fantasy. If not for Reiji's need for knowledge, it could have remained the same. As Reiji started browsing the shelves, a woman's voice interrupted him. You can't grab any of the books without signing into the library. Do you have a library card? She asked. Reiji turned towards her and observed that she appeared to be around the age of 19 or 20, not much older than himself. Her long, lustrous hair was intricately styled into an elegant crown of braids and twists, 
highlighting the silky texture and captivating hue of her auburn locks. Her golden eyes added an extra allure to her overall appearance. Her outfit was eye-catching, with a white-collared button-up shirt paired with a leather waist tunic that covered it. Golden bracelets adorned her biceps and wrists, adding to the flashy look. She wore a red tunic skirt that emphasized her shapely thighs as she faced Reiji. Shaking his head, Reiji answered, Nope. I didn't realize I needed a library card to enter. I assumed it was open to those living within the castle after all. Though I guess it is warranted. Anyways, I'm Reiji, one of the summoned heroes. Her eyes widened ever so slightly at the mention of his name before regaining her composure. She smiled and introduced herself, my name is Serafina, but you can call me Sarah. I'm the librarian here. Come on, I can help you get a library card. All you have to do is fill out a quick form. Reiji nodded and followed Sarah to the desk. As she pulled out the form, he couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Ever since learning how to control mana, he had been experiencing sudden, unexplainable sensations that unnerved him. Sarah handed him the form and a quill pen. Just fill out your name, age, and occupation. You can also list your interests if you'd like. Once you're done, I'll take care of the rest. Reiji utilized his detect magic skill to scan the paper and quill pen for any magical properties like a potential magical contract, but the results came out negative. There was no magical energy emanating from either the paper or the quill pen. This left him perplexed as to why he was experiencing these strange feelings, and he couldn't help but wonder if it was just one of his skills acting up. The questions were straightforward, and since there was nothing objectionable, Reiji began filling out the form, leaving the interest section blank. After finishing the form, Reiji handed it back to the librarian, who examined it briefly before nodding her head in approval. All right, everything seems to be in order. Here's your library card, she said as she handed him a small, rectangular piece of plastic. Thank you, Reiji said as he accepted the library card and tucked it into his pocket. Not wanting to waste any more time, he started picking out books on various subjects such as history, geography, and magic. With a pile of books in his arms, Reiji made his way to a quiet corner of the library and sat down at a table. And without delay, he began reading through the books. After studying for two hours in the library, Reiji leaned back in his seat and let out a sigh. The history of this world he had immersed himself in was disappointing, to say the least. It felt like there were pages missing from the books. But Reiji wasn't too surprised. As the saying goes, history is written by the victors. In summary, demi-humans lived in isolation within the Haltina woods due to the severe discrimination they faced for their lack of mana. According to legend, the gods, starting with a hit, used magic to shape the very foundation of the world. The magic used by everyone today is believed to be a weaker form of the power the gods once possessed. This belief has led to the common understanding that magic is a divine gift, a concept reinforced by the teachings of the Holy Church. Due to their lack of mana and inability to use magic, demi-humans were viewed as wicked creatures who had been abandoned by the gods. This made Reiji wonder about the treatment of monsters, which were considered natural disasters and nothing more than wild beasts without any divine blessings. Even more distressing to learn that demons, despite worshipping a different god than the humans, also discriminated against demi-humans. Demons were believed to possess a much higher magical affinity than humans, enabling them to cast spells with shorter incantations and smaller magic circles. They resided in the demon kingdom of Garland, located in the center of the southern continent. It seemed that no one could accept demi-humans for who they were. The humans in this world, indoctrinated by the teachings of the Holy Church, viewed demi-humans as godless pests, and demons as their mortal enemies, despite their differing beliefs. Reiji couldn't help but wonder if the demi-humans simply wanted to be left alone, but they were never given a chance. Reiji also learned about the seven labyrinths, known to be extremely perilous locations across the world. The Great Orcus Labyrinth was one of them, located to the southwest of the Hylai Kingdom, between the capital and the Gruin Desert. The Haltina Woods, mentioned earlier, was also one of these labyrinths. However, despite being referred to as the Seven Labyrinths, only three of them had ever been recorded. 
The rest were places believed to exist due to evidence provided in ancient books and manuscripts, adding to the mystery and danger surrounding them. As he returned the books to their shelf, Reiji saw someone unexpected and walked towards him. Hajime. What are you doing here? He asked. Reiji. I'm just trying to learn more about this world. My job class is pretty weak, so I need to learn as much as I can about the world to survive and get stronger, Hajime explained. Nodding in understanding, Reiji gestured to him to sit with him. Since you and I have the same idea let's share some intel of what we've gathered. From what I've noticed the book you had was of minerals and items like potions, correct? Getting a nod from Hajime, Reiji continued. I was learning about the history and geography of this world. So, let's exchange information. Not wanting to disagree, Hajime sat down in front of him. Sure. We can exchange information, it would take weeks until I learn everything here from just reading anyways. Reiji and Hajime shared their knowledge about the world, exchanging thoughts and findings on how to survive and get stronger. Hajime delved into the various ores and minerals of the world and their functions, while Reiji explained the history, geography, and cultures of the world. After an hour of discussion, they parted ways, each of them better equipped with new insights and knowledge. Before leaving the library, Reiji asked if Hajime had seen Captain Meld anywhere. Hajime nodded and informed him that he had seen the captain with Cookie in the training grounds earlier. Thanking him for the information, Reiji bid him goodbye and made his way to the training grounds to find Captain Meld. Reiji arrived at the training grounds and saw Captain Meld watching Cookie train with his sword. As he approached him, Captain Meld turned to face him and asked, Is there anything you need, Reiji? Reiji nodded and replied as they watched Cookie train, Yeah, I want to use two of my favors. Captain Melt's eyes widened slightly, but he nodded and said, Since Tatsuya is doing a task for the king right now, I'll do the favors for you, though they will come out of his savings. Reiji's eyes flashed with amusement at Captain Melt's statement. State your wish, however, it should be reasonable and manageable. Reiji pulled out a paper from his pocket and presented it to Captain Meld. I want a spear made of mithril using this design and color, he said, showing the captain the paper. Procuring the material might be a challenge, but I believe the kingdom should have it. I request the best craftsman in the kingdom to make it. And for my second favor, I request a suitable facility where I can live and train. It doesn't have to be grand, but it should be spacious enough for me to practice magic and train with my spear without any disturbances. It should have all the necessary essentials such as a bathroom and kitchen. I would prefer it to be located near the forest and the arena. Captain Meld listened carefully to Reiji's requests and nodded in agreement. I'll make sure to find the best craftsman to make your spear, and I'll start looking for a suitable location for your training facility, he said. I'll also inform Tatsuya of your request, and he'll take care of the expenses. However, it will take some time to complete. Approximately one to two weeks. Is there anything else? Reiji nodded in gratitude. No, thank you, he said before bidding Captain Meld farewell. Chapter 14 Sitting cross-legged on the smooth and durable ground, Reiji closed his eyes, feeling the sweat trickling down his forehead. It had been a week since he made his requests to Captain Meld, and he couldn't deny that these weeks had been the most peaceful and productive he had experienced in a while. However, a sense of unease lingered within him. Ishtar, the enigmatic presence that had plagued his thoughts, had been conspicuously absent. This absence put Reiji on edge, making him more cautious and distrustful of everyone around him his classmates, instructors, and even the kingdom itself. He understood the difference between revealing information and placing trust in others. For Reiji, trust was a precious commodity that he only bestowed when it was absolutely necessary or beneficial in the long run. The facility he now found himself in was of moderate size and nestled within the training grounds. Its strategic location near the forest and the arena, adjacent to the castle, made it convenient for Reiji. It had been constructed swiftly, thanks to the presence of magic in this world, and the builders had done a commendable job in designing the interiors. As Reiji opened his eyes, he surveyed his surroundings. The spacious room was equipped with the essentials he had requested a dedicated space for practicing magic and wielding his spear, along with a small kitchen, bedroom and bathroom. 
The serene atmosphere within the facility allowed Reiji to immerse himself in his training, honing his skills with uninterrupted focus. While the acquisition of such a facility had raised a few eyebrows among the nobles and his classmates, Reiji paid no mind to their opinions. His lack of trust in the kingdom was apparent, and he saw no reason to be concerned about the discontent of a few nobles. After all, if the kingdom itself had not objected, what power did the nobles truly hold? Reiji was far from idle within his sanctuary. With the assistance of Seabass and Iam, he had seized the opportunity to train with new weapons and push his physical limits, aiming to master the art of using body augmentation with seamless efficiency. In addition, Reiji had dedicated himself to training his mind, striving to maintain a sharp focus while harnessing the intricacies of magic and practicing precise control over mana. The training sessions had taught him one valuable lesson, old men in anime were simply strong. At first, Reiji had no trouble keeping up with Seabass's rigorous workout routine. However, as time went on, it became increasingly challenging for him. It seemed that Seabass specifically had no concept of holding back their punches. Every time they sparred hand to hand, Reiji would find himself utterly decimated, covered in bruises and with fractured bones. If it weren't for Reiji's physical resistance skill, he might have given up already. And then there was I am. As much as it may sound narcissistic, Reiji had initially entertained the thought that she had fallen for his charms. Her persistent flirting and seductive behavior had started to wear on him. However, he quickly dismissed that notion. Despite being the person closest to Reiji, she was also the one he remained the most cautious of. I am possessed a shrewd and cunning nature, going to the extent of gaslighting Captain Meld. While Captain Meld was exceptional both physically and mentally, I am didn't aim to break his mind. Instead, she subtly injected false information and manipulated him with logic. It was an impressive display that shattered Reiji's initial perception of her as an extroverted klutz with a teasing personality. The sole reason Reiji chose to remain close to her was to keep a vigilant eye on her. I am was far too dangerous to be left unchecked, and her true intentions towards him remained unknown. As they say, keep your friends close keep your enemies closer. However in this context, Reiji doesn't have any friends to speak of. Continuing the topic, Reiji used this time to improve his control over his skills, such as his stealth skill. He tactically used the skill around his fellow classmates who possessed the sense presence skill, in order to train with it. Occasionally, Reiji would get caught by Cookie, who was the strongest in the class, apart from Reiji himself, of course. However, Reiji didn't invest as much focus on his practical skills as he did on the one he had just finished creating. It was something much needed to somewhat divert the kingdom from his trail and establish a sense of trust with the kingdom. Taking hold of his status plate, Reiji reached out and touched its surface, reciting the necessary incantation, in shadows embrace, I veil thy might, illusions crafted, concealed from sight. Status plate be shrouded, altered by art, a whispering darkness, a deceptive start. Taking a deep breath, Reiji focused his core power, channeling the essence of darkness into the status plate. The energy swirled and intertwined with the existing properties of the plate, merging seamlessly. With a practiced motion, Reiji withdrew his hand, completing the process. Shadowed resonance, he whispered, his voice carrying a hint of satisfaction. The magic skill he had been working on for the past week had finally come to fruition. Examining his status plate, Reiji nodded, satisfied with his accomplishment. It had been a predicament he had realized when he was nearly compelled to surrender his status plate to Captain Meld. The skill he had just created served to address this issue and also foster a sense of trust with the kingdom. Getting up from the ground, Reiji brushed the dirt and dust off his pants and headed into the bathroom to freshen up. Today was the day of the status inspection, and as risky as it may sound, Reiji had a plan to use his newly acquired magic, Shadowed Resonance, to deceive Captain Meld and gain the kingdom's trust. Reiji was well aware of the potential drawbacks of his plan. While Captain Meld may not be particularly proficient in magic, his senses were undoubtedly sharp and highly developed. However, Reiji saw it as advantageous to hand over his altered status plate to Captain Meld despite the risks. For one, Meld was a genuinely kind person who would give a stranger the benefit of the doubt, much like Reiji himself. He was too trusting and good-natured to harbor immediate distrust. 
In fact, Captain Meld had been trying to get closer to Reiji for this very reason, unbeknownst to Reiji himself. Furthermore, as reiterated time and again, it is crucial to establish trust with the kingdom, even if only to a limited extent. Displaying his status plate proves to be an effective method, as it reveals the most intimate details that this world can offer about an individual. Moreover, the altered status has been modified to highlight not only his physical prowess but also his advancements in magic and various skills. Here's his recent status and his altered status. Recent status. Name Reiji Sukahiro Age, 17 Male Level, 3. Job, Dark Lord. Strength, 190. Vitality, 150. Defense, 160. Agility, 140. Magic, 200. Magic Defense, 120. Skills, Language Comprehension, Physical Resistance, Dark Magic Efficiency, Spear Proficiency, Darkness Affinity, Darkness Manipulation. Increased Mana Recovery, Stealth, Image Composition, Necromancy, Shadow Manipulation, Detect Presence, Detect Magic, Dark Lords Hockey, Mana Manipulation. Magic, Body Augmentation, Shadowed Resonance. Reiji's growth rate was phenomenal, to say the least. Thanks to the world system, those gifted in mana had an easier time training and gaining stats, and Reiji was no exception. However, he never let this fact get to his head. He was proud of his progress, but he wasn't going to become arrogant over it. After all, he knew that there was always someone stronger out there, waiting to be discovered. In any case, his altered status plate looked like this. Altered Status Name Reiji Sukahiro Age, 17 Male Level, 3 Job, Dragoon Strength, 120 Vitality, 90 Defense, 110 Agility, 100 Magic, 70 Magic Defense, 70 Skills, Language Comprehension, Physical Resistance, Spear Proficiency, Detect Presence, Detect Magic, Fire Magic Affinity. Magic, Fireball. Although Reiji's stats were relatively high, they were appropriate for the achievements he had made thus far. He had been working hard on strength training and sparring with Seabass, so it would be suspicious for him to have low stats in defense and strength. Additionally, his affinity towards fire was a result of what he's shown in magic training. Stepping out of the bath, Reiji wrapped a fluffy towel around his body and exited the bathroom. The status inspection was scheduled for today, and once it was done, Reiji had planned to venture into the forest at midnight. He was looking forward to receiving his spear and gaining experience battling the monsters of this world. Changing into his training clothes, he left his quarters and made his way to the arena. As he entered, he noticed that the rest of the class was already present, waiting for him. Ignoring the stairs, he silently took a seat among the crowd and listened to Captain Meld as he gave instructions. It's been two weeks since we began training, so it's time for a re-evaluation of your status plates to assess what's lacking and teach you to improve in those areas. Now, I'll be calling you in order. Until you're called, you can frolic about the arena if you'd like or talk with friends. First up, Kotone. As Captain Meld began examining the status plates, Reiji approached Hajime. They had been meeting up at the library consistently, sharing information of what they read within the library and today was like no other except Reiji wanted info of what was happening within the class as well. Hajime, Reiji called out. Turning around, Hajime released a sigh and walked toward Reiji. What are you so nervous about? Is it your status? Nodding, he responded, yeah, my stats haven't even changed. I'm not gifted with magic, and my physical attributes aren't exactly my strong suit. My job class isn't even a fighting nor a support job. I'm a synergist. Seeing his information broker like this was a pretty sad sight, and as a benevolent figure himself, Reiji decided to lend a helping hand to guide him towards a path of greatness befitting this loyal subject of his. Meet me after the status inspection. We're going to do some training, Reiji told him, leaving no room for refusal. Though confused, Hajime nodded in agreement. Also, what's happening within the class? Any rumors or anything of interest? I've been holed up in my facility for a while, and well, I'm curious. Reiji couldn't help but think to himself, 
I need to come up with a better name for my facility. Using the word facility repeatedly feels bland, boring, and repetitive. As he listened to Hajime. In summary, it appeared that the division within the class had significantly subsided and instead turned into a cold war of sorts. They had grown more accustomed to the world, yet still held on to their individual beliefs and perspectives. Reflecting on this information, Reiji had already reached a conclusion in his mind. Reiji Sukahiro, Captain Neld announced his name indicating he was next up to have the status plate be examined. His status plate was already enchanted with his spell so there was no need to do so again. Putting his hand in his pocket, Reiji infused more mana into it as a protective measure. Approaching Captain Meld, he heard him comment, Are you going to show us your status this time? I might as well. After all, I have no reason not to trust you guys, considering all you have provided me, Reiji answered, shrugging nonchalantly. He then reached into his pocket, retrieved his status plate, and extended his hand to Captain Meld. Here, he said, offering it to him. Captain Meld took hold of the status plate, a smile forming on his face. Well then, thanks for finally trusting us. I know it may have been difficult for you, but I can confidently say that the kingdom and I are grateful for it. Captain Meld carefully examined Reiji's status plate, his eyes scanning the information displayed on the surface. He furrowed his brows momentarily, seemingly absorbed in deep thought as he analyzed the details presented before him. Reiji watched intently, waiting for Captain Meld's reaction. After a brief pause, Captain Meld's expression brightened, and he looked up at Reiji with a mix of surprise and admiration. Impressive, he exclaimed. It seems that your training with Seabass and the other instructors paid off. I don't know what your initial stats were, but you're most likely the strongest after Cookie and Shizuku. Nodding in satisfaction, Reiji responded, Thanks for the praise, Captain Meld. Though, excuse me if this is rude. Despite what I said in our first status inspection, I'm curious about your stats. I've heard that you're the strongest the kingdom has to offer, and I want to know how far away I am from you. Chuckling, Captain Meld reached into his pocket and pulled out his status plate before handing it to Reiji. Reiji grabbed it and examined it carefully. Name Meld Logan's age, 37 male level, 62. Job class, Paladin. Strength, 300. Vitality, 300. Defense, 300. Agility, 300. Magic, 300. Magic defense, 300. Magic skills, sword proficiency, wind magic affinity, advanced level sorcery, detect presence. His stats were well-rounded, and his job class indicated great strength. It was evident that the summoned hero possessed greater potential and strength compared to the natives of this world. Despite having trained for only one week, Reiji already had nearly one-third of Captain Melt's stats and was approaching two-thirds. Handing his status plate back, Reiji thanked him for humoring his request and walked back to the class as Captain Meld resumed examination. Soon enough he finished but before the students could leave he had announced one more thing. Before you guys go, I have an announcement. In one week's time we will be venturing into the outpost town of Harad and enter the Orcus Labyrinth. This is a training excursion. We're not trying to clear it but give you guys real-life fighting experience and to increase levels. Acknowledging the announcement, Reiji nodded and made his way out of the arena, making his way back to his facility. Night time. Come on, one more time, Reiji ordered. He and Hajime were inside his training facility, both sitting in a lotus position. Hajime was breathing heavily, drenched in sweat. Do I really have to? Hajime asked, struggling to catch his breath. Reiji nodded in response and said, This is the only way for you to increase your strength. While you may not have a strong affinity with mana or a robust physique, you've overlooked the core of your job class. You said your job class was synergist, right? Reiji asked, receiving a nod from Hajime. In that case, it simply means you don't belong on the front lines. Your ability to transmute is similar to creation, isn't it? So, what you really need to focus on is improving your mental capacity for complex thinking, analytical thinking, and developing a creative mind. Additionally, you'll need to increase your mana to create more complex tools. However, you'll require better materials than just random dirt and rocks. 
Captain Meld himself stated it at the beginning of our training. You possess a job class suitable for blacksmiths. Although it may not be designed for the front lines, if you learn to wield each weapon in your arsenal and improve your physical capabilities, you will become a formidable force to be reckoned with. Reiji swiftly reached for a magic pill and tossed it to him. Here you go. Since your mana is limited, you'll need to deplete it and replenish it using these mana pills before repeating the process. He reassured him, and don't worry about mana overload. I've tested it myself, so you're safe. We have an entire week for training, but don't expect it to be easy. Prepare yourself, disciple. Chapter 15 Time flowed swiftly, like a river. Another week had passed in the blink of an eye, bringing them to the eve of their expedition into the labyrinth. Reiji's stats had shown moderate improvement, largely due to his unwavering focus on enhancing his mana control. This relentless pursuit had paid off, as he had now reached a new level of proficiency, able to cast spells with a single word incantation and utilize his image composition skill to amplify his magic prowess. Throughout the training sessions with Hajime, Reiji had only ventured into the forest sporadically, reserving those moments when Hajime was not under his guidance. During these encounters, he had encountered a fair number of monsters. However, they posed little threat to Reiji, as they lacked a mana source to draw strength from, rendering them weaker when faced above ground. With the spear he had acquired from Captain Meld, Reiji found his tasks becoming considerably easier. Despite his initial request for a custom type of spear, the one he received turned out to be an upgrade that possessed the ideal qualities for his needs. It was none other than one of the kingdom's revered artifacts. Known as the Divine Spear Longinus, it belonged to the exclusive League of the Seven Holy Artifacts. Its true nature and abilities remained shrouded in mystery, with little information available to Reiji when he inquired about its capabilities. The only confirmed aspects were its remarkable durability, a smooth mana conduit and sharpness. The spear's enigmatic aura intrigued Reiji, leaving him eager to uncover its hidden secrets. Moreover, his exploration of the element of darkness unveiled its profound qualities that surpassed conventional understanding. Curses, illusions, and all things associated with taboo or dark magic were intricately intertwined with this enigmatic element. Reiji couldn't help but wonder how this newfound ability might eventually impact his personality. Would its manifestation become apparent in due time, as Rob had mentioned? So far, Reiji hadn't noticed any discernible changes from his past life, but the potential remained tantalizing. If the Divine Spear Longinus possessed the ability to manipulate its size and shape, much like Sun Wukong's staff, Rui Jingu Bang, it would undoubtedly enhance Reiji's strength and versatility. Surprisingly, it was Hajime who had sparked this speculation, even though Reiji was his mentor. Just like Reiji, Hajime had undergone a remarkable transformation, surpassing his original portrayal and experiencing significant growth in strength. This improvement was attributed to Reiji's eccentric and imaginative mindset, which had been influenced by the anime he had watched in his previous life. Reiji's unconventional approach had played a pivotal role in elevating Hajime's stats and abilities from their initial mediocre state to a level of considerable prowess. Although he still remained relatively weak compared to others. Nevertheless, the progress he had made was what truly mattered, didn't it? Reiji had taken it upon himself to train Hajime in his physical abilities as well, similar to how Seabass had trained him. However, the experience proved to be nothing short of torture for Hajime, pushing him to his limits. Reiji's training regimen encompassed a wide range of activities, seamlessly flowing from one to another. He dedicated himself to practicing mana consumption and replenishment, perfecting his image composition skills, sharpening his quick thinking abilities. Delving into the intricacies of structural analysis, and engaging in rigorous physical training, including sparring sessions utilizing his own handcrafted weapons. Additionally, he eagerly participated in hunting games that mirrored the playful pursuit of a cat chasing a mouse. As for Hajime, the visible signs of exhaustion and the bruises he had obtained from the training sessions prompted Kaori to take on the role of his caretaker. It became evident that Kaori's actions were not merely driven by a sense of duty but also by her desire to forge a closer bond with Hajime. However, her concern for him remained unwavering, permeating every moment they spent together. This interplay of emotions unveiled a valuable insight for Reiji, 
adding another layer to his understanding of the dynamics within their group. Ishtar had initiated his move, manipulating the entire class into aspiring to become heroes. Reiji had caught onto this scheme during the status inspection. He had never expected his shield to remain intact forever, but it was now too late for Ishtar to gain control over him. Tomorrow, Reiji and the rest of the group would venture into the labyrinth, where they would undergo intensive training away from the castle. By the time they returned, Reiji would have become even stronger. At this point, there were only a few classmates who could truly rival him, as his focus had been more on immersing himself in the world of magic rather than simply leveling up his stats. The intricacy of magic intrigued Reiji and prompted him to ponder its limits. Could elements be combined? Could multiple spells be used simultaneously? Were there any other unique elements similar to his darkness element? These questions drove him to venture into the library to delve deeper into the realms of mana and magic. Furthermore, Reiji had made use of the affinity papers distributed by Lisa. These papers revealed that he possessed additional elements, namely thunder, ice and fire. Meanwhile, Tatsuya had returned to the castle, assigned a mission or adventure quest by the guild or king. The details eluded Reiji, and honestly, he didn't care. However, enduring Tatsuya's constant taunting and desire for a rematch had become increasingly bothersome. Such as this very moment. Come on, Reiji, don't run from this. Let's have a rematch, Tatsuya taunted, his voice filled with provocation, as he pursued Reiji who continued to walk ahead. Without turning around, Reiji calmly retorted, Firstly, I'm not running away from you I'm simply walking. Secondly, why should I waste my time on you? I choose my battles wisely, and engaging in a meaningless confrontation with someone like you is not a priority for me. A sly smile formed on Reiji's lips as he continued, however, I do appreciate the favors you've done for me. Oh, and that reminds me, I still have one left. What should I use it for? His words carried a subtle jab, aimed at unsettling Tatsuya's psyche. Tatsuya's frustration was palpable as he clenched his hands, his pride stung by Reiji's words. Seems like winning that match has made you arrogant, huh? I'll give you one more chance, Reiji. Let's have a rematch, and I'll show you why I'm superior to you. I'll knock you down a peg. Reiji calmly chuckled, dismissing Tatsuya's provocation. Arrogant, you say? I wouldn't label it as arrogance, but rather confidence, at least in your books. Remember our last match? Exactly. Besides, I have tasks to attend to today, and unfortunately for you, they don't involve entertaining the likes of you, Tatsuya. Reiji continued his stride, unaffected by Tatsuya's dark expression and tightly clenched fists. Despite feeling the burning intensity of Tatsuya's glare on his back, he remained composed. The air grew heavy with unspoken tension, reflecting the simmering anger of Tatsuya. Breaking the silence, Tatsuya's voice carried a low growl, laced with frustration. Don't think this is the end, Reiji. I will find a way to prove my superiority over you. You won't be able to escape it. Maintaining silence, Reiji pressed forward towards his designated area, undeterred by the lingering tension and the dark expression hovering over Tatsuya's face. It was nighttime, and Reiji walked through the hallways of the castle, carrying a tray of food. Before their venture into the labyrinth, he wanted an update on Hajime's stats and progress. And for those curious about Reiji's own stats, here they are. Recent status. Name Reiji Sukahiro Age, 17 male level, 5. Strength, 230. Vitality, 190. Defense, 180. Agility, 200. Magic, 310. Magic Defense, 170. Skills, Language Comprehension, Physical Resistance, Dark Magic Efficiency, Spear Proficiency, Darkness Affinity, Darkness Manipulation. Increased Mana Recovery, Stealth, Image Composition, Necromancy, Shadow Manipulation, Detect Presence, Detect Magic, Dark Lords Hockey, Mana Manipulation. Magic, Body Augmentation, Shadowed Resonance. As mentioned previously, Reiji didn't prioritize leveling up and increasing his stats. Instead, he focused on enhancing his mastery over the multitude of skills he possessed, aiming to reach a level of familiarity and instinctive usage. However, he understood that this wouldn't happen quickly. 
To Reiji, stats and levels were merely superficial indicators. While they held significance as a measure of power in this world, he firmly believed that three factors would always surpass raw power, mastery, control, and experience. Imagine a scenario where a five-year-old child, who is inexperienced and wields a sword, possesses greater physical strength and stats than an elderly man who boasts extensive experience and mastery of martial arts. It becomes evident that the outcome of their encounter is quite clear, isn't it? Approaching Hajime's door, Reiji kicked it open with ease, still holding a tray in his hands. He walked into the room, causing Hajime to be taken aback. Why did you kick open the door? Hajime asked, a mixture of shock and confusion evident in his voice. It was in the way, Reiji simply replied, nonchalantly placing his tray of food on a nearby table stool before taking a seat. As he began to eat, he observed Hajime and asked, How are you feeling about tomorrow? Sitting on his bed, Hajime interlocked his hands and lowered his head, his nervousness palpable. To be honest, I'm scared. Thanks to you, I've become stronger than ever before, and I appreciate that. However, the prospect of fighting. He let out a sigh, lifting his gaze to meet Reiji's eyes as he continued. You're probably aware of this already, but I've been a victim of bullying for most of my high school years, Hajime confided, his voice carrying a hint of vulnerability. I haven't had many friends, and those I did manage to make eventually distanced themselves from me out of fear of becoming targets too. I've always been an outcast. You, Reiji, were probably the first person in a long time who genuinely helped me improve myself. I've started gaining some confidence, and the weight of my biggest insecurity since coming here has been gradually lifting off my shoulders. Hajime's voice trembled with uncertainty as he asked the question that weighed heavily on his mind, I have just one goal, to return home. But, do you think I'll ever be able to achieve that? After savoring the last sip of his drink, Reiji gently placed the glass on the tabletop and released a contented sigh. He shifted his gaze towards Hajime, his expression calm and thoughtful. To answer your question, no. No, I don't believe you will be able to achieve that as you are now. Feeling a pang of disappointment at Reiji's words, Hajime found himself lost in his own thoughts. As I am right now. He mumbled quietly to himself, contemplating the implications. Nodding, Reiji continued, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. Hajime acknowledged his words with a nod, signaling for him to proceed. You are currently lacking in strength. In fact, you are so weak that even someone like Kaori, who avoids violence, could defeat you in a fight. Despite your improving stats and skill mastery, you still have a lot to learn. Your ultimate goal is a long-term aspiration that could take years to achieve. Instead of solely focusing on that, consider what you can do in the present and near future to increase your strength and knowledge. Embrace the opportunities available to you now. As for feeling afraid of what tomorrow holds, it's natural, but dwelling in fear won't lead you anywhere. Yes, fear is useful. It's designed to protect us from harm and ensure our survival from dangerous situations. However, it is crucial to recognize that fear should not dictate or control our lives. And the only way for you to truly overcome your fear is by confronting it head on. As Reiji's words sank in, Hajime found himself lost in thought until a sudden knock on the door interrupted his musings. Confused, Reiji turned to Hajime and asked, Were you expecting someone? Shaking his head, Hajime denied any knowledge of expecting anyone else to visit. Rising from his bed, he made his way to the door and opened it, revealing the unexpected visitor. Ha! Huh. Hajime muttered in disbelief as he momentarily stiffened upon seeing Kori standing on the other side. She was wearing nothing but a cardigan over her pure white negligee. What incarnation! Startled by his reaction, Hajime unintentionally slipped into an odd accent for a brief moment. Kori looked at him with a blank expression, indicating that she hadn't quite caught what he said. Collecting himself as best he could, Hajime composed his voice and asked Kori what she wanted, all the while attempting to avert his gaze and minimize any lingering stares. Despite his advocacy for 2D characters, Hajime was still a teenage boy, and Kori's appearance proved to be a bit too stimulating for him. Perplexed by Hajime's hesitation, Reiji rose from his seat and made his way to the entrance hall. Are you just going to stand there, or will you let her in, Hajime? He inquired, urging him to take action. 
Snapping out of his momentary daze, Hajime opened the door and welcomed Kori inside, while Reiji returned to his seat. Reiji couldn't help but speculate about the reason for Kori's unexpected visit, although his thoughts were mere conjectures at this point. As they entered the room, he heard the door click shut, signifying that Hajime had closed it behind them. Happily walking to the table near the window, Kori sat down as Hajime brewed some tea. Finishing the tea, he served it to both Kaori and Reiji before sitting in front of her as he quickly began talking. So, what was it you wanted to talk to me about? The dungeon trip tomorrow. Kaori nodded in affirmation, and her smile was replaced by an unbelievably grave expression. It's actually a miracle that Reiji was already with you, Nagumo Kuen. Raising an eyebrow at that, Reiji turned towards them and examined her body language. She seemed nervous, confused, and above all else, scared. It confused Reiji, and he was curious about what she needed to talk about. Continuing, she took a deep breath as she faced the two of them. I want you. Both of you to stay here when we go to the labyrinth tomorrow. I'll convince the instructors and the rest of our classmates, so please, don't go. Kori grew more and more heated as she spoke, and by the end, she was leaning forward into Hajime, pleading with him. Standing from his seat, Reiji walked over to where Kaori and Hajime were sitting. He looked at Kaori with a curious expression and asked, What do you mean by that? And why do you want us to refrain from going to the labyrinth tomorrow? He wanted to understand the reasons behind Kaori's request and the urgency in her voice. Reiji had a feeling that there was more to the situation than met the eye, and he couldn't ignore the sense of concern emanating from Kaori. Nodding in response to his question she answered. I had a premonition. Chapter 16 Orcus Labyrinth 1 The air within what Reiji had dubbed his Batcave was filled with the sound of clothes rustling and equipment jingling. It was the same night before the expedition, and Reiji found himself immersed in the task of packing his gear and selecting his clothing for the upcoming trip. As he meticulously prepared for the journey, his mind involuntarily wandered back to the events of what happened earlier. Flashback I had a premonition. A premonition? Hajime murmured, his confusion mirroring Reiji's. The idea that Kaori had come here solely based on a bad feeling initially seemed dismissible, but in this world of magic, where the impossible became possible, Reiji couldn't afford to be ignorant. Besides, he himself had been experiencing unsettling vibes without understanding their origin. Acknowledging Hajime's mutter with a nod, Kaori continued in a soft, hesitant voice, stumbling over her words. Um, you see. I just have this really bad feeling. I was sleeping just a moment ago, and. I had this dream. You were in it, Nagumo Kuen. But you wouldn't respond when I called your name. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't reach you. And then, at the end. Kori faltered, her voice trembling, reluctant to reveal what happened next. But Hajime, ever calm, urged her to continue. And then, what happened at the end? He asked gently. Biting her lip, Kaori looked up at Hajime, tears glistening in her eyes. You vanished, she whispered, her voice filled with fear and uncertainty. I see. Silence filled the room. Hajime stared at Kaori, who was hanging her head again. That certainly sounded like a sinister dream. But in the end, it was still just a nightmare. Hajime doubted he could get permission to stay behind for a flimsy reason like that, and even if he could, his classmates would have all condemned him for it. Regardless of how it turned out, he would have had nowhere left to go if he asked. Which was why, sadly, Hajime had no choice but to go. It was just a dream, Shirasaki-san, Hajime said, his voice filled with warmth. We'll have Captain Melt's veteran knights with us, and there are plenty of ridiculously strong people like Amanagawa Kuen. Actually, more than a ton, considering how broken the skills of our classmates are. Our enemies might even end up feeling a little pitiful. Hajime's words, meant to bring comfort, seemed to have the opposite effect on Kaori. Her worry deepened, and the weight of uncertainty settled upon her. And. And if you're still worried, Hajime continued, his gaze meeting Kaori's. He hesitated for a moment, feeling a hint of embarrassment before softly uttering his suggestion, why don't you protect me? Both Kaori and Reiji reacted with surprise, 
uttering the same exclamation, eh? Reiji's mind snapped back to the present, momentarily setting aside his thoughts. While he acknowledged the gravity of Kori's dream, he reminded himself that dreams didn't necessarily equate to visions or reality. However, he made a mental note to keep a watchful eye on the situation. I'll keep an eye on him, Kori. Just focus on yourself during this expedition. Hajime can't be a protected princess otherwise, his training will go to waste, and it will be all for naught, Reiji suggested. Agreeing with his suggestion, they chatted for a while longer, and then Kaori and Reiji returned to their respective rooms. Flashback end. With his packing completed, Reiji set his belongings aside and prepared for sleep. However, before retiring for the night, he took a moment to jot something down in his notebook. Satisfied, he finally allowed himself to drift into slumber. The following morning, everyone gathered at the plaza, which served as the entrance to the great Orcus Labyrinth, long before the break of dawn. Trepidation and curiosity filled the air, mingling within the hearts of the students. Reiji, on the other hand, maintained a stoic expression as he surveyed the labyrinth's entrance. What met his gaze was more reminiscent of a museum entrance than a foreboding labyrinth. It featured its own receptionist counter, where a girl in uniform diligently checked the individuals entering and exiting with a warm smile. It seemed that everyone's status plate was being verified at the entrance, a measure put in place to accurately account for potential casualties. With the imminent threat of war looming overhead, the government sought to minimize its losses by implementing such a policy. The plaza surrounding the entrance buzzed with activity, adorned with numerous stalls where merchants competed to showcase their wares. The atmosphere resembled that of a festive occasion. Merchants were particularly drawn to the shallower labyrinths with fewer floors, as they naturally attracted crowds. The people present ranged from boastful adventurers who spoke grandly but met swift ends within the labyrinth, to criminals who operated in the shadows of back alleys and unsavory corners. To prevent excessive resource allocation toward handling these issues, the government established a collaboration with the local adventurers' guild to maintain security in the area. Merchants continued to sell their goods right up to the receptionist's desk at the entrance, which, in a way, made life easier for the adventurers embarking on their perilous journeys into the labyrinth's depths. Soon, in a single file, the students followed Captain Meld. Once inside, the lively atmosphere that had surrounded them mere moments ago vanished. In front of them was a passage that was a little over five meters wide. Though there was no obvious light source, the entire labyrinth was dimly lit, enough that one could vaguely make out their surroundings without the help of a torch or magical item. In truth, the passages were all lit by a special mineral called green glowstone that was buried in the walls. The entire Great Orcus Labyrinth was actually an excavated vein of green glowstone ore. The party all filed into ranks and slowly advanced through the labyrinth. After a few uneventful minutes, the passage they were walking down opened up into a wide plaza. Towering seven or eight meters above them was a dome-shaped ceiling. The students were all looking around curiously when suddenly a number of grey creatures resembling furballs burst out from cracks in the wall. Chapter 17 Towering seven or eight meters above them was a dome-shaped ceiling. The students were all looking around curiously when suddenly a number of grey creatures resembling furballs burst out from cracks in the wall. All right, Cookie, your team's up front. Everyone else fall back. I'll have you switch in after some time, so stay sharp. These monsters are called rat men. They're quick on their feet, but not all that strong. Keep your cool as you fight. As Captain Meld had said, the rat men were quite fast and rushed at them with alarming agility. Pairs of dark red eyes gleamed with a ghastly light from within the balls of fur. Their name was rather fitting, as they looked like giant, muscular rats. That stood on two feet. Only the area around their corded chests and impressive eight packs was bereft of fur, almost as if they were trying to show them off. As Cookie's group leaped into action, Reiji approached Hajime and inquired, How are you holding up? Hajime turned his gaze towards Reiji, briefly glancing at the ongoing battle before replying, I'm okay. Nervous, but okay. Although, I can't deny that Kori's words from the other night are adding to my anxiety. Nodding in agreement, they continued to observe the battle unfold. With synchronized precision, they cast a spell, 
summoning a massive whirlwind of flames that engulfed the rat men, reducing them to charred remains. The rat men screeched in agony, their frantic movements futile against the relentless onslaught of fire. In a matter of moments, every last rat man had been eradicated, reduced to nothing more than ash. The other students didn't even get a chance to fight. It looked like monsters on the first floor were far too weak to even put up a fight against Cookie's party. Wow, well done. All right, the rest of you will be up next, so don't relax just yet. Captain Meld reminded the class not to let their guard down, though he was smiling, impressed at their prowess. Still, he couldn't prevent the students from getting pumped up about their first dungeon monster elimination expedition. He shrugged his shoulders helplessly as he saw the students breaking out into smiles. Oh, and. While you don't have to worry about it this time since it's training, in the future try and kill your enemies in a way that preserves their mana crystals. What you did back there was overkill. Captain Melt's words caused Kaori and the others to blush, realizing that they may have been too excessive in their use of force. From that point on, the class proceeded through the labyrinth's floors smoothly, taking turns in the vanguard during battles. Eventually, they reached the 20th floor, a significant milestone that separated skilled adventurers from mere amateurs. Up until now, the deepest floor ever reached by adventurers was the 65th floor, a legendary achievement that had not been replicated in recent times. Therefore, anyone who managed to surpass the first 20 floors was considered highly skilled, while those who made it past the first 40 were regarded as superhuman. Reiji, in a strategic move, weakened a monster before directing it toward Hajime. He delivered a warning with a touch of humor, if you don't kill it, it will kill you. And if you die, I'll bring you back from hell and train you even harder until you die once more. So, you better not die. Yeah, I'd rather not, Hajime responded wryly, crouching down and touching the floor with his hands. Fixing his gaze, he carefully observed the approaching monster. As it closed in on his desired distance, he swiftly executed his ability pushing more mana in. Transmute. Hajime exclaimed, and the ground trembled as rocks and minerals jumbled around, disrupting the monster's footing. The surface below sunk in, creating a trap for the creature. Seizing the opportunity, Hajime swiftly approached the monster and drove his spear into its head, delivering a fatal blow. He then leaned down, catching his breath while clutching his knees. Handing him a mana pill, Reiji observed Hajime's handiwork. Not bad, though there is room for improvement. You were fortunate that the monster lacked a brain otherwise, it wouldn't have fallen for such a trick. As we descend to the lower levels, you'll need to become more versatile. Remember, you are a synergist, a creator, a blacksmith of sorts. Utilize your skills to the fullest, and you will be fine. Are you okay, Nagumo kun Kori asked, approaching them, with Shizuku who stood by her side. Nodding in response, Hajime took a moment to catch his breath, while Kori smiled and gazed at him. However, her intense stare gave Reiji an eerie feeling. It reminded him of a Yandra, making him ponder how things had come to this. While Reiji observed the interaction between them, he felt a malevolent gaze fixed upon their group. Turning to locate the source, he found nothing out of the ordinary. Everyone around them seemed to be resting and preparing for the continuation of their journey. Keeping a vigilant eye on the situation, Reiji followed the class as they descended to the twentieth floor of the labyrinth. Each floor of the labyrinth spanned several kilometers in every direction, and it usually took a team of dozens up to a month to fully explore and map out a new floor. Fortunately, the floors up to the forty-seventh had already been mapped, so they were not at risk of getting lost. The twentieth floor presented a unique challenge. Its deepest room resembled a limestone cave made entirely of ice, adorned with icicles protruding from the walls. The intricate topography created a complex environment for the students to navigate. Just beyond this icy chamber lay the staircase leading to the 21st floor. Once they reached that point, their training for the day would be complete. Unfortunately, teleportation magic was a thing of the past, so they would have to walk back to the entrance. The students had already started to relax when they encountered an unexpected obstacle. A protrusion in the wall disrupted their formation, forcing them to proceed in a single file. As the two leaders, Cookie and Captain Meld, came to a halt, the rest of the students readied themselves for battle and surveyed their surroundings. 
it became apparent that they had stumbled upon a monster. It's camouflaging itself. Stay vigilant and watch your surroundings. Captain Melt's voice echoed through the cavern as a warning to everyone. In an instant, the entity that appeared to be a wall suddenly changed color and sprang into motion. The creature, initially mistaken for a protrusion, revealed itself as a dark brown gorilla standing on two legs. It pounded its chest, showcasing its strength. This monster was a rock mount, capable of camouflaging itself like a chameleon. Be wary of its powerful arms. They can deliver a devastating blow. Captain Melt's authoritative voice resonated throughout the chamber as Cookie's party prepared to engage the enemy. Ryuteru skillfully parried the rock mount's massive arms with his fists. Meanwhile, Cookie and Shizuku maneuvered to flank the creature but struggled due to the rough terrain. Despite being unable to fully surround the rock mount, they effectively created a human wall with Ryuteru blocking its path. Realizing its inability to breach their defenses, the rock mount retreated and took a deep breath. Gra. In the following seconds, a ferocious roar shook the entire room, instilling fear and freezing the students in place. This was the rock mount's formidable ability, the intimidating roar, a mana-infused roar capable of temporarily paralyzing its victims. Cookie and the others caught off guard, found themselves immobilized, anticipating an imminent attack. However, the rock mount seized the opportunity to sidestep past them, grabbing a nearby boulder and hurling it at Cory's group. The trajectory of the thrown boulder was astonishing, sailing smoothly over the heads of the motionless front line and hurtling straight toward its intended target. The members of Cory's group raised their staves, ready to intercept, realizing there was no room for evasion. Yet, midway through their incantations, they were struck by a sight that left them paralyzed with shock. The boulder launched by the rock mount transformed into a second rock mount mid-air, arms outstretched, hurtling directly toward Cory. It even had bloodshot eyes and heavy breathing down pat. Cory, Eri, and Suzu all screamed in terror, completely forgetting to maintain their chance. Oi, what do you think you're doing in the middle of a fight? Captain Meld swiftly intercepted the diving rock mount, swiftly striking it down before it could reach the girls. Apologies quickly escaped their lips, but the lingering fear was evident on their pale faces. Witnessing the girl's distress, a certain individual among them completely snapped. Amanagawa Cookie, the class's self-proclaimed hero of justice. Bastard. How dare you hurt Kaori and the others. I won't forgive you. Mistakenly assuming their pallor stemmed from their close encounter with death rather than the repulsive appearance of the rock mount, Cookie's body emitted a radiant white mana. His holy sword began to glow in response. Soar unto heaven, O divine wing celestial flash. No, stop, you idiot. Ignoring Captain Melt's pleas, Cookie raised his sword high and swung it down with all his might. As he completed his incantation, his holy sword unleashed a dazzling blade of light. Evading its path was futile. The radiant arc sliced through the rock mount with minimal resistance, cleanly severing it in two before crashing into the wall. A deafening rumble filled the air, followed by cascading debris from the damaged wall. Cookie exhaled a deep sigh and turned to the girls, wearing a triumphant smile. He believed he had vanquished the formidable monster on their behalf. Just as he was about to utter the comforting words it's okay now. Captain Meld, his forehead veins bulging with anger, approached him and delivered a punch. Habwa. You damn fool. I understand your anger, but you can't employ such skills in a narrow passage. You could have brought the entire cave down upon us. Cookie's complaints died in his throat as Captain Meld reprimanded him, and he awkwardly offered his apology. The girls responded with wry smiles, attempting to comfort him. Then, Cory's gaze fixed upon the crumbled section of the wall. What is that? It's all sparkly. Her words drew everyone's attention in that direction. Protruding from the wall like a blossoming flower was a peculiar mineral emitting a pale blue glow. It resembled a crystal with an indigo light at its core. Entranced by its beauty, all the girls, including Kaori, found themselves captivated. Oh, that's a glans crystal. Quite a sizable one, too. How rare, Captain Meld remarked. 
Glan's crystals were highly sought after due to their exquisite radiance, often adorning noble ladies and serving as gifts in the form of rings, earrings, pendants, and other jewelry. They were particularly popular for proposals. Cory blushed at Captain Melt's explanation and stole a quick glance at Hajime. Though her actions went nearly unnoticed, Reiji, Shizuku, and another observant individual took note. In that case, I'll go grab it for you, Kaori. Hayama suddenly rushed forward, determined to seize the opportunity. Climbing the debris of the collapsed wall with agility, he swiftly approached the gland's crystal. Captain Meld hastily attempted to stop him. Hey! Don't go running off on your own. We can't be sure it's safe yet. However, Hayama ignored the warning and stood before the crystal in no time. Captain Meld sprinted after Hayama, desperately trying to halt his reckless actions. Simultaneously, one of the knights swiftly retrieved his fair scope and scanned the surroundings of the crystal. A moment later, his complexion turned ashen. Captain. It's a trap. What? Stop. Despite their urgent warnings, both Captain Meld and the knight were a fraction too late. The moment Hayama's hand made contact with the crystal, a luminous magic circle materialized at its core. Panic seized the air as Captain Meld shouted, Crap, retreat. Everyone get out, now. With hearts pounding and adrenaline coursing through their veins, they scrambled desperately towards the exit. But fate had other plans. The magic circle pulsed with blinding brilliance, its radiance expanding at an alarming rate, until it engulfed the entire room in an all-encompassing glow. In that fleeting moment, a sensation of weightlessness washed over everyone present. And then, everybody vanished. Chapter 18 Reiji and the others could feel the atmosphere shift. A moment later, the class fell to the ground with a thud. Landing on his feet next to Hajime, Reiji surveyed the new area in weariness. Hajime groaned in pain as he felt his aching butt, then looked around. Most of his other classmates were still on the ground, but Captain Meld and his knights, along with Cookie and Reiji and the other vanguard fighters, were already on their feet, examining their surroundings. The magic circle from earlier must have contained a teleportation spell. Magic from the Age of the Gods was remarkable because it could easily do things that no modern-day mage could. Hajime and the others had been teleported onto a massive stone bridge. It was around 100 meters in length. The ceiling also towered a full 20 meters above them. Below the bridge was not a river, but instead a dark abyss with no visible end. The gaping chasm resembled the very pits of hell. Though the bridge was 10 meters wide, it had no railing at all, so if someone slipped, there would be nothing to catch their fall. Hajime and the others had been sent to the middle of the bridge. One side of the bridge was a passage heading further in, while stairs leading upward were at the other end. After confirming the situation, Captain Meld curtly barked out orders. Everyone, get up and head for the stairs. Now. His voice boomed louder than thunder, and the students hurried to follow his orders. However, the labyrinth's traps were not so easy to escape. They would not be allowed to retreat so easily. New magic circles suddenly appeared on either side of the bridge, accompanied by a swirling torrent of dark red mana. The magic circle on the passage side of the bridge was ten meters wide. The ones on the side of the stairs were only one meter each, but there were many. The dark red magic circles resembled pools of blood and gave off an ominous feel. They pulsed once, and waves of monsters began pouring forth. From the countless magic circles near the stairs came a horde of skeletons wielding swords, Tron soldiers. Their empty eye sockets gleamed with the same blood-red light as the circles they came from, and they rolled around like real eyes too. Within seconds, the stairs were teeming with nearly a hundred of the creatures, and more were still pouring out. Despite their numbers, Reiji thought what was coming out on the passage side of the bridge was far more of a threat. From within the ten-meter-wide magic circle emerged a monster as big as the circle that summoned it. It stood on four legs and had some kind of helmet on its head. To Reiji, the closest thing it resembled was a triceratops. However, unlike a triceratops, its eyes glowed bright red, and as it clacked its wicked sharp claws and fangs together, flames sprouted from the horn on its helmeted forehead. Everyone stared at it in slack-jawed horror, 
and Captain Melt's terrified whisper resounded surprisingly clearly throughout the room. Oh my god! It's a behemoth! A wave of unease washed over the students when they saw Captain Melt, the reliable captain who'd always been their reassuring pillar of support, break out in a cold sweat. Cookie realized he was up against a truly fearsome opponent and turned to ask Captain Meld about its properties. However, the behemoth, a monster that had even the kingdom's strongest knight quaking in his boots, refused to grant Cookie the luxury of time. It sucked in a huge breath, then let out a guttural roar, signaling the start of the battle. Gra! Ha! The roar brought Captain Meld back to his senses, and he quickly began barking orders. Alan, take the kids and break through the line of Trom soldiers. Kyle, Ivan, and Bale create a barrier. We have to stop that thing, no matter what. Cookie, head to the stairs with the rest of the students. Please wait, Meld San. We'll help too. That dinosaur thing is really bad news. We'll also. Idiot. If that thing really is a behemoth, you kids don't stand a chance. It's a monster that shows up on the 65th floor. Even the legendary adventurer, who everyone called the strongest in the world, couldn't stand against it. Now get out of here. I definitely won't let you kids die. Cookie faltered momentarily at the intensity in Captain Meld's gaze, but he refused to leave Captain Meld opened his mouth to yell at Cookie, but before he could say anything, the behemoth roared again and charged. Straight toward the retreating students. In order to protect their summoned heroes, Hylia's strongest warriors chanted together in an attempt to form a barrier. Grant thine protection to your beloved children, O God. Reject all malice and let this be a holy ground that denies thine enemy's passage. Hallowed ground. The spell was four verses long, inscribed on a magic circle two meters long, and drawn on the highest class magical paper. On top of that, it had been invoked by three people in tandem. Though it had only one use and lasted for only one minute, it created an impenetrable barrier that could not be broken. A glowing dome of light materialized, stopping the behemoth in its tracks. A huge shockwave spread out as it crashed into the barrier, pulverizing the ground near the impact. Despite being made of stone, the entire bridge shook precariously. The retreating students screamed, and some of them fell down. Trom soldiers were powerful monsters that appeared on the 38th floor and deeper. They were far stronger than anything the students had faced so far. As a horde of ghastly skeletons blocked their path ahead, and a lumbering beast threatened from behind, panic gripped the students. Amidst the chaos, Reiji observed the situation with an impassive expression, carefully assessing the unfolding events. The class is in disarray, the formation has crumbled, and the knights are unavailable for assistance, he noted internally. His gaze then settled on Cookie, who, instead of leading his class, stayed behind to help Captain Meld despite his orders to retreat. Looking at the situation at hand, Reiji knew he would have to step in, at least until someone else could. Observing Hajime, he noticed that the boy wasn't as scared as he had anticipated. In fact, Hajime appeared to be more observant and had gained some sort of revelation. Hajime, Reiji addressed, I'll stay here and rally our classmates. I need you to find Cookie and bring him back here. While I may be strong, I can't handle this alone. If we want to survive, Cookie needs to lead us out of here. Nodding, Hajime sprinted off towards Cookie, while Reiji brandished his spear and charged into the chaos. Of course, he didn't mean a single word he said. Hajime was unaware of Reiji's true capabilities, and though hiding his abilities was becoming burdensome, he wouldn't have to do so much longer. Reiji's stats were almost on par with Captain Melt's, and he would only grow stronger within the labyrinth. Amidst the panic, someone shoved one of the female students from behind, and she fell forward. She groaned in pain and looked up, only to see a Trom soldier brandishing its sword right in front of her. Ah! Simultaneously, she let out a gasp as the soldier swung its sword down towards her head. However, the anticipated pain never arrived, and instead, she heard the sound of metal colliding. Calm down, you're safe, Reiji reassured her as he struck his spear in an uppercut motion, shattering the skeleton's defense and piercing through its skull. Grabbing her hand Reiji pulled her up to her feet. She silently let herself be pulled up, still in shock, 
and Reiji gave her a small smile. Hello, are you there? If so, then get back into formation if you don't want to die. Nodding with a flushed face, she quickly ran off to rejoin the group. As she made her way back, a horde of skeletons closed in on Reiji, their swords, and shields raised menacingly. Without uttering a word, Reiji tightly gripped his spear and launched his assault. Seven skeletons were surrounding him, and though they were stronger than any foe they had encountered thus far, they were still significantly weaker compared to the hero's abilities. Their strength stemmed mainly from their overwhelming numbers and relentless summoning. Approaching the first skeleton without hesitation, Reiji skillfully twirled his spear in a circular motion before thrusting it forward, piercing the creature's skull. With impeccable reflexes, he swiftly evaded an incoming attack from another skeleton. His footwork was refined, his movements fluid, as he continued his relentless onslaught. Utilizing his spear as a catapult, he leaped into the air, simultaneously casting a spell. Fireball, Reiji muttered, conjuring a blazing sphere of flames in his hand. With precision, he launched the fiery projectile toward the group of skeletons. They watched helplessly as the sphere descended upon them, its radiant light blinding them momentarily, while its engulfing flames reduced them to mere ash. As Reiji landed on the ground he heard a massive shockwave from the behemoth's locations. He quickly positioned his gaze over there and saw Hajime instantly transmuting the ground to make a stone wall, but the shockwave shattered it with ease, sending everyone flying. His wall had managed to lessen the force a little. But then the behemoth let out a huge roar and the dust cleared, only to reveal Captain Meld and the other three knights lying on the ground, moaning in pain. The shockwave had robbed them of their ability to move. Cookie and the others had fallen to the ground, but they swiftly regained their footing. Positioned behind Hajime's protective wall and shielded by the knights, they had managed to avoid sustaining significant damage. Reiji observed as Cookie's group rose from the ground, their resilience and determination truly remarkable. However, he couldn't help but find their decision to stay and confront an enemy that even Captain Meld couldn't overcome as foolish. There's no reason to intervene yet. Not yet. Reiji thought to himself warily. He had been feeling that same gaze from earlier, and the unsettling feeling he had experienced in the library returned with full force. Amidst the chaos, he couldn't identify the source of that gaze, and the presence of a powerful monster threatening to single-handedly overpower the group only heightened his unease. Ga. Ryutaru, Shizuku, can you buy us some time? Cookie asked. It looked like they were in pain, but they still stepped forward. Since the knights had been defeated, they had to do something about the behemoth themselves. Not like we've got a damn choice. We'll manage somehow. The two of them charged the behemoth after uttering those responses. As they were distracting the behemoth, Kori was healing the knights, and Captain Meld and Hajime were right beside her, creating a large border wall to keep attacks from hitting them. Meanwhile, Cookie began chanting the strongest spell he knew. O oh Holy Spirit! Bring ruin to all that is evil with thine divine light. By the breath of God, may these clouds of darkness be swept clear, and the world bathed in sanctity. By the mercy of God, may this strike redeem the sins of man. Divine Wrath Auroras of light poured out from the Holy Sword. The skill Cookie had used was of the same category as the celestial flash he'd unleashed earlier, but this one was far more powerful. The bridge creaked ominously as the rays of light gouged furrows through the stone while racing toward the behemoth. Ryuteru and Shizuku retreated the moment Cookie finished chanting. They were in bad shape and wouldn't have lasted much longer. Though it had been a scant few seconds, they'd suffered quite a bit of damage in fending off the behemoth. The bombardment of light crashed into the behemoth with a thunderous roar. It was covered in a coat of white as the light enveloped it. Cracks began appearing in the bridge. That should have been enough. Ha. 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 Yeah, that had to have killed it, right? I'd like to think so, but... Ryuteru and Shizuku fell back to where Cookie was standing. He was panting hard after casting such a powerful spell. That last attack had been Cookie's ace in the hole. It had used up almost all of his remaining mana. Captain Meld stood up behind him, his wounds healed. Gradually the light began to fade and the dust surrounding the behemoth cleared. 
And the behemoth. Didn't even have a scratch on it. It let out a low growl, and the dark red mana that was unique to monsters began pouring out of its body. The murderous glare it aimed at Cookie was so intense that Cookie felt he might die just looking at it. Then it raised its head high, and its horn began letting out a high-pitched buzz as it glowed red hot. The red spread to the rest of its helmet until it seemed like its entire head was a glowing ball of magma. Don't just stand there. Run. Captain Meld's shout brought Cookie and the others back to their senses. Finally, over the shock that Cookie hadn't managed to even scratch it, they prepared to run. But it was at that moment the behemoth chose to charge. Before it reached Cookie, it leaped into the air and hurtled toward them, head down, like a burning meteor. They were able to leap to the side to avoid a direct hit, but the shockwaves from the impact bowled Cookie and the others over. They rolled across the ground like toppled pins and were covered in wounds from head to toe when they finally stopped. Captain Meld was still somehow able to move and he ran over to the others. The rest of the knights were still being healed by Cory. The behemoth braced its legs and tried to pull its head out of the hole it had smashed into the bridge. Can you guys still move? The only responses Captain Meld got were groans. Their bodies had been paralyzed by the shockwaves, just like Captain Meld's team had been a while ago. Their internal organs had taken quite a pounding too. Captain Meld turned around to call Cory over. But the words died in his throat when he saw Reiji approaching him instead. Kid. Get Cory to help you carry Cookie out of here. Meld decided to ask Reiji instead. Scratching the back of his head, Reiji responded, Come on, Captain, take it easy. Yelling your lungs out won't solve anything or make the situation any better, now will it? Gritting his teeth, Meld glared at Reiji, infuriated by his nonchalant response. He was in no mood to be trifled with, especially not in this critical situation. Just as he was about to reprimand Reiji, Hajime emerged with a determined expression, offering a plan. However, it was an insane, reckless plan with chances of success that were beyond slim. And to top it off, Hajime himself would have to play the most dangerous role. Captain Meld hesitated for a few precious seconds, which was enough time for the behemoth to get its head unstuck. Its helmet began glowing bright red once more. Meld was out of time. Are you sure you can do it, kid? I am. Meld laughed and broke out into a grin when he saw the resolve in Hajime's gaze. Never thought I'd trust my life to you of all people. I promise I won't leave you behind. So. Don't let me down, kid. Yes sir. Captain Meld finished talking and walked up to the behemoth. He unleashed a weak spell at it, provoking its ire. It appeared that the behemoth tended to focus on whatever was attacking it, which was why it had aimed for Cookie earlier. The spell did the trick, and the behemoth's gaze locked onto Captain Meld. As Captain Meld confronted the behemoth, Hajime turned towards Reiji, his gaze filled with determination. Reiji, I require your assistance in this. I cannot face it alone, and... I want my friend and mentor by my side. I have witnessed your strength, maybe not your true strength but I know more than the others since I was the closest to you. I don't know why you helped, not why you held back. Although I do not understand these things, it is not my place to question them. But at this moment, I need you, he emphasized, his eyes burning with resolve. I need the person I trust to help me. Chapter 19 I need the person I trust to help me. Reiji locked eyes with Hajime, carefully observing his body language. The unwavering determination in the boy's words resonated as truth. Reiji pondered the reasons behind Hajime's desire to play the hero. Was it driven by innate kindness? Or was it fueled by the need to prove himself to those who belittled him? At that moment, Reiji didn't have the answers, nor did he find them relevant. The menacing gaze that bore down on them still lingered, and despite the risks involved in Hajime's plan, Reiji had unwavering confidence in his ability to thwart whatever scheme that person had in store. Emerging from his contemplation, Reiji rested his spear over his shoulders and responded, I suppose I can't really deny your request after you've said all that, can I? If I were to let down my disciple, I'd be nothing more than a piss-poor mentor, wouldn't I? Be swept away, wind wall. Meld exclaimed, eliciting Reiji and Hajime to turn towards the ongoing battle. 
Meld quickly jumped back after he chanted that spell. The behemoth smashed into the ground, pulverizing the spot Captain Meld had been standing on not even a second before. The shockwave and rubble were blown away by the wind wall, keeping Meld unharmed. With how imprecise the behemoth's attacks were, even a weak spell was enough to help avoid indirect damage. But if Meld had been forced to defend Cookie and the others he would have been utterly crushed. All right then, let's get to work, Reiji instructed as he and Hajime jumped onto the behemoth. The residual heat burned their skin as they landed. However, they ignored the pain as Hajime gathered his sky blue mana, and chanted. He said no more than the name of the spell. It was, after all, the simplest, most basic magic. Transmute. The behemoth, which had been struggling to unstick its head from the ground, suddenly stopped moving. Because every time it tried to dislodge itself even a little, Hajime reformed the stone around it, keeping its head buried. It braced its legs, attempting to use the weight of its whole body to rip its head free, only to find that the ground around its legs had been transmuted as well. The behemoth's legs had sunk a full meter into the ground. And to make completely sure it wouldn't be able to break free, Hajime hardened the stone around them as well. Assisting Hajime, Reiji positioned himself atop the behemoth's head and placed his hands on its massive form. With a resolute focus, he channeled mana through his body, fixating on the looming shadow cast by the behemoth. His thoughts coalesced into action as he invoked the spell, Shadowbind. Mana surged forth, manifesting as ethereal chains that shot out from the behemoth's shadow. Swiftly and deftly, the spectral chains wove and entangled around the target's limbs, momentarily immobilizing it. Bracing its legs, the behemoth exerted immense force, attempting to break free from the binds Reiji had imposed. However, its efforts were thwarted as it discovered that the ground surrounding its legs had undergone transmutation. The behemoth's legs had sunk a full meter into the hardened earth. To ensure its complete immobilization, Hajime fortified the stone, encasing the creature's legs, while Reiji infused his spell with additional mana, bolstering the durability of the ethereal chains. Despite their combined efforts, the behemoth's strength remained formidable. They understood that even the slightest lapse in concentration would provide an opportunity for the creature to break free. The behemoth persisted, causing cracks to continuously form in its stony and shadowy prison. However, Hajime relentlessly transmuted the ground, swiftly repairing the fractures, while Reiji tirelessly poured more mana into the spell. As a result, the behemoth remained trapped, unable to free its head from the unyielding confinement. In the meantime, Captain Meld gathered the recovered knights and Kaori together, and they began carrying Cookie and the others to safety. It seemed that some of the students had finally regained their composure, as they were working in tandem to push the Trom soldiers back. The one that had rallied them was actually the female student Hajime had saved earlier. Despite his weakness, he still contributed greatly. Wait. Nagumo Kuen's still over there. Kori started arguing with Meld, who was trying to get everyone to retreat. This is all a part of the kid's plan. We're going to break through the soldiers and set up a defensive line so the mages can bombard it with spells. Of course, that comes after they're out of our line of fire. Then they're going to run back to us while we keep the behemoth busy with a barrage of spells and we're all retreating together. Then I'll stay behind with him. No, you can't. Once we've made it to safety, you have to heal Cookie, Kaori. But Kaori's angry protests were cut short by Melt's next words. What you're doing is nothing more than spitting on his resolve. Reiji is there with him, he'll be fine. Ah. After Captain Meld, the strongest member of their party, it was without a doubt Cookie who possessed formidable power. They would need every ounce of firepower they could muster to hold the behemoth at bay with just magic. Cookie's condition would determine the thin line between life and death for Hajime and Reiji, making it imperative for Kaori to focus on healing him continuously as they retreated. The behemoth loomed, threatening to break free the moment their mana reserves depleted, and their ability to restrain the colossal creature ceased. O oh breath of life, grant succor to this injured soul, heaven's blessing. Kori began chanting, with tears welling in her eyes. Her artifact, a white staff, emitted a faint glow, enveloping Cookie in a gentle, comforting light. Captain Meld, understanding the crucial role Kori played, firmly grasped her shoulders, offering an encouraging nod. 
Kori reciprocated the gesture before turning her gaze towards Hajime, who was still desperately transmuting the ground. With determination etched on her face, she began retreating from the bridge alongside Captain Meld and the knights, who carried Ryuturu, Shizuku, and Kuki with them. The Trom soldiers were still increasing in number. There were more than two hundred of them crowding the landing by that point. There were so many that a chunk of them had spilled over onto the bridge itself. However, that was actually a blessing in disguise. Had they spread themselves out properly, they would have easily been able to surround and then subsequently slaughter the students who charged through the ranks. After all, a good number of the students had done just that when the initial hundred had appeared. The only reason no one had died yet was because of the knights. It was only because of their excellent skills that were able to cover for the students' inexperience. However, because of how much it had taxed them to keep all the students safe, they were all covered in wounds. And so, with the night support flagging and the army of monsters only increasing, the students were slowly falling into a panic once more. They forgot all about using magic and swung their weapons blindly. In a few more minutes they would have surely been annihilated. Everyone was on the verge of giving up, when suddenly. Celestial Flash A blade of pure light tore through the center of the Trom soldiers, obliterating the enemies in its path. The ones that weren't instantly destroyed were blown away by the force of the spell and tumbled to their deaths in the depths below. A new wave of Trom soldiers rose to take their place, but for an instant, the students caught a glimpse of the stairs that led to their salvation. The hope that they had been unable to see even for a second no matter how hard they had fought. Everyone. Don't give up. I'll carve open a path for us. Cookie accompanied his shouts with a second celestial flash, mowing down yet another group of Tron soldiers. His overwhelming charisma bolstered the students' flagging morale. You morons! Did all your training just fly out the window? What the hell has gotten into you? Get back in formation this instant! The ever-reliable Captain Meld unleashed an attack that was arguably even more powerful than Cookie's celestial flash, annihilating another line of Tron soldiers. The students' depression was blown away as their pillar of support returned to assist them. As they pressed onward, cutting through the horde of skeletons to carve a path toward the stairs, beads of sweat trickled down the brows of Hajime and Reiji. Their bodies were taxed, and their reserves of mana pills had been completely depleted. With only one remaining, Reiji turned to Hajime and nonchalantly popped it into his mouth, earning a bewildered stare from his companion. That was supposed to be your mana pill, Reiji. What are your reserves at this moment? Hajime inquired, concern lacing his voice. Reiji's focus remained steadfast on the task at hand as he replied, Take it. Right now, you need it more than I do. Despite his words, Reiji couldn't ignore the alarming rate at which his mana reserves were diminishing. He quickly glanced back at the bridge to ensure that everyone had safely retreated. They had regrouped and were now poised to unleash their spells. It seems we'll be escaping this death trap soon, Reiji pondered aloud to himself. He turned to face Hajime, projecting his voice loud enough for his companion to hear. Prepare yourself to run. Just like we practiced, except this time your life is truly on the line. The behemoth continued to struggle against its restraints, but Hajime knew they wouldn't hold for much longer. They were running out of time. He needed to put as much distance as possible between himself and the monster when the restraints gave way. His heart pounded in his chest, and he couldn't help but tremble with nerves. Take a deep breath, Hajime. I know you're nervous, we both are, but try to calm yourself. We need to stay composed until we're out of danger, Reiji instructed, empathizing with his companion's anxiety. Their escape hinged on perfect timing. As the cracks appeared once again, Hajime swiftly transmuted the ground, while Reiji reinforced the behemoth's restraints as a precaution. And then, with a leap of faith, they launched themselves away from the looming threat. A scant five seconds after Hajime had started running for his life, the ground behind him shattered, and the behemoth roared menacingly as it freed itself from its restraints. Hajime risked a glance back and saw the pure rage in its eyes. It looked around wildly, searching for the one who had forced it into such an unsightly struggle, and quickly found Hajime. It roared again, angrily, bringing its head down and prepared to charge Hajime. However, before it could move, a barrage of spells slammed into it. 
It was like a bizarre meteor shower, where each meteor was a different color. The various spells didn't do any damage to the behemoth, but they definitely slowed it down. Keep your focus ahead. Reiji urged Hajime. Looking back will only slow you down. Hajime nodded, his gaze fixed straight ahead as he sprinted forward. He could hear the spells whizzing dangerously close, but he wasn't afraid. He had complete faith in the extraordinary abilities of his classmates. In a matter of seconds, he had already put a distance of over 30 meters between himself and the rampaging behemoth. He unconsciously broke out into a smile. An instant later, however, that smile froze in place. Among the multitude of spells flying at the behemoth, one of them had a slightly lower trajectory. And it was heading straight for Hajime. Someone had clearly aimed their attack right at him. However, just as Hajime was about to come to a stop, a figure suddenly appeared before him, intercepting the incoming spell and causing it to explode on the bridge. Startled, Hajime quickly turned to see Reiji, who had grabbed hold of him and swiftly threw him towards the group with a powerful spin. As Hajime was propelled through the air, Reiji regained his balance and glanced back, only to see the behemoth growing tired of the relentless barrage. Letting out another deafening roar, it began gathering its dark red mana once again, its helmet now fully heated. Its intense gaze fixed on Reiji, it used the heated helmet as a shield against the onslaught of spells and charged directly at him. Summoning the last remnants of his strength, Reiji firmly planted his spear into the bridge and launched himself into the air, soaring towards the safety of the group. A second later, the behemoth smashed into the ground, using all of its hate and rage to fuel its attack. The entire bridge shook as it fell. Massive cracks spread out from the point of impact. The bridge groaned in protest one last time, before collapsing entirely. The repeated attacks had finally driven it past the point of endurance. Gra. The behemoth roared angrily as it desperately tried to find purchase on the crumbling bridge with its nails. However, everywhere it latched onto crumbled as well, and after a final, fruitless struggle, it fell to the depths of hell. Its final screams echoed throughout the chamber. Reiji's enhanced physical abilities surpassed even Cookie, ensuring his survival in this perilous situation. As he neared the moment of landing, an ominous sensation surged through his entire being, sending alarm bells ringing within him. Time seemed to slow down, and his eyes widened in front of him. Eh. Reiji unconsciously muttered as his detect magic skill was triggered. Before him, a gust of wind materialized a spell. In that split second, a chilling thought crossed his mind someone had targeted him. But who? His eyes widened further as he scanned the group, and there, amidst the chaos, stood a hooded figure wearing a smirk. The atmosphere turned suffocatingly tense as Reiji's heart pounded in his chest. His body, already drained of energy and devoid of mana, lacked the means to defend itself. The injuries inflicted by the behemoth had left him weakened, his movements fueled solely by the fleeting surge of adrenaline. Ah, I'm not going to make it, am I? Shifting his gaze toward Hajime, who appeared blissfully unaware of the danger that awaited Reiji. With a snort of amusement, Reiji flashed Hajime a peace sign and a grin, causing confusion to wash over his face. It wasn't until Hajime noticed the incoming spell that he understood the situation. With a horrifying inevitability, the spell struck Reiji, its impact jolting through his body. In that harrowing moment, his consciousness was abruptly snuffed out, and he was sent hurtling backward, propelled toward the shattered remnants of the bridge. Helplessly, he plummeted into the unfathomable abyss below. Listening to the screams of the behemoth that grew fainter and fainter. Listening to the bridge crumble away into nothingness. And then, all too soon, Reiji was swallowed up in the darkness along with the last of the rubble. Reiji I. Chapter 20. Reiji I. Time itself seemed to slow down as Hajime watched Reiji plummet into the depths of the earth, his eyes filled with despair. The moments they had shared during their training in the kingdom were some of the most cherished memories of his life. Despite not knowing much about Reiji personally or the extent of his abilities, Hajime regarded him as a friend, a brother, and someone he could wholeheartedly trust. Reiji, without any obligation or necessity, had chosen to train and support Hajime, a gesture that filled him with eternal gratitude. Despite Reiji's typically cold and blunt demeanor, 
he had never belittled Hajime or mocked his struggles. Instead, he offered valuable advice and guidance, helping Hajime find solutions to his issues and problems. But what struck Hajime the most were the moments they had shared within the treacherous labyrinth. Reiji had consistently been his guardian, watching over him and safeguarding his back. Even in the midst of perilous battles, Reiji would offer valuable insights and tips to enhance Hajime's combat prowess. However, it was the pivotal moment when Reiji selflessly handed him the mana pill, the very lifeline he needed to protect himself in that very last moment. Ha! Hajime's anguished cry pierced through the air as he witnessed the devastating turn of events. Overwhelmed by a surge of emotions anger, frustration, and profound sadness pounded the ground repeatedly with clenched fists. Each punch was a release of pent-up despair and a desperate attempt to vent his overwhelming feelings. Tears streamed down his face as he poured his heartache into the earth beneath him. Seeing Hajime's torment, Kaori rushed to his side, her tears mingling with his. She enveloped him in a tight embrace, providing solace and support in this moment of deep sorrow. Sorry, Nagumo-kun, Kaori whispered through her tears, her voice filled with genuine remorse. She held him tighter as if trying to shield him from the pain. It's not your fault. None of this is your fault. We all did what we could to protect each other, and Reiji. Shaking his head in denial, Hajime choked out his words, his voice trembling with guilt. It. It is my fault. I shouldn't have taken that last man a pill. I should have given it back to him. If I had, then he would have been able to protect himself and make it back safely. It's all my fault. Tears continued to stream down Kori's face as she held him tighter, her own heart heavy with sorrow and pain. She understood the weight of his words and shared in his anguish. Hajime, I. I know how you feel. I'm hurting too. But please, don't blame yourself. Reiji made that choice willingly because he cared about you. He wanted to protect you, just as you wanted to protect him. We all did what we thought was best at that moment. Amidst the uncertainty and confusion, the onlookers found themselves at a loss for what to do. It was then that Captain Meld approached Kaori and Hajime with firm determination. Without hesitation, he delivered a swift chop to the back of Hajime's neck. A momentary spasm coursed through Hajime's body, and he slumped into unconsciousness. Kaori, quick to react, caught him before he hit the ground, her eyes filled with anger as she glared at Captain Meld. However, before Kaori could voice her disapproval, Shizuku intervened, inserting herself into the situation. Sorry. And thank you, Shizuku expressed sincerely. Don't deserve your thanks. But I cannot allow anyone else to die. Everyone, we're heading back to the surface as fast as possible. I'll leave him in your care, Captain Melt responded with determination. Turning towards Kaori, Shizuku hugged her tightly, tears welling up in her eyes. Come on, Kaori, we need to get out of here. We can talk about our next steps once we're above ground. Captain Meld intervened to stop Hajime from harming himself. Turning towards the approaching cookie she continued. Hajime's grief might have affected the entire class's morale, and more importantly, someone had to stop him before he hurt himself. Now get your butt up front and open a path for us. You have to take the lead until we all make it out of this. Nagumo Kuen said the same thing, remember? Reluctantly, Cookie nodded in agreement with Shizuku's words. You're right, let's get out of here, Cookie affirmed, ready to lead the way. One of their classmates had died right in front of their eyes. That had shaken the whole class a great deal. Everyone was staring at the chasm where the bridge had been in a daze. A few of the students even sat down where they were, proclaiming things like I'm done with this crap. Just as Hajime had told Cookie earlier, they needed a leader to guide them. Cookie turned to his classmates and raised his voice. Everyone. Right now we need to focus on surviving. We have to retreat. His words slowly spurred the class into action. The magic circles continued to spew out more Tron soldiers, gradually replenishing their numbers. Engaging them head-on would be perilous, and at this point, there was no need for further combat. Cookie shouted as loudly as he could, urging his classmates to press onward. Captain Meld and the other knights also endeavored to instill vigor and determination in the students. Eventually, 
everyone reached the staircase. It stretched on for what seemed like an eternity, disappearing into darkness, obscuring its destination. Based on their pace, they had likely ascended over thirty floors already. Even with the aid of body-strengthening magic, fatigue began to weigh heavily on the students. The earlier battle had left them partially exhausted, and the seemingly endless darkness of the staircase drained their willpower. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the familiar sight of the main gate and receptionist's desk came into view. Although they had only been gone for less than a day, it felt like an eternity since they last laid eyes on it. Relief washed over the students as they stepped outside, their exhaustion temporarily forgotten. Some collapsed on the ground just outside the gate, sprawled out with arms and legs spread wide. Most of them were simply grateful to have returned in one piece. None of the students felt like exploring Harad, so they all returned to the inn. Some of them chatted with each other, but most of them just went straight to sleep, burned out by the events of the day. Meanwhile, within the holy church of the Halai kingdom, a hooded figure knelt before Ishtar, wearing a sinister grin that hinted at a twisted satisfaction. Ishtar himself mirrored the expression, his face exuding contentment. With a lifted hand, the hooded figure stood up from the ground and began delivering his report. The hooded figure's voice cut through the eerie silence, each word dripping with a sinister tone. Reporting. The mission has been accomplished. Reiji Sukahiro. Is now dead, they declared. Have you been compromised? How did you eliminate him, and are there any indications left behind? Ishtar inquired, his voice laced with a chilling undertone. If the figure had been detected he wouldn't hesitate to dispose of him. Shaking his head vehemently, the hooded figure denied any detection. No one noticed a thing. With the chaos caused by the behemoth and the Trom soldiers, their attention was completely diverted. I skillfully employed wind magic to propel Reiji backward, causing him to fall into the labyrinth. Excellent, Ishtar praised, his voice filled with satisfaction. Your last-minute inclusion proved to be fortuitous, Tatsuya. Not only did you achieve your revenge, but you also helped me eliminate a potential enemy. Removing his hoodie, Tatsuya wore a smug grin as he addressed Ishtar. I express my gratitude to your excellency for involving me in this endeavor. However, if I may inquire, why did you abandon your pursuit of controlling Reiji? Initially, you seemed determined to gain information about him, so I assumed you wouldn't allow him to slip through your fingers. What caused this change of heart? Gazing at Tatsuya with a disdainful expression, Ishtar retorted, It's no wonder Reiji considered you a nuisance. You seem oblivious to your own insignificance. However, since I happen to be in a rather benevolent mood, I suppose I can entertain your question. Frustrated by Ishtar's insult, Tatsuya tightly clenched his fists behind his back, though he managed to maintain his composure as he attentively listened to Ishtar's response. I gave up on trying to control him because of his false information, Ishtar began, causing Tatsuya to raise an eyebrow and mutter false information under his breath. Ignoring the remark, Ishtar continued. As you know, Captain Melt's job class is that of a paladin. However, despite having considerable talent in magic, he is not as attuned as others. He lacks the detect magic skill, which is why he couldn't perceive the illusion cast on Reiji's status plate, Ishtar explained. Wait, Reiji revealed his status plate. Tatsuya asked in shock. Ishtar waved his hand dismissively, giving Tatsuya a stern glare to avoid interrupting, and proceeded to answer. You were unaware of this due to your request for assistance at the Adventurer's Guild. In any case, it was I am, our initial spy, who discovered this tactic. However, she couldn't obtain the specific details of his actual status information because he had prepared for any countermeasures, such as Captain Melt's instincts or the presence of potential spies. The boy is smart, I'll give him that, but he's naive. He doesn't fully comprehend the dark side of the world, and as such, he perished. He assumed that I would keep him alive due to his status as a hero but failed to realize my desire for control. And if he remains outside my control, it's better for him to be deceased before he becomes too powerful to deal with, Ishtar finished, leaning back into his throne. Tatsuya stood there in shock. Ishtar had disposed of a powerful ally simply because he desired control. Tatsuya understood the value of having control over a group of formidable individuals, 
but eliminating someone who displayed the most potential among them seemed like a significant loss in terms of manpower. Ah, uh, yes. Tatsuya, I forgot to mention this, Ishtar called out, his gaze fixed on Tatsuya. Showing his respect, Tatsuya promptly knelt on the floor and responded, Yes, Your Excellence. What is it that you desire? It's not something I desire, but rather an order, Ishtar began, his gaze piercing as he locked eyes with Tatsuya. The atmosphere grew tense as he delivered a stern warning. I strongly advise that everything discussed here remains confidential. If any rumors were to circulate, you will be held responsible and face swift consequences. Nod if you understand. With a cold sweat running down his back, Tatsuya nodded in acknowledgement. Ishtar's grin widened as he waved his hand in dismissal. Good. You may leave. Nodding once more, Tatsuya swiftly exited the premises, leaving the room enveloped in silence. Harad Town. It had been two days since Reiji's tragic fall, and the hero's party found itself in a less than optimal state. Morale among the group was noticeably low, and a tense and fearful atmosphere hung in the air. Witnessing such a devastating event involving their classmate had a profound impact on everyone, intensifying the somber mood. Adding to the distress, Hajime remained unconscious, his body overwhelmed by a combination of injuries, mana exhaustion, and emotional trauma. The weight of these burdens had plunged him into a deep slumber from which he had yet to awaken. Taking turns tending to his bedside, Kaori dedicated herself to his care, accompanied by occasional visits from Shizuku when Kaori's exhaustion became evident. It wasn't until now that Hajime awoke from his deep slumber, his eyes gradually fluttering open to the gentle illumination of the room. As his senses returned, he cautiously lifted his stiff body from the bed, feeling a slight headache coming on. Instinctively, Hajime reached for his head, his grip tightening as the memories of recent events flooded back, including the moment when Captain Meld had rendered him unconscious. Just as he was about to rise from the bed, a shattering sound of glass echoed in the room, catching Hajime's attention. His gaze lifted to find Kori standing there, her hand covering her mouth, tears threatening to spill from her eyes. Hastening to his side, she offered her support, helping him to sit up slightly as Hajime inquired, Where are we? We're inside the inn in Harad town, Kori replied, her voice filled with concern. How are you feeling, Nagumo Kuen? Are you experiencing any pain or discomfort? She asked, her worry evident in her eyes. Shirasaki, Hajime called out, interrupting her barrage of questions. Is it true? Did Reiji really fall into the labyrinth? It was just a dream, right? The questions wiped the smile off Kori's face, and she fell silent. The silence confirmed to Hajime that it wasn't just a dream. Can you give me some space for a while? Hajime requested, his tone reflecting his lack of energy and desire to engage in conversation. He was in no condition or mood to socialize or do much of anything. Nodding, Kori rose from her seat and turned to leave however, before departing, she placed a notebook on the lamp table beside Hajime. She explained. This notebook belongs to Reiji. On the night we left your room, he asked me to give it to you in case something happened to him. I'm going now, but Nagumono, Hajime, you don't have to face this alone. I'm here for you if you need someone. As she opened the door to depart, a faint whisper escaped Hajime's lips, Thank you, Kaori. With a soft smile and a blush on her cheeks, she closed the door, leaving Hajime alone with his thoughts. Letting out a sigh, Hajime leaned back against the bed frame and cast his gaze upon the notebook. With a hint of hesitation, he reached out and started flipping through its pages. The initial ones displayed various designs related to spears and weaponry, but one page, in particular, grabbed his attention. It was a letter addressed to Hajime, written by Reiji himself. Dear Hajime. If you are reading this, then I am either missing or, perhaps, deceased. It feels strange to write such a message, doesn't it? However, I believe it is essential to compose this letter in case such a situation ever arises. Similar to Kaori, I have also been plagued by unsettling premonitions and have sensed that something significant is about to happen. Hence, I decided to write this letter. First off, I am going to say this bluntly and clearly, it isn't your fault. I'm not sure what may have happened, but without a doubt, 
I know you would blame yourself for it. You are too nice and selfless to do otherwise. If I made such a decision, then it's my fault and mine alone. I don't need your pity or sympathy. Riley smiling at Reiji's comment, he continued reading. He was aware of Reiji's blunt and straightforward nature, and Hajime had always found it somewhat amusing, considering Reiji's secretive disposition. Now that we have that settled, let's delve into the core of the matter. Hayama was spying on us the night Kori came over. I'm not entirely sure of his intentions back then, but I want you to remain cautious regardless. Anything can happen, and I want you to be prepared. Don't repeat the same mistakes I made. I have left behind my custom creative training courses and trustworthy instructors within the kingdom to aid in your training. Hajime, you're a strong individual don't let my disappearance affect you. As Hajime continued reading, tears welled up in his eyes, staining the pages of the notebook. The next line, however, brought a smile to his face. It was uncharacteristic of Reiji, given his reserved nature, but at that moment, Hajime didn't mind. It lifted his mood and filled him with a sense of hope. Besides, who's to say I'm dead? After all, I am the strongest. S. Confessed to Kaori already. Overwhelmed by a mix of emotions, Hajime couldn't help but blush and burst into laughter, feeling a sense of fulfillment. He made a firm decision to believe in Reiji and strive to surpass his expectations. The recent events undoubtedly left a profound impact on Hajime. The old version of himself had perished, and in its place, a renewed Hajime would emerge. Even though he wouldn't follow the canon counterpart of himself, he was determined to rise to the pinnacle and stand by Reiji's side as a brother. It made him wonder what situation was Reiji dealing with right now. Meanwhile with Reiji. Arf. Chapter 21. Arf. The piercing scream of Reiji tore through the air, a primal cry of anguish that echoed with a haunting intensity. It carried the weight of unbearable pain and desperation, a sound that would send a chill down the spines of all who were unfortunate enough to hear it. Crushed beneath the massive debris of the collapsed bridge, his body lay in a state of utter devastation. Every fiber of his being screamed in torment, his once strong and capable form reduced to a broken and mangled shell. His limbs, once agile and responsive, now lay motionless and twisted, contorted by the unforgiving weight that bore down upon them. The excruciating pressure pressed against his battered frame, each breath a labored gasp as his lungs fought against the crushing force of the debris. The jagged edges of metal and concrete bit into his flesh, leaving deep lacerations that oozed crimson rivulets of blood, staining his torn clothing and melding with the dust and dirt that clung to his wounded body. Reiji's least dominant arm, a mere remnant of its former strength, spasmed and flailed in a futile attempt to free itself from the relentless grip of the wreckage. But the injuries were too severe, the pain too consuming. His feeble movements served only to further aggravate his shattered bones and torn muscles, eliciting new waves of agony that coursed through his entire being. Time seemed to slow as Reiji lay trapped, suspended between the realms of life and death. The relentless torment gnawed at his consciousness, twisting his thoughts and distorting his perception. Every passing second felt like an eternity, the weight of his suffering becoming an oppressive burden that threatened to crush his spirit as mercilessly as the debris had crushed his body. As a consequence of the significant loss of blood and the complete depletion of his mana, compounded by the relentless inner turmoil plaguing him and the relentless assault on his weary body, he swiftly succumbed to unconsciousness. Drip. Drip. The steady rhythm of dripping water resonated in the claustrophobic space, its chilling touch splattering across Reiji's visage and infiltrating his dry mouth. Gradually, his eyelids fluttered open, unveiling the dimly illuminated environment. Wincing with discomfort, he struggled to elevate his body, grimacing at the weight of the rubble pressing upon him only to be greeted by a searing pain coursing through his limbs. Every movement felt like shards of glass tearing into his flesh. As his weary gaze adjusted to the dimly lit space, he was reminded that his body was buried under a mound of debris, trapped and imprisoned in this forsaken place. Looking down at his body, Reiji's eyes widened in disbelief. The wounds that had marred his body mere moments ago now faded into nothing more than faint scars. Yet, an excruciating pain surged through every inch of his body, contorting his once composed features into a visage of anguished grimace. 
His jaw clenched tightly as his eyes narrowed, emanating an intense glare that pierced through the oppressive darkness. As the excruciating torment coursed through his veins, Reiji's mana surged forth, pulsating with unrestrained power. Like a raging inferno, his mana spread, consuming his entire being, as he intensified the flow of his inner energy. His amethyst irises, now infused with a dark aura, flared to life, radiating an ominous glow in the dim surroundings. With a surge of power, the debris that had weighed him down began to tremble and strain under the force of his unleashed energy. The very ground quivered in response, unable to contain the pressure emanating from Reiji's body. As he increased the multiplier on his ability, body augmentation, his body strained under immense pressure, showing signs of internal damage. Sweat began to form at his brows as blood trickled from his nose and eyes, a testament to the toll his own ability was exacting on him. Ignoring the pain, Reiji pushed beyond his limits, his muscles trembling with exertion as he gradually lifted the debris off himself. His veins pulsed with dark energy, intertwining with his surging mana. As mentioned earlier, this ability bore a resemblance to the Super Scion transformation, but it was more akin to the Kaioken technique. Like the Kaioken, it granted the user a significant boost in base power level, strength, speed, and sensory awareness for a brief period. However, despite Reiji's mastery of mana manipulation, he was unable to mitigate the inherent drawbacks of this ability. Intense muscle spasms, excruciating pain, and profound weakness plagued him after prolonged use. Adding to the fact that his body had healed, the remnants of pain from his fall continued to linger, tormenting him with each movement. Needless to say, he was currently engulfed in immense agony. Ra! Reiji's roar reverberated through the labyrinth, a chilling sound that echoed in the air, piercing it with its primal pitch. It carried the raw power of his darkness-infused energy, resonating with the depths of his being. His body trembled as he gathered his remaining strength, determined to push through the agony and tap into his power once more. With a surge of will, his dark energy intensified, causing the air around him to crackle with an ominous aura. As dust swirled around him, the ground beneath him began to crack, forming a small crater. With a primal scream, Reiji launched himself backward, propelled by the raw force of his surge. His muscles strained, but he ignored the pain, his eyes fixed on the debris still hovering in the air. Reacting swiftly, Reiji leaped backward, his legs trembling with exhaustion as he dropped to one knee. He observed as the debris crashed back to the ground, producing a resounding thud. The impact stirred up a cloud of dust, enveloping the area and causing Reiji to shield his face, coughing. Gradually, the dust settled, revealing a scene of desolation. Reiji, still coughing, examined his hand and noticed it stained crimson with his own blood. His nose and eyes were also bleeding, a testament to the severity of his injuries. Leaning against the cold, unforgiving wall, Reiji struggled to catch his breath, each inhalation a painful reminder of his depleted strength. Fatigue gripped his body, making even the simplest movements arduous. The consequences of pushing his limits were evident torn muscles throbbed with agony, his mana reserves were drained to their limits, and the steady trickle of blood served as a grim reminder of his injuries. As he closed his eyes, seeking a moment's respite from the overwhelming fatigue, a distinct sound reached his ears the rhythmic drops of water hitting a surface. Opening his eyes, his gaze was drawn to a solitary stone casting a feeble glow in the dimly lit, confined space. This. Is. The source of the liquid was a basketball-sized crystal that emitted a pale blue light. The crystal was buried into the wall around it, and the liquid was pouring out from underneath it. It had an aura of wondrous beauty about it. The light it emitted was just a shade darker than an aquamarine. Reiji stared at it in wonder, his pain momentarily forgotten. Then, as if drawn to it, he mustered his strength and crawled towards the stone, his movements sluggish and strained. Pressing his lips against the cool surface, a surge of energy coursed through his body, dispelling the pain, haze, and fatigue that had enveloped him. The sensation left Reiji in awe, confirming his suspicion that the crystal had indeed been the catalyst for his survival. In this desolate place, where liquid was scarce, it was evident that the crystal held the key to his rejuvenation. Though the wounds from his injuries and the loss of blood would never be fully healed, the rest of his injuries and the depletion of his mana were instantly restored. 
Though Reiji didn't know it, the crystal was actually a divinity stone. Divinity stones were rare crystals and are considered to be one of the world's greatest historical treasures. Modern-day people thought of them as a lost legends. Divinity stones were created when a large clump of mana pooled together and crystallized over the course of a thousand years. They ranged from 30 to 40 centimeters in diameter, and then over the course of a few hundred years their saturated mana liquefied and poured back into the earth. The liquid they secreted was known as ambrosia, and it healed all wounds. It couldn't regrow missing limbs, but supposedly it extended one's life so long as they continued to drink it and was also referred to as the elixir of life. Legend claims that a hit healed the masses with this very ambrosia. Reiji, fully conscious of his narrow escape from the clutches of death, slumped against the cold, damp wall of his confinement. The passage of time was a mystery to him in this desolate place, but one thing remained clear in his mind, he needed to escape this hellish abyss. For days had passed since Reiji had fallen into the labyrinth. During the time he spent trapped within the confines of debris in cave walls surrounding him, Reiji had been clawing away at the walls. Despite his proficiency in magic, Reiji's lack of affinity towards earth magic limited his options. The spells at his disposal were predominantly defensive and offensive, offering no solutions for burrowing through tight spaces. Blowing his way out was not a viable option either, as the close proximity would expose him to the resulting blast. Moreover, reducing the spell's output risked triggering a cascade of debris, potentially trapping him further or even causing his demise at the hands of lurking unknown monsters. The further one ventured into the labyrinth, the stronger and more formidable the lurking creatures became. If Reiji couldn't even confront a behemoth with a group of inexperienced individuals possessing overpowered abilities. It was clear that he wouldn't stand a chance against a more formidable opponent without proper preparation and knowledge of their capabilities. As he relied on the Divinity Stone for sustenance, he remained alive, but hunger gnawed at him incessantly. However, while Ambrosia could sustain a person through unimaginable conditions, it failed to alleviate his insatiable hunger. Although he could not succumb to death's embrace, Reiji was tormented by ceaseless waves of hunger, accompanied by phantom pains that plagued his body. He couldn't sleep because of the pain and hunger, and if he drank more ambrosia, all it did was clear his mind to let him feel the pain more vividly. Over and over, his fatigue brought him to the edge of consciousness, only for the pain and hunger to draw him back. And then to escape the pain he would drink more ambrosia, which only invited further pain. He had repeated that cycle more times than he could count. At some point, Hajime stopped drinking ambrosia altogether. He had unconsciously chosen the fastest way to end his pain. If all that awaits me is eternal pain. Then I might as well. Reiji muttered to himself, clearly defeated, and let his consciousness slip away. Yet another three days passed. Deprived of Ambrosia's life-sustaining essence, Reiji's body neared the brink of collapse, with only two days left before his demise. In addition to his ravenous hunger, his thirst intensified, intertwining with his insatiable cravings. This prolonged deprivation had rendered his body feeble and fragile, draining his mana to the point of depletion. As a consequence, his futile attempts to claw his way out of the confining walls ceased altogether. Around the eighth day since uncovering the Divinity Stone, an unsettling transformation took hold of Reiji's psyche. Caught between yearning for the sweet release of death and fervently desiring deliverance, his mind started to warp, giving birth to sinister thoughts bubbling up from the depths of Reiji's subconscious. Like a slimy parasite, these thoughts insidiously seeped into the crevices of his tormented heart, corroding his very soul with each passing moment. Despite his prior experience being surrounded by darkness in the abyss, he found himself trapped in a perpetual state of subconsciousness. With no respite in sleep, the dark thoughts began to gnaw at him relentlessly. The unrelenting pain that engulfed his body served as a constant reminder of his dire predicament, while the looming specter of being trapped within the labyrinth without sustenance haunted his every waking moment. Why do I have to suffer so much? What did I ever do to deserve this? Why me? Why did it end up like this? Rob just picked me up and dropped me off at this place did he do this intentionally? He never denied that I was a pawn in some twisted game. A sinister conviction took hold of his fractured mind. Blinded by the agony, hunger, and suffocating darkness, 
Reiji's thoughts turned towards finding a scapegoat to bear the weight of his suffering. Someone had to be held accountable, someone had orchestrated this cruel fate that had befallen him. With each passing moment, his sanity crumbled further, consumed by the festering darkness within. There was no time to be trapped by such petty feelings. Because no matter how much he raged against his foes, Reiji's pain never lessened. In order to escape the absurd and unreasonable situation he was stuck in, unneeded feelings had to be discarded. What is it I want? I want to live. Live however I want without anyone stopping me from doing as I please. And what's stopping me from living? The enemy. And just who is the enemy? Everyone and everything that gets in my way, everything that pushes this unreasonable fate onto me. So what is it I should do? I should. I should. On the tenth day, Reiji succumbed to the merciless grip of unconsciousness, a dire consequence of his unyielding hunger and obstinate refusal to consume the life-sustaining ambrosia. And in the depths of his unconsciousness, Reiji found himself standing through a vast expanse of darkness. Chapter 22 In the depths of his unconsciousness, Reiji found himself standing through a vast expanse of darkness. There were no tangible boundaries or landmarks, only an infinite void that seemed to swallow him whole. It was in this enigmatic realm that his dreamscape unfolded, an ethereal landscape shaped by his own subconscious. As Reiji's senses slowly awakened, Reiji felt a bone-chilling cold seep into his bones, a frigid reminder of the haunting environment that surrounded him. He stood upon an obscure ground, its texture and features obscured by the fog. The air was thick with an eerie fog that snaked its way around him, concealing his surroundings and shrouding everything in an impenetrable veil. The silence of the void was punctuated by faint whispers, the chilling echoes of bones cracking, barely audible, that sent shivers cascading down his spine. Reiji heightened his senses, trying to pierce through the fog and uncover the source of these ethereal murmurs. Shadows danced at the edges of his vision, teasing him with fleeting glimpses of something lurking in the darkness. Who's there? Reiji shouted, his voice filled with a mix of fear and confusion. In his current state, he couldn't think logically or calm himself down. The overwhelming events had left his mind racing, unable to process everything that was happening. After all, he was just a reincarnated teenager with double the life experience of a typical high school student. He lacked the knowledge and understanding of how dark and dangerous the world could truly be. It was a marvel that he had managed to survive for this long, given his rash actions and decisions. As Reiji heard the approaching footsteps, he swiftly turned towards the source, ready to defend himself. To his astonishment, nothing greeted his gaze. Bewildered, he was about to lower his guard when suddenly, without warning, an unseen force slammed into him, sending him crashing to the floor. The impact was jarring, causing him to cough up saliva as pain coursed through his body. A sinister laughter pierced the air, its malevolence seeping into Reiji's bones like an icy chill. Kohaha! How does it feel, Reiji? So smug in your unwarranted confidence, yet so pathetically weak. Don't fret, my dear, your suffering has only just begun. The voice, oozing with contempt and sadistic pleasure, taunted Reiji with every word, plunging the knife of humiliation deeper into his already damaged psyche. As the voice echoed, the mist began to swirl around Reiji, dancing with otherworldly energy. Without warning, a swift and merciless strike landed on him, the unseen assailant targeted Reiji's vulnerable solar plexus. Agonizing pain erupted within him, a searing sensation that robbed him of breath and left him gasping for air. The force of the blow sent him crashing to the unforgiving floor, the impact resonating through his entire being. Amidst the excruciating pain, the voice continued its taunting, its words dripping with disdain and sadistic pleasure. Oh, Reiji, how pitiful you are in your feeble attempts at resistance, the voice sneered, its sinister tone coiling through the air like a venomous serpent. You make an excellent plaything for my amusement. With each successive strike, the assailant zeroed in on Reiji's exposed vulnerabilities, landing precise blows. A relentless assault rained upon him, targeting non-lethal areas to prolong his suffering, to ensure that every moment was a torturous experience. Fists crashed into his flesh, inflicting searing agony that coursed through his nerves. Ribs cracked under the forceful impacts, sending waves of torment through his body. 
The air escaped his lungs in desperate gasps, the excruciating ache making it near impossible to draw a full breath. The sadistic voice pierced the air, its words oozing with venom and sadistic pleasure. You thought you were a mentor. A guide? Someone important. Look at you now, all pathetic and broken. Your feeble attempts at playing hero have led you to this wretched state. Your arrogance, your impulsive and ill-conceived decisions, they have brought you to this precipice of despair. And now, it's time to pay the price for your failures. With each taunting sentence, the entity's assault intensified, striking Reiji relentlessly. Merciless strikes pummeled his vulnerable form as he lay helplessly on the floor. Every attempt to defend himself proved futile, his feeble defenses shattered by the entity's speed, strength, and unparalleled skill. There was an insurmountable disparity between them, leaving Reiji no chance at survival. Just as the figure was poised to deliver a final blow, he abruptly halted, stopping mere inches from Reiji's face. In a chilling, devilish whisper, he spoke, his words dripping with malevolence. Nah, don't you yearn for revenge? Don't you desire to eliminate those responsible for subjecting you to this wretched hell? The very individuals who brought you into this accursed world. The Pope, the King, Tatsuya. And perhaps even the man who orchestrated it all Rob. As the name reverberated through the air, Reiji's eyes widened in sheer disbelief. How could this person be aware of such a deeply buried secret? Was he trapped within a twisted dream, or was this a living nightmare that had consumed his reality? The questions swirled relentlessly in his mind, shrouding him in a suffocating cloud of uncertainty. The pain coursing through his body was far too genuine, his wounds too raw to be dismissed as a mere illusion. Fueled by a mix of fear and fury, Reiji's voice trembled with an edge of desperation as he demanded answers. How? How do you know that name? With an intense glare fixed upon Reiji, the figure slowly rose from his crouched position, exuding an aura of dominance. Dismissing Reiji's demand for answers with a contemptuous sneer, he swiftly retreated a few steps, creating a short distance between them. Suddenly, his leg unleashed a ferocious roundhouse kick, striking Reiji's torso with devastating force. The impact propelled Reiji through the air, his body spiraling uncontrollably until it collided with the unforgiving ground, sending shockwaves of agony coursing through his entire being. Without a moment's respite, the figure closed in on Reiji, his foot landing heavily on Reiji's chest, pinning him down mercilessly. The weight and pressure served as a cruel reminder of his helplessness, his body betraying him in the face of this overpowering adversary. Darkness swirled in the entity's eyes, revealing a malevolent intent that sent chills down Reiji's spine. It was a chilling testament to the profound depravity that resides within the human soul. With a crack of his finger, a disdainful smirk curled upon the figure's lips, reveling in Reiji's vulnerability. The weight of the figure's foot pressed down relentlessly upon Reiji's body, trapping him beneath an unyielding pressure. Know your place, fool, the figure hissed with venomous satisfaction. Those who crumble in the mere presence of their adversary have no right to demand answers. If you understand this nod. Resolute, Reiji clenched his teeth, acknowledging the entity's words with a nod. The sinister smirk that adorned their face only fueled his resolve. It appears that there is still a flicker of strength within you, the figure taunted, their voice dripping with disdain. But do not deceive yourself, for it is a feeble flame on the brink of extinguishment. Your false bravado holds no sway over me I see through your facade with ease, the figure hissed, increasing the pressure on Reiji's chest, causing him to gasp for air. Desperation filled Reiji's eyes as he futilely clawed at the foot that pinned him down. The figure sneered, relishing in Reiji's futile struggle. With a derisive snort, he finally lifted his foot, leaving Reiji gasping for breath on the frigid ground. Walking away, the figure took a glance at Reiji before speaking once more. Would you just look at that? Such a twisted expression you're wearing, the entity sneered, relishing in Reiji's visible torment. His laughter echoed through the air, a chilling sound that sent shivers down the spine. Ha ha ha. You're completely shattered. Within the depths of Reiji's eyes, once brimming with vitality, now burned an unsettling amethyst glow, exuding a malevolent aura that permeated the surroundings. They carried the burden of his torment, haunting orbs marred by dark circles that bore witness to the emotional, physical, and psychological anguish he had endured. 
The darkness that enveloped him seeped into every fiber of his being, amplifying his intent to kill. May I ask you one question? Reiji inquired, his voice carrying a deep, resonant tone. The figure nodded in response, their sinister grin widening. Reiji, his eyes narrowed with a mix of curiosity and trepidation, pressed on, Who are you? Emerging before him, the figure leaned in close, their breath chilling against Reiji's ear as they whispered, It is still far too early for you to grasp the truth. With a sudden, powerful shove, Reiji was sent hurtling through the air, bracing himself for the impact of the cold, unforgiving ground below. But instead, he found himself descending into an abyss of endless darkness. From above, the figure stood, peering down at Reiji, their voice piercing through the void, filled with ominous resonance. Since I have denied you the answer you so desperately seek, I shall offer you instead a word of caution and a parting token. Your mastery over darkness remains nascent, but that shall no longer be the case. The darkness you have endured is unlike any other, and from it, you shall glean valuable wisdom. As for the parting gift I have bestowed upon you, it shall aid you indefinitely in your pursuits. Utilize it wisely, for its power is profound. Until we meet again, boy. As the cold, hard floor drew nearer, Reiji braced himself for the impending impact, resigned to his fate. But at that moment, a blinding flash of light engulfed him, causing him to disappear from sight. As Reiji's eyes slowly fluttered open, a sinister gleam shone within them, reminiscent of a predatory reptile stalking its prey. With a sharp focus, he turned his attention to the spilled ambrosia nearby, his parched lips curling into a feral grin. Scooping up a handful of the life-giving substance, he devoured it greedily, his actions akin to a starved beast feeding on its prey. Though the gnawing hunger and agonizing pain still lingered, his body surged with newfound vitality. Roughly wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, his eyes now ablaze with unsettling intensity, Reiji's wicked smile widened, revealing his sharpened canines. Yes, he whispered, his voice dripping with sinister satisfaction. I have found the answer. The only rational answer. Is to eliminate all those that threaten me. Standing up, he walked over to the labyrinth wall, pointing his finger at it, and uttered, Ciro Oscuras. As he spoke those words, a surge of dark energy emanated from his finger and engulfed the wall of the cave the air crackled with power as the wall began to tremble and shake. The sheer force of Reiji's attack sent tremors through the surrounding debris, causing cracks to spiderweb across the ceiling. Dust filled the air as the imminent collapse loomed overhead. With unwavering focus, Reiji channeled his mana, honing it into a concentrated beam of energy, intensifying the density and penetration of his assault. Gradually, the cracks expanded like ominous veins, snaking their way across the surface. And then, with a resounding crash, a section of the wall crumbled away, revealing a narrow path leading out of the labyrinth's confines. Seizing the opportunity, Reiji calmly retrieved the divinity stone stone suspended from the ceiling, even as boulders rained down around him. Unfazed by the chaos, a serene expression settled upon his face as he sank into the shadow cast by the faint light streaming through the open exit. Embracing the darkness, he melded with the encroaching shadows, using their cover to swiftly navigate towards the open area of the labyrinth, leaving behind the collapsing cave in his wake. Stepping out from the engulfing shadow, Reiji surveyed his newfound surroundings with a calculating gaze. His eyes fell upon the gleaming sight of his fallen spear, resting upon the cold, unforgiving floor just a short distance away. A wicked grin twisted his lips as he extended his hand, firmly grasping the weapon's familiar handle. With practiced ease, he spun it between his fingers, reveling in the satisfying weight and balance it offered. Nodding to himself, he gazed at his visitors. Well, well, well. What do we have here? Reiji commented as he relaxed his spear over his shoulders. It was a group of twin-tailed wolves. Twin-tailed wolves made their dens in certain parts of the labyrinth floor. They usually moved together in packs of four to six. Alone, they were among the weakest of the monsters that roamed the floor, so they always acted in groups. This pack was no exception and was a group of four. However, the leader standing in the front carried a noticeable scar across his eye. It licked its lips in anticipation, imagining the flesh it would soon feast on when suddenly it felt a rather odd sense of unease. Placing the divinity stone on the ground, 
Reiji's aura erupted from his body, washing over the pack of wolves. This is the first time I'm going all out, and you guys seem to be the perfect test subjects at the moment. I hope you don't mind, he stated, carrying a subtle hint of playfulness as he cracked his finger. The wolves trembled in response, their leader struggling to maintain a fod of composure. Gripping his spear firmly, Reiji assumed a battle-ready stance and fixed his gaze upon them. Let's begin, shall we? He uttered with an eerie calmness, his words hanging in the air with an undertone of anticipation. Chapter 23 Chapter 24 The twin-tailed wolves closed in on Reiji, forming a tight circle that entrapped him, their predatory instincts honed and ready to strike. Despite the fact that Reiji's skill, Dark Lord's hockey, had diminished effects on these formidable creatures, a subtle sense of intimidation and unease still emanated from them. Taking center stage, the alpha wolf unleashed a chilling howl that reverberated through the air, its haunting echo instilling fear in those who heard it. The three wolves encircling Reiji growled with malevolent intent, their tails rigidly standing on end, crackling with an ominous surge of electricity. It was evident that this was their magic at work. With a bone-chilling roar, the wolves released bolts of lightning, hurtling them toward Reiji with deadly precision. With swift agility, Reiji propelled himself into the air, evading the onslaught of lightning bolts. His body contorted in mid-air, hanging upside down as if defying gravity, his eyes never leaving the group of wolves below. He maintained a vigilant gaze, meticulously analyzing their every move. Within the confines of the labyrinth, the creatures lurking were akin to primal animals, governed by their own characteristics, habits, habitats, and rules. Survival was the name of the game in this treacherous realm, where the strong reigned supreme, devouring the weak without remorse. Reiji had grown weary of his own weakness, driven by the relentless hunger that gnawed at his very being. To escape its clutches, he knew he had to confront these creatures head-on, to kill and consume them in order to sustain his own existence. The desire to live propelled him forward, fueling his determination to grow stronger and eradicate anything that stood in his way. Seizing the opportunity presented by Reiji's aerial maneuver, the alpha wolf's tail stiffened, becoming a conduit for crackling lightning. Its howl reverberated through the air as it unleashed a potent thunderbolt aimed directly at Reiji, its accuracy honed with deadly precision. The intensity of the attack surpassed that of its companions, holding the potential to inflict even greater harm. With his eyes fixed upon the incoming attack, Reiji swiftly adjusted his posture, contorting his body upright. He cupped his hands together, drawing them close to his side, as he concentrated his mana into a single point. Gathering his mana, Reiji channeled it through his hands and concentrated it into a condensed ball of swirling purple and black energy. As the wolf's attack grew nearer, Reiji uttered, Dark Pulse. Instantly, a swirling beam of malevolent energy, a fusion of ominous purple and black, surged forth in a straight line toward the approaching lightning bolt. The collision of forces erupted in a spectacular display of power. The Dark Pulse collided with the lightning bolt, causing a violent explosion that illuminated the surrounding area. The crackling energy filled the air, momentarily blinding the wolf's vision. When the blinding light faded, they beheld the aftermath. The remnants of the wolf's attack dissipated into the atmosphere, leaving behind only a lingering trace of electricity in the air. However, Reiji was nowhere to be found. Though the Alpha felt a sense of relief, his instinct still couldn't shake the underlying feeling of wariness. At that very moment, thick and billowing tendrils of shadowy mist emerged from the ground, gradually engulfing the surroundings in an ethereal shroud. The mist clung to every surface, draping over rocks and structures with eerie grace, casting an enigmatic veil over the area. Within the swirling mist, faint whispers echoed, their eerie voices carrying an unsettling message that seemed to come from all directions. The whispers twisted and distorted, making it impossible to decipher their origin. Meanwhile, the silhouettes of shadowy figures spread and danced amidst the mist, their forms resembling human figures lurking in the darkness. As the mist thickened, the sound of quick footsteps reverberated through the air. It was as if unseen entities were moving swiftly and stealthily, their presence felt but their forms obscured by the mist. The wolves, once fierce and confident, now found themselves disoriented and confused. Their keen senses were compromised by the disorienting whispers and the wafting tendrils of mist. 
Before, fear could grip their hearts, the Alpha howled from within the mist. As the wolves' key to survival was their cooperation, the members of a pack all shared a peculiar link with each other. It wasn't as straightforward as telepathy, but they were basically able to tell what the rest of their pack was doing and where they were. However, the mist ensnared those caught within its grasp, leaving them disoriented and vulnerable. Sounds became muffled as if swallowed by the ethereal void, while the only audible presence was the haunting echo of footsteps and the eerie whispers that whispered into their ears. Hearing footsteps approaching, the wolf's instinct surged, propelling it into high alert. Without hesitation, it invoked its magic skill, lightning field, generating a small area of electrified energy around itself, forming a protective shield. Electricity crackled and danced within the confined space, creating a small terrain. But the mist persisted, swirling and encroaching upon the wolf's domain. It crept closer, tendrils of darkness extending and weaving through the air. The once visible steps vanished, consumed by the ethereal mist that brushed against the wolf's fur and obscured its keen eyes. The atmosphere grew heavy with an unsettling presence, as if unseen eyes were watching from within the shadowy depths. The wolf's instincts heightened its senses on high alert. It knew that something malevolent lurked within the mist, something that posed a threat to its very existence. With a low growl, it prepared itself for the impending confrontation, ready to defend itself. You seem wary of something, a voice whispered beside the wolf, its breath gently caressing its fur. The wolf froze in place, its body turning rigid like a statue, no longer daring to glance back in fear of the consequences that may befall it should it act rashly. Slowly, a figure materialized from within the swirling mist, revealing Reiji, now adorned in blood-soaked clothing that clung to his body. A cruel smile adorned his face as he locked his gaze on the wolf and asked, Would you mind showing what it is? With a sense of fear, the wolf hastily retreated, its eyes filled with trepidation, sensing the malevolence emanating from Reiji. As the creature scurried away, Reiji stood in silence, watching with his expression cold and devoid of emotion. The swirling mist gradually dissipated, revealing the macabre aftermath. Laid out around the area were the mangled corpses of the wolves, their lifeless bodies twisted in grotesque positions. Blood stained the ground, merging with the earth in a sinister display. The stillness in the air was palpable, disrupted only by the distant echoes of Reiji's footsteps as he began to walk amongst the carnage. I have plans for him later, Reiji thought as he grabbed one of the wolves and threw him over his shoulders. Grasping the divinity stone from the ground, Reiji exhaled with a tinge of annoyance. His negligence had left him with no clear plan for securing a safe place to eat and rest. Frustration gnawed at his thoughts as he retraced his steps, heading back towards the cave where he had sought temporary refuge. Unbeknownst to him, a malevolent presence lurked in the shadows of the corridor, its growls reverberating through the air. After completing his well-crafted dugout, Reiji took the necessary precautions by casting an illusion to deceive any lurking monsters. Additionally, he fortified his surroundings with a conjured earth wall, serving as a defensive measure. Finally, I have some food, Reiji exclaimed with a hint of contentment. Carefully peeling the fur from the animal carcass, he conjured a small flame above his finger to ignite the fur, creating a modest fire for cooking the meat. The small hole in the ceiling served as a makeshift chimney, allowing the smoke to escape, while the divinity stone continued to generate ambrosia, replenishing his supply. Driven by his ravenous hunger, Reiji embarked on a gruesome feast, tearing into the flesh of the fallen beasts. Bathed in the eerie green glow of the crystals, he appeared as a macabre figure, consumed by his insatiable appetite. Despite his curses and disdain for the taste, he voraciously devoured the wolf, embodying the primal instincts of the creature he had just slain. Gah! Tastes like shit! He spat in frustration, yet his fervor for the meal remained undeterred. His focus was solely on satisfying his gnawing hunger. The meat proved tough and sinewy, the fresh blood constricting his throat, but he tore at it relentlessly, swallowing each morsel with a twisted satisfaction. It had been two long weeks since he had last tasted the food, and his famished stomach protested against the sudden influx of flesh, resisting its consumption. Yet, Reiji disregarded his rebellious stomach, unbothered by its protests. He continued to devour the wolf, his appearance growing increasingly feral. To any modern human, his current form would be repulsive and abhorrent. 
The raw and repugnant odor of the meat brought tears to his eyes, but to Reiji, the food provided relief from his excruciating hunger, rendering such minor discomforts inconsequential. The euphoria of the experience surpassed his wildest imagination, and he ate without restraint, hour after hour. Time slipped away, and still, he persisted in his relentless consumption. Each bite was accompanied by a gulp of ambrosia, a sacred drink of the holy church that, had they known, would have left the priests faint with shock at the barbarity of his meal. However, as he neared the point of satiation, Reiji began to sense a subtle change occurring within his body. Ah! Ga! Aga! Reiji writhed in excruciating pain as if something was devouring him from within. The torment intensified with each passing moment, driving him to the edge of his sanity. Gua! W. H. Watts! Ga! The agony was unbearable, surpassing the previous hunger pangs, physical trauma, and psychological trauma he had endured. Prostrate on the ground, he screamed in terror, his body convulsing uncontrollably. The pain gnawed at him relentlessly, as if attempting to consume him from the inside out. In a desperate attempt to find relief, Reiji crawled towards a bowl of ambrosia, his trembling hands grasping it and gulping down its contents. The potent ambrosia worked its magic, momentarily alleviating the pain. However, before long, the torment returned with even greater intensity. Hi. Guga. Why? Won't it heal? Ga. With each wave of agony, Reiji felt his body pulsate and throb as if it were transforming into one monstrous entity. The creaking sounds echoing within his own flesh only added to his distress. Yet, as the ambrosia's healing properties surged through his veins, his body began to repair itself, temporarily offering respite from the torment. But the relief was short-lived, as the pain soon resurfaced, a cruel cycle that trapped him in a never-ending cycle of suffering. The healing powers of the ambrosia, intended to be a boon, had become a curse. Reiji screamed incoherently, repeatedly slamming his head against the unforgiving wall in a futile attempt to escape the unrelenting agony. But the pain showed no mercy, refusing to subside. Gradually, Reiji's body underwent a transformation, undergoing a metamorphosis induced by relentless pain. The once black locks of his distinctly Korean hair lost their color, slowly turning a ghostly white. His muscles and bones grew, giving him a more toned and formidable appearance. Unbeknownst to him, crimson veins coursed through his body, a testament to the transformed mana within. This phenomenon of overcompensation, reminiscent of the body's response to muscle training, pushed Reiji's physical limits. Each cycle of destruction and repair forced his body to evolve at an unnatural pace, akin to a rebirth. His frail human form was forcibly molded into something stronger, each agonizing scream becoming a herald of his transformation. Finally, the searing pain receded, leaving Reiji slumped on the ground. His once dark hair was now a snowy white, and beneath his garments, a mix of amethyst and black veins pulsated with mana's sinister energy, marking the irreversible changes that had taken hold. Gradually lifting himself from the ground, Reiji flexed his fists, reassuring himself of his survival. With a wry smile, he muttered, In hindsight, I wasn't supposed to consume monster meat. How foolish of me. But then again, I wouldn't have lasted much longer without food. Exhaustion weighed heavily upon him, and he couldn't help but display a self-deprecating smile. His once insatiable hunger had subsided, and the agonizing pain that had plagued his body was now a distant memory. For the first time in what seemed like an eternity, Reiji experienced a sense of freedom from suffering. Surprisingly, his body felt light and brimming with power. Despite the mental exhaustion caused by the constant torment, he felt a profound sense of well-being. His gaze shifted to his arm, then down to his stomach, revealing prominently sculpted muscles. Though still lean, his physique appeared more compact and defined. Moreover, he had undergone a noticeable growth spurt. Standing at an original height of 5 feet 8 inches feet, he now towered at 6 feet 1 inch foot. What has happened to my body? I feel. Different, Reiji pondered aloud. It wasn't merely a physical transformation there was an unfamiliar sensation permeating his being. It was a peculiar blend of warmth and coldness, defying description. When he focused his attention, a mixture of dark and amethyst veins would surface on his arm. 
Interesting, Reiji remarked, his gaze fixated on the enigmatic veins. Retrieving his status plate from his pocket, Reiji carefully examined it for any signs of change. Recent status. Name Reiji Sukahiro Age, 17 male level, 9. Strength, 390. Vitality, 280. Defense, 270. Agility, 370. Magic, 560. Magic Defense, 560. Skills, Language Comprehension, Physical Resistance, Dark Magic Efficiency, Spear Proficiency, Darkness Affinity, Darkness Manipulation, Spell Melding, Increased Mana Recovery, Stealth. Image Composition, Necromancy, Shadow Manipulation, Detect Presence, Detect Magic, Dark Lord's Hockey, Mana Manipulation, Tri-Elemental Affinities, Iron Stomach, Lightning Field. The newfound skills and substantial surge in stats were undeniably a pleasant surprise, but it paled in comparison to the gift bestowed upon him by that enigmatic entity. A gleeful grin spread across Reiji's face as he meticulously examined the information presented before him. Spell melding, he mused, his voice laced with excitement. What a truly extraordinary gift bestowed upon me. Chapter 25 Satiated, Reiji immersed himself in exploring his enhanced abilities and the profound changes to his appearance. His skills displayed an unprecedented rate of growth, surpassing even his highest expectations. As he delved deeper, he noticed alterations in some of his existing skills, accompanied by the emergence of new derivative abilities. However, for now, let's shift our focus to Reiji's transformed physique and appearance. The consumption of the monster meat triggered rapid cellular reconstruction within Reiji's body, resulting in remarkable effects that sculpted his muscles and bestowed upon him a more defined and resilient physique. His body gained enhanced strength, while his speed and senses soared to new heights. Moreover, his mana underwent significant augmentation, becoming even more potent and malleable, empowering him to wield it with greater proficiency. However, Reiji found one aspect of his transformation displeasing Gi's hair color. As a master of shadows and darkness, the contrast of his white hair seemed contradictory. Nevertheless, he couldn't deny that it gave him a certain allure and added to his overall appearance. Undeterred, Reiji utilized his mastery over magic to alter the color of his hair. Despite the genetic changes resulting from his transformation, Reiji successfully darkened his hair to a deep shade of black. Although the transformation wasn't flawless, it brought him a sense of comfort and satisfaction. Now, let's shift our attention to the newfound abilities that Reiji acquired through consuming the monster meat. While they may not have been overwhelmingly powerful, these skills possessed their own practicality. One skill, Iron Stomach, granted Reiji the capacity to withstand any potential side effects of consuming monster meat. This skill played a crucial role in facilitating the mutation of his body, allowing it to adapt to the unique properties of the meat. It's worth noting that if the strength and abilities of the consumed monster equal or surpass those of Reiji, he will inherit the power and skills of the consumed monster. He had also gained lightning field, but soon realized its limited practical use. Unlike the twin-tailed wolves, who could effortlessly expel lightning, Reiji already possessed a natural affinity for lightning that was far more versatile and controllable. Lastly, there was the boon bestowed upon Reiji by the enigmatic entity, Spell Melding. The name itself provides a clear indication of its nature, but it's worth explaining nonetheless. Essentially, spell melding enables the fusion of two different types of magic. To illustrate its application, one could combine a wind spell with an ice spell to conjure a powerful blizzard. This newfound ability opened up a realm of possibilities for Reiji, allowing him to unleash devastating and unpredictable combinations of magic. Reiji stood outside, his spear firmly gripped in his hand, ready to engage in a fierce battle. Before him, a kickmaster rabbit hovered in the air, its agile movements indicating its formidable nature. With a swift motion, it unleashed a flurry of kicks, aiming to strike Reiji with precision. The creature before him resembled a colossal ball of pure white fur, akin to a rabbit. Despite its outwardly innocent appearance, it surpassed the proportions of a typical bunny, reaching the size of a large dog. Its most striking feature was its robust hind legs, which exuded an aura of strength and agility. Moreover, dark crimson veins pulsed with malevolent mana, tracing a sinuous path along its body. 
Keeping his gaze fixed on the beast, Reiji deftly evaded each attack, a mix of intrigue and amusement flickering in his eyes. The bunny's onslaught was swift, but with his enhanced senses, their movements appeared sluggish. With crimson gleams in their eyes, the bunnies leaped into the air once more, prompting Reiji to swiftly swing his spear in a horizontal slash, aiming to sidestep their assault. Much to his surprise, the beast generated a small barrier, resembling a compressed plate of air beneath its feet. Using this as a foothold, it launched itself into the air with even greater force, effortlessly evading Reiji's attack. Interesting, Reiji murmured under his breath, a malevolent smile curling upon his lips. With swift deftness, he returned his spear to his side and extended his hand toward the airborne bunny. The shadows on the ceiling shimmered and rippled as if infused with a sentient presence. With a fierce clench of his fists, Reiji unleashed the shadows, propelling them forward in a swift and merciless assault. The tendrils of darkness surged towards the unsuspecting bunny, catching it off guard. Shadow Descent, Crimson Rain In a horrifying spectacle, the razor-sharp edges of the tendrils pierced the creature from all sides, impaling it with ruthless precision. Blood spurted forth, staining the air with a macabre crimson hue, while chunks of flesh were torn asunder, propelled through the air in a gruesome display. The once vibrant eyes of the bunny turned lifeless, their spark extinguished, as its limp form dangled in the air, suspended only by the sinister grip of the tendrils. Veins protruded from the broken body, a grotesque testament to the violence inflicted upon it, serving as a grim reminder of its merciless demise. As Reiji unclenched his fists, the tendrils of darkness slowly receded, sinking back into the shadows from which they came. The lifeless body of the Kickmaster Rabbit fell to the ground with a sickening thud, its broken form sprawled motionless. Reiji stood there, his gaze fixed upon the lifeless creature, a mixture of satisfaction and detachment in his eyes. The crimson rain that had surrounded the bunny dissipated, leaving behind a trail of carnage and a lingering sense of dread. The surroundings returned to a semblance of calm, the echoes of battle fading away. Walking up to the monster, Reiji picked it up before heading back to his burrow. Man, even rabbit meat tastes awful, Reiji muttered to himself, disdain evident in his voice as he nonchalantly tossed the bone aside. Now then, it's time to assess how consuming the bunny meat has affected my stats. Name, Reiji Sukahiro Age, 17 Gender, Male Level, 12. Strength, 450. Vitality, 390. Defense, 350. Agility, 450. Magic, 620. Magic Defense, 620. Skills, Language Comprehension Physical Resistance Dark Magic Efficiency Spear Proficiency Darkness Affinity Darkness Manipulation Spell Melding Increased Mana Recovery Stealth Image Composition Necromancy Shadow Manipulation Detect Presence Detect Magic Dark Lords Hockey Mana Manipulation Try Elemental Affinities Iron Stomach Lightning Field Air Dance It seems these monsters are becoming too weak to further enhance my stats. If I continue to rely on them, my progress will stagnate. It's high time I ventured to the lower floors in search of stronger adversaries, Reiji contemplated aloud. But before that, I must familiarize myself with these newfound abilities. There's something undeniably alluring about hovering mid-air and unleashing destruction upon everything below, Reiji mused with a hint of amusement in his voice. And so, Reiji redoubled his efforts and trained with even greater intensity than before. A swift and shadowy figure streaked through the labyrinth's corridors, moving so rapidly that he blurred into a mere phantom. It was none other than Reiji, a master of air dance, who had perfected the technique to an unparalleled level of skill. Utilizing his newfound ability, supersonic step, he propelled himself off the walls with lightning speed. At times, he conjured ephemeral footholds in mid-air using aerodynamic, aiding his agile navigation through the treacherous passages of the labyrinth. With unwavering determination, Reiji raced forward, his heart set on finding the exit. However, his journey was abruptly interrupted by a bloodthirsty pack of twin-tailed wolves. Without a hint of fear, he confronted the ferocious creatures head-on. One of the wolves lunged at him, baring its fangs and extending its claws. Yet, Reiji remained composed, effortlessly springing into the air and executing a graceful mid-air somersault. Infusing his spear with an ominous energy, he swung it in a wide vertical arc. 
The malevolent power surged through the weapon, materializing as a sinister crescent moon that cleaved through the twin-tailed wolf's body with ruthless precision, severing it in two. Witnessing the brutal demise of their comrade, the remaining twin-tailed wolves hesitated momentarily, paralyzed by fear. In that fleeting moment, Reiji's eyes glimmered with a predatory glint as he prepared to unleash further devastation upon his adversaries. With a swift motion, Reiji extended his hand towards the pack of twin-tailed wolves, summoning a surge of electricity that crackled through the air. The ambient energy swirled around them, coalescing into a vortex of electrifying power. Sparks and bolts of lightning leaped from Reiji's fingertips, dancing with untamed and dangerous intensity. In an instant, he thrust his hands forward, unleashing a torrential blast of lightning that erupted from his fingertips with a deafening roar. The discharge tore through the air, leaving behind a trail of luminous brilliance. It streaked towards the approaching herd of wolves, engulfing them in its electrifying embrace. Writhing like serpents made of pure electricity, the bolts of power wrapped around their targets, overwhelming them with their unstoppable force. Utilizing the unique ability of spell melding, Reiji gathered a mass of fire magic, intertwining it with the electrical onslaught. The fusion of spells ignited a cataclysmic explosion, engulfing the labyrinth in a blinding inferno. The intense heat and destructive force consumed everything in its path. The once dominant pack of twin tailed wolves was reduced to smoldering remnants, their bodies torn asunder and charred beyond recognition. The labyrinth itself quaked under the impact, groaning as the blast illuminated the once darkened expanse. In the aftermath of the devastating display, silence fell upon the chamber, punctuated only by the crackling of dying embers and the fading echoes of the labyrinth's tremor. Without a moment's hesitation, Reiji continued his relentless sprint, leaving behind the fallen wolves in his wake. As he pressed on, his path was marked by the lifeless bodies of kickmaster rabbits and twin-tailed wolves that dared to cross his way. After a considerable stretch of time, Reiji's keen eyes caught sight of his long-awaited exit. However, his anticipation was short-lived, for his path was obstructed by a hulking monster that had eluded him thus far. This creature was unlike anything he had encountered on the floor. Towering over two meters in height, it possessed a coat of white fur, similar to the other creatures in the vicinity. Dark red mana coursed through its veins, adding an ominous aura to its imposing figure. Resembling a bear in some aspects, the creature exhibited a distinct feature, massive forearms that extended all the way to its feet, each armed with wickedly sharp claws measuring over 30 centimeters in length. This formidable adversary was none other than the claw bear. To complicate matters further, the claw bear was engaged in a fierce battle with a pack of twin-tailed wolves, including the one that had earlier attempted to flee from Reiji's presence. Gracefully landing on the nearby floor, Reiji observed the unfolding battle with an impassive expression. Despite the sheer numerical advantage of the twin-tailed wolves, it became apparent that the claw bear possessed unparalleled strength and durability. Its power was matched only by its mastery of magic, demonstrated by the creation of pressurized wind blades capable of slicing through the wolves' resilient hides. Reiji couldn't help but grin as he observed the fierce confrontation unfolding before him. This formidable creature, the claw bear, possessed strength and magical prowess that surpassed anything he had encountered on this floor thus far. It was a beast he had yet to devour, and its power intrigued him greatly. His eyes shifted between the imposing bear and the scar-faced alpha wolf leading the pack of twin-tailed wolves. A faint mutter escaped his lips, barely audible amidst the chaos of battle. I have plans for both of them. With a surge of excitement coursing through his veins, Reiji sprang into action. He propelled himself into the air, his body defying gravity as he gracefully landed on an ethereal foothold conjured by his mastery of aerodynamic. From this vantage point, he gazed down upon the chaotic battlefield, a sinister grin slowly spreading across his face. Cracking his finger joints with an audible pop, Reiji reveled in the anticipation of what was to come. Extending his hand, a mesmerizing glimmer of purple and black radiated through the dim surroundings, capturing the attention of both monsters and the surrounding darkness. The intense illumination grew in brilliance, forming a swirling sphere of ominous hues. In a fraction of a second, the sphere surged forward, fragmenting into smaller spheres that unleashed their devastating power without discrimination. The onslaught swept through the immediate vicinity, leaving nothing but destruction in its wake. 
the deafening sound of explosions echoed through the air, accompanied by the sickening cries of destruction. The unleashed force tore through the environment with merciless fury, leaving a trail of devastation in its wake. The monsters, caught in the maelstrom of violence, became hapless victims of the carnage. Their bodies were torn asunder, dismembered by the savage power that engulfed them. Limbs and entrails scattered across the battlefield, painting a gruesome picture of the relentless assault. The wolves, once formidable adversaries, were now lifeless carcasses, their once vibrant fur stained with blood and shredded flesh. The air reeked of death, a foul odor mingling with the acrid scent of burnt fur and singed flesh. Even the formidable claw bear, known for its resilience, could not escape the merciless wrath. Its massive forearms, intended for defense, offered little protection against the onslaught. Deep gashes marred its once powerful physique, revealing torn muscle and burnt fur. As the dust gradually settled, Reiji touched down on the floor with an eerie calmness. His steps carried him closer to the wounded and weary claw bear, a cruel grin playing on his lips. It seems you have truly earned your reputation as the strongest, Reiji stated calmly, his gaze meeting the intense eyes of the claw bear, devoid of any trace of fear. But your reign ends here. If you wish to avoid your demise, I suggest you unleash all of your strength. Otherwise. With a fluid motion, Reiji twirled his spear around his body, assuming a confident stance infused with the power of his Dark Lord's hockey. A cold, malevolent gaze settled upon Reiji's face as he delivered his chilling proclamation, I'll kill you. A sinister smirk crept across his lips, betraying the sadistic delight he took in the impending confrontation. Responding to Reiji's provocation, the wounded claw bear rose on its hind legs, towering menacingly before him. Its crimson eyes burned with fierce defiance, unyielding in the face of Reiji's Dark Lord's hockey. Grau. Chapter 26 As Reiji's commanding voice reverberated through the blood-stained air, a profound silence fell upon the battlefield. The fallen claw bear, its once mighty form marred by wounds and destruction, lay motionless amidst the scene of carnage. In that fleeting moment, the atmosphere grew heavy with anticipation. The air crackled with arcane energy, like a gathering storm on the horizon. Shadows, thick and all-encompassing, slithered and coiled around the bear's lifeless body, embracing it with an ethereal touch. The very essence of darkness seemed to respond to Reiji's command, lending its power to the transformation about to unfold. A surge of pulsating darkness coursed through the creature's veins, breathing new life into its battered form. The once hulking bear began to change, undergoing a metamorphosis that defied the boundaries of nature. Its massive physique retained its imposing strength, but now it bore the unmistakable mark of the shadows. The elongated forelimbs, reminiscent of a bear's strength, crackled with supernatural power. Digits, once ordinary in size, stretched into elongated appendages, each adorned with razor-sharp claws that measured over 30 centimeters in length. Gleaming obsidian talons glinted with a malevolent shimmer, yearning to rend flesh and bone with unmatched precision. A strange luminescence, like a whispered secret from the void, emanated from the creature's transformed fur. The once muted coat now shimmered with an iridescent obsidian sheen, as if it were a living embodiment of the night sky itself. Ethereal hues of amethyst danced along its surface, casting a mesmerizing glow that pulsed with an otherworldly radiance. The bear's eyes, once filled with untamed ferocity, blazed with a penetrating amethyst light. The vibrant radiance, a reflection of the mystical forces that surged through its being, seemed to pierce the very fabric of reality. They held wisdom beyond the mundane, a deep connection to the secrets of the shadows. With a grace that defied its monstrous nature, the formidable claw bear, reborn as a shadow soldier, bowed before Reiji. Its towering figure knelt, a gesture denoting unwavering loyalty and utmost reverence. Normal Grade, Claw Bear LV, 3. A wide grin of satisfaction spread across Reiji's face, and he released a sigh of relief that echoed through the eerie silence. It would have been truly embarrassing if this skill had failed, he admitted to himself, his voice laced with a mix of amusement and self-assurance. Shadow Extraction it was a skill that Reiji had acquired during his recent level up, a result of fusing his proficiency in necromancy with his mastery of shadow manipulation. This newly developed skill allowed Reiji to summon what he referred to as shadow soldiers, entities crafted from the merging of darkness and death. 
Yet, like any skill, it had its share of strengths and weaknesses, owing to its intricate and distinctive nature. The power of shadow extraction bestowed upon Reiji the ability to resurrect deceased beings as formidable shadow soldiers. Activation of this skill required the utterance of a specific keyword and remarkably, it did not consume any mana, allowing for its usage without restraint. Moreover, the range of its application was expansive, permitting the extraction of numerous shadows simultaneously, thereby enabling the formation of a substantial shadow army under the user's command. However, alongside its impressive capabilities, shadow extraction possessed a set of inherent weaknesses. Foremost, it relied on the extraction of mana to construct a shadow body, rendering it ineffective on targets who did not emanate mana during their living state, such as ordinary humans. Furthermore, mana gradually dissipated from the target's remains over time, imposing a limited window of opportunity for successful extraction after their demise. Additionally, the effectiveness of shadow extraction was restricted when employed against adversaries significantly more powerful than the user. The skill's potency waned in the face of overwhelming strength, making it challenging to extract shadows from such formidable individuals. Lastly, the number of times shadow extraction could be utilized on a single target was limited to three. Once this quota had been exhausted, the user's capacity to extract shadows from that particular source would be permanently depleted, emphasizing the importance of strategic planning and selective utilization. Reiji's gaze shifted toward the pack of twin-tailed wolves that had been patiently observing the previous events. The air thickened once again as his commanding voice echoed through the battlefield. Arise. As if responding to an unseen command, the shadows enshrouding the lifeless wolf corpses stirred with newfound vigor. In a mesmerizing display, the once motionless bodies of the wolves began to convulse, their forms engulfed by the encroaching darkness. From within the depths of the shadows, figures emerged, bearing an eerie resemblance to the fallen wolves. Their fur, once vibrant and untamed, now possessed an ethereal shade of midnight, a haunting reflection of the abyssal depths. The twin tails, once symbols of their former lives, now writhed with otherworldly grace, their movements akin to serpents dancing in the darkness. Eyes, brimming with an otherworldly glow, peered out from beneath the shadowed visages, gleaming with an untamed hunger for battle. Normal Grade, Twin-Tailed Wolves LV, 1-2 The newly manifested Twin-Tailed Wolf Shadow Soldiers stood in perfect formation, their bodies exuding an aura of unyielding loyalty. With a unified motion, they bowed their heads in acknowledgement of their new master, Reiji. At the forefront, the Claw Bear and the Twin-Tailed Wolf with the distinctive scar on its face knelt before Reiji, displaying their unwavering loyalty towards him. Reiji's gaze swept over his total of eight shadow soldiers, and a grin of anticipation formed on his face. Take good care of me, he uttered with a mix of excitement and confidence. One by one, the shadow soldiers obediently merged with Reiji's own shadow, their forms dissipating into wisps of darkness. As each shadow disappeared, Reiji could feel their presence merging with his own. What a convenient skill to have walking around with an army of shadow soldiers would bring too much attention to me if I hadn't had this ability, Reiji muttered in relief. In addition to the acquired skill of shadow extraction, Reiji had unlocked another ability called Save Shadow. The name itself hinted at its purpose, but a more detailed explanation was necessary. Through this skill, Reiji had the power to store specific shadows within his own, allowing him to summon and reabsorb them at will. However, this skill had its limitations. With his business on this level of the labyrinth concluded, Reiji made his way back to his burrow. Gathering his belongings and arranging them neatly in a makeshift rucksack fashion from the fur of the twin-tailed wolves and string made from his clothing. Ensuring the safety of the precious divinity stone nestled in his luggage, he hastened towards the exit he had discovered amidst the remnants of his battle with the claw bear. Reiji stood at the entrance of the staircase, eyeing the path that lay ahead. Unlike the previous levels of the labyrinth, this staircase resembled more of a bumpy slope than a proper staircase. It lacked the comforting green glowstone lighting, shrouding the descent in darkness and creating an ominous atmosphere. Undeterred by the foreboding darkness, Reiji wore a fearless grin, scoffing at the idea of being intimidated by mere shadows. This was his domain, his playground, and he had no intention of backing down. With confident determination, he boldly stepped into the darkness, unfazed by the unknown that awaited him. 
As Reiji descended, the darkness closed in, enveloping him in its impenetrable veil. On previous floors, soft glow stones had provided a faint but comforting illumination. However, Reiji was an exception to the rule. His innate power over darkness granted him natural night vision, allowing him to navigate the pitch black surroundings with ease. Soon, he spotted a glint in the darkness, deep within the passageway. His senses heightened, and he remained cautious. Moving cautiously, Reiji sensed an unsettling presence approaching from his left side. Reacting swiftly, he leaped to the side, narrowly evading the danger that lurked. Extending his left hand towards the source of the ominous feeling, he uttered a single word, Thunderbolt. Crackling electricity surged within Reiji's hand, illuminating the surrounding darkness with a dazzling radiance. In that brilliant flash, a massive two-meter-long gray lizard came into view, its scales glistening under the sudden burst of light. Its piercing golden eyes locked onto Reiji, challenging him silently. Without hesitation, Reiji unleashed the thunderous force of the lightning bolt, directing its power toward the formidable lizard. Unexpectedly, the creature's eyes flashed with blinding brilliance, accompanied by a sharp cracking sound. Reiji's hand began to undergo a petrification process, transforming into solid stone. Reacting promptly, he swiftly consumed ambrosia from his container, hoping for a positive outcome. As anticipated, the petrification halted its progress, gradually reversing its effects down his left arm. The thunderbolt struck the basilisk with unrelenting force, creating a devastating explosion that tore through its torso. The impact was gruesome, leaving a gaping, charred cavity in its wake. Blood and entrails splattered in all directions, mingling with the acrid scent of burnt flesh. The basilisk, roaring in agony, lost its grip on the wall and plummeted to the ground below, lifeless. Satisfied that the basilisk posed no further threat, Reiji swiftly dissected its carcass, salvaging what he could before continuing his search. As he encountered and vanquished more adversaries, he eventually found the stairs leading to the next floor. Without hesitation, he descended further into the depths. To his dismay, the new floor resembled a massive swamp, with the ground being a sticky tar-like substance. Each step proved arduous as his legs sank into the mire, impeding his movement. Frowning at the difficulty, Reiji sought higher ground, clambering up a jutting boulder. From there, he activated his aerodynamic ability, propelling himself through the air to navigate the treacherous terrain. Pressing forward, Reiji remained vigilant, meticulously observing his surroundings. The bubbling tar beneath his feet caught his attention, prompting him to make a swift decision. He realized the inherent danger of employing fire or thunder-based attacks in this environment, as they would trigger an explosive reaction, negating the healing properties of ambrosia. It doesn't matter if I can't utilize fire or thunder. The power of ice, shadows, darkness, and my loyal soldiers will suffice. Even my close combat skills are more than enough. All that matters is victory, Reiji muttered to himself, resolute as he pressed onward. Eventually, he reached a fork in the path, marking the wall before proceeding down the left-hand route. However, before he could move forward, a monstrous shark-like creature emerged from the tar, its mouth lined with countless rows of razor-sharp teeth. With lightning speed, it lunged toward Reiji, aiming for a devastating bite. Reacting swiftly, Reiji skillfully evaded the imminent danger, executing a nimble cartwheel to create distance. Spear firmly grasped he poised himself for the inevitable clash, his gaze locked on the creature, waiting for its reappearance. I couldn't detect it, despite constantly employing sense presence, Reiji mused, frustration evident in his voice. Seems like this one possesses an ability to conceal its presence, something I neither require nor desire. Planting the butt of his spear firmly on the ground, Reiji closed his eyes and invoked the power of ice. An icy aura swiftly enveloped him, spreading to the surrounding area. Just as the monstrous creature spotted an opening in Reiji's stance and lunged, its jaws wide open, it abruptly found itself frozen in place. As Reiji uttered the words icy tundra, a frigid transformation swept across the surroundings. The once murky and sticky tar floor became coated in a layer of frost, and small snowflakes descended gently from the ceiling, adding an ethereal touch to the scene. However, the intense heat from the bubbling tar proved too much for the ice to withstand. Steam rose as the ice over the seething tar began to boil, 
creating an eerie combination of freezing cold and scalding heat. With each step, Reiji's feet crunched against the icy ground, the sound echoing in the frozen chamber. He approached the tar shark, its frozen form looming before him. Retrieving his container of ambrosia, he took a gulp, rejuvenating his mana. Releasing a contented sigh, Reiji clanked the ice encasing the tar shark, causing it to fracture into multiple jagged pieces. He carefully stowed the remaining meat into his bag before continuing his search. Reiji's conquest of the labyrinth pressed on. Chapter 27 Patreon Camaros Lord With a thunderous roar that reverberated through the air, the claw bear lunged at Reiji with unrelenting fury. The ground quaked beneath the sheer force of its charge, its colossal legs pounding the corridor in a display of awe-inspiring power. Ha ha ha. That's right. If you don't want to meet your demise, then fight back. Despite the foreboding presence of the oncoming claw bear, its massive form bearing down on him, Reiji's smirk remained unyielding. With deft precision, Reiji twirled his spear in a rapid succession of elegant movements. His muscles tensed, ready to spring into action as he charged toward the towering claw bear with blinding speed. Leaping into the air, Reiji maximized the potential of his aerodynamic skill. With each bound, he propelled himself from platform to platform in a swift and zigzagging pattern, closing in on the imposing claw bear. The crackling surge of mana enveloped his spear as he infused it with his potent energy. In a seamless motion, he swung the weapon in a wide vertical arc, releasing the energy in a crescent moon, maintaining his momentum while aiming for a decisive strike against the claw bear. Despite Reiji's precise aim at the claw bear's torso, the massive creature defied expectations by rolling to the side with surprising agility, even in the midst of its relentless charge. The sheer speed of such a colossal beast was incongruous, defying logic. In a thunderous display of power, the claw bear closed in on Reiji, extending one of its colossal claws in a sweeping motion. The edges of its claws appeared distorted, giving them an eerie and menacing appearance as they descended. Recalling the claw bear's previous battle with the twin-tailed wolves, Reiji quickly created a platform in front of him and propelled himself backward with all his strength. Just as he had anticipated, the bear's colossal claw swiped through the space he had just occupied, accompanied by a violent gust of wind. A wince escaped Reiji's lips as he felt the sting of shallow cuts forming on his chest. The speed of his charge had hindered his ability to dodge completely. Infuriated that its prey had escaped and scathed, the claw bear roared in anger and effortlessly unleashed a second swipe. In the blink of an eye, another set of deadly wind blades descended upon Reiji. You're surprisingly nimble for someone of your size, he commented with a hint of amusement. Reacting effortlessly, he employed his aerodynamic ability, soaring into the air while simultaneously casting an ice spell. Reiji's hand sliced through the air with a graceful and determined gesture, his mana surging through his veins. A chilling aura materialized, cloaking his outstretched hand in a shimmering frost. With unwavering focus, he released his power, his voice resounding with authority, icy stone edge. In an explosion of icy brilliance, towering pillars of ice burst forth from the earth, hurtling towards the formidable claw bear with unparalleled swiftness and unerring accuracy. In an instant, the claw bear defied the laws of inertia, effortlessly changing its trajectory upon catching sight of the red flash emitted by Donner. The beast's ability to pivot effortlessly, utilizing its claws as fulcrums, left deep ruts etched into the ground. Reiji's keen observation revealed the bear's exceptional intelligence and agility, surpassing that of a typical creature. A thunderous roar reverberated through the air as the claw bear swung its formidable foreclaws in a cross-like motion, targeting Reiji who remained suspended in the air. Alarms blared inside Reiji's mind, alerting him to the imminent danger. Without a moment's hesitation, he activated both aerodynamic and supersonic step simultaneously, propelling himself away from the impending strike. Reacting quickly, Reiji contorted his body mid-air, narrowly evading the gust of wind that grazed past his thigh. Moments later, the wall behind him displayed a crisscross pattern of furrows, evidence of the bear's power. A sinister glimmer sparked in Reiji's eyes, accompanied by a sadistic smile that crept upon his face. With a rapid twirl of his spear, he infused it with a potent combination of kinetic energy and mana. In a fluid motion, he expelled the charged spear in two wide arcs aimed directly at the charging bear. 
Despite its unnatural agility, the claw bear failed to completely evade both attacks. It narrowly dodged one strike, but the other found its mark, landing a blow on the bear's flank. While the attack wasn't fatal, it disrupted the bear's charging momentum, diverting it from its intended path. The interruption had momentarily halted the claw bear's onslaught of wind claws. Nevertheless, despite veering slightly off course, the massive creature continued its charge toward Reiji with the velocity of a cannonball. Sensing the imminent collision, Reiji quickly raised his spear, infusing it with potent mana as they closed in on each other. With lightning speed and precision, Reiji seamlessly slipped into the depths of the shadows, evading the set of wind blades of the claw bear. Momentarily confused by Reiji's sudden disappearance, the claw bear growled in frustration, its keen senses detecting an imminent danger lurking nearby. Instinctively, it scanned its surroundings, its eyes darting from shadow to shadow, searching for any sign of movement or threat. The air became heavy with tension as the bear's instincts kicked into overdrive, alerting it to the unseen presence that could strike at any moment. As the claw bear's gaze shifted downward, its eyes widened in alarm and disbelief. There, in its own shadow, it beheld a haunting sight a pair of pulsating, eerie, glowing amethyst eyes radiating with pure, unbridled killing intent. The piercing intensity of the stare sent shivers coursing down the beast's massive frame, triggering a surge of primal instincts that screamed of imminent peril and the urgent need to flee. In that fleeting moment of vulnerability, Reiji emerged from the shadows with his spear tightly gripped in his hand, his body contorting midair with fluid grace. With a swift and calculated motion, he swung his spear in a wide horizontal arc, unleashing the dark energy infused within it. The spear sliced through the air, giving birth to a malevolent manifestation known as the Dark Crescent Moon. This wickedly empowered projectile surged forward, its trajectory honed towards the claw bear's exposed neck, threatening to sever it from its gargantuan frame in a single, fatal strike. Despite the claw bear's initial terror and primal instincts urging it to escape, its heightened senses and paranoid state allowed it to narrowly evade the dark crescent moon. Consumed by anger and driven by fear, the claw bear channeled its mana into its massive claws, causing them to pulsate with dangerous energy. With a primal roar, it swung its claws toward Reiji, aiming to cleave through him with sheer force. However, Reiji, utilizing his momentum and enhanced aerial maneuverability, found himself positioned above the claw bear. In a split second, as the bear's deadly attack descended upon him, Reiji reacted quickly. He executed an airborne front flip, harnessing the power of kinetic energy as he gathered mana within his spear. With a resounding clash, his spear met the claw bear's mana-infused strike, creating a brilliant explosion of energy upon impact. The collision sent shockwaves rippling through the air, shaking the surrounding chamber. Smoke billowed forth from the resulting explosion, shrouding the area in a haze of obscurity. The acrid scent of burnt mana permeated the air, making it difficult for the claw bear to discern Reiji's location. Within the smoke-filled haze, the claw bear's senses heightened as it desperately sought to locate its elusive adversary. Its keen ears twitched and fluttered, straining to catch any faint sounds that would betray Reiji's presence. Its massive arms remained stiff and poised, ready to react with deadly force. Amidst the tense silence, the claw bear's ears caught a distinct sound and eerie whisper that sent a chill down its spine. It strained its senses further, trying to discern the source of the whisper. As the moments passed, the whispers grew louder, accompanied by the unsettling cracking of bones and the fluttering of running footsteps. The claw bear's primal instincts screamed at it to be cautious, to prepare for an imminent attack. Unable to pinpoint the exact location of the sounds, the beast growled in frustration, its eyes darting from one direction to another within the smoky veil. It became increasingly disoriented, the thick atmosphere playing tricks on its senses. Shrouded in a volatile blend of fear, confusion, and the lingering scent of burnt mana, the claw bear's aggression reached a crescendo. Driven by frustration and a primal need for self-preservation, the beast unleashed a relentless barrage of wind blades, their lethal edges slicing through the air with a chilling whistle. It hoped to ensnare Reiji within this tempest of razor-sharp gusts, but little did it know the depths of darkness that would soon engulf its surroundings. In response to the bear's onslaught, silhouettes of shadowy figures materialized amidst the swirling mist, their forms reminiscent of lurking human figures concealed in the abyss. 
The mist thickened, obscuring visibility and muffling sounds, yet the echo of swift footsteps reverberated through the air, betraying the presence of unseen entities. It seemed as though ethereal beings moved with unparalleled swiftness and stealth, their existence felt but their appearance was obscured by the enigmatic mist. The bear's keen instincts propelled it into a state of high alert, a primal survival response. It continued its assault, launching wave after wave of wind blades. However, the mist persisted, an ethereal shroud encroaching upon the bear's domain. Sinister tendrils of darkness extended and wove through the air, entwining with the very essence of the battlefield. As the mist drew closer, the once audible footsteps vanished, swallowed by the veil of darkness that caressed the bear's fur and veiled its sharp eyes. Suddenly, a gruesome explosion of blood erupted from the claw bear's torso, splattering the surroundings with a crimson spray. The wound carved into its flesh formed a grotesque X-shaped gash, revealing the raw, oozing meat beneath. Blood welled up from the wound, trickling down its fur in a macabre display. The assailant's intent was not to end the bear's life swiftly but to inflict pain and suffering, prolonging its torment. As the crimson droplets stained its fur, the bear's instincts ignited, surging through its primal being. Agony gripped its senses, and the creature let out a roar of anguish, its voice a symphony of pain that reverberated through the surrounding air. As the dissipating smoke unveiled Reiji's form, his presence exuded an aura of malevolence. His cold smile sent shivers down the spines of all who witnessed his arrival, and his eyes, pulsating with an amethyst glow and a swirl of darkness, held an unsettling power. Reiji's voice, dripping with a twisted sense of pleasure, pierced through the symphony of pain. Ah, dear claw bear, how delightful it is to witness your suffering, he taunted, his words resonating with a chilling echo. However, you did ask for this, no. Touching the claw mark on his bloodied armor and shirt, Reiji contemplated the wound he had sustained during their previous encounter. The claw bear had unleashed a ferocious gale of wind at point-blank range, a deadly assault that would have claimed his life if not for Reiji's utilization of lightning field and body augmentation. The thought of this near-fatal encounter fueled his sadistic smile as he declared, I am compelled to repay you for your actions. Your claws inflicted a deep gash upon my chest, and now I shall unleash a series of devastating strikes that will grant me immense satisfaction. Prepare yourself, for only four more strikes are remaining. The claw bear roared in anger, its massive form towering on its hind legs as it prepared to launch a furious attack at Reiji. But to its astonishment, as the beast lunged forward with its razor-sharp claws, Reiji vanished into thin air, leaving behind a fleeting afterimage. The bear's claws swiped through empty space, meeting nothing but the chilling wind. Reiji reappeared a short distance away, his figure flickering in and out of view with ethereal grace. With a wicked grin, he taunted, is that the best you can do? His voice echoed mockingly through the chamber, further fueling the bear's fury. The enraged claw bear shifted its attention toward Reiji's new position, its fury driving it to charge once again with renewed determination. However, before it could even take a step, Reiji unleashed the full potential of his supersonic step and aerodynamics, tapping into his maximum speed and heightened perception. With unparalleled speed and precision, Reiji closed in on the claw bear, his spear radiating a malevolent aura in his grasp. In a seamless motion, he unleashed a devastating horizontal arc, his weapon slicing through the air with a chilling swiftness. The spear cleaved through the bear's leg with a sickening crunch, severing flesh and bone in a gruesome display of violence. A guttural roar of agony tore from the bear's maw as it collapsed to the ground, its severed limb spurting dark crimson blood in a grotesque fountain. The beast thrashed and writhed, desperate to regain its footing, but the pain and shock overwhelmed its primal instincts. Its futile struggle only intensified the gruesome scene unfolding before them. Three more to go, Reiji uttered with a cold detachment, his gaze fixed upon the diminishing life force of the claw bear. The mangled body of the claw bear lay on the ground, a gruesome sight that sent shivers down the spine. Limbs were missing, and the body riddled with deep slashes, puncture wounds, and burn marks. Reiji sat next to the lifeless carcass, his expression calm and calculated as he indulged in a macabre feast, devouring one of its severed arms. As he relished the taste, Reiji meticulously examined his status, analyzing the changes and enhancements gained from the intense battle. Name, Reiji Sukahiro Age, 17 Gender, Male Level, 21. 
Strength, 530. Vitality, 440. Defense, 420. Agility, 530. Magic, 710. Magic Defense, 710. Skills, Language Comprehension Physical Resistance Dark Magic Efficiency Spear Proficiency Darkness Affinity Darkness Manipulation Spell Melding Increased Mana Recovery Stealth Image Composition Necromancy Shadow Manipulation Detect Presence Detect Magic Dark Lords Hockey Mana Manipulation Try Elemental Affinities Iron Stomach Lightning Field Air Dance Gale Claw Spitting the bone out, Ragey rose and stretched his entire body, savoring the victorious sensation coursing through his veins. With calculated steps, he approached the scene of carnage, standing before the mangled remains of the bear he had mercilessly vanquished. In a solemn and commanding tone, he uttered a single word that reverberated through the blood-stained air, dot. Arise. Chapter 28. Reiji continued his descent through the labyrinth, surpassing the fiftieth level since encountering the tar shark. Time became a blur in the labyrinth's depths, and he lost all sense of the days slipping away. Despite the treacherous nature of the dungeon, Reiji's progress was astonishing. He faced countless brushes with death, battling monstrously powerful creatures that defied belief. Among the adversaries he encountered was a massive rainbow-colored frog capable of spitting poison and a peculiarly familiar giant moth resembling Butterfree. Reiji relied on Ambrosia to survive the poisonous assault from the frog, which ravaged his nervous system and caused agony akin to his first encounter with monster meat. Using his shadows, Reiji reached his container and consumed the life-saving elixir. During his journey, Reiji acquired new shadows, the poison frog and centipede. However, the sight of the segmented centipede's attack, resembling an army of repugnant insects emerging from a loathsome kitchen, haunted him the most. To combat the overwhelming numbers, Reiji enlisted the aid of his shadows and unleashed wide-ranging attacks like lightning field and icy tundra. On a particular floor, tree-like monsters resembling RPG tree ants employed their roots for underground assaults while whipping their branches menacingly. The true threat of these faux tree ants lay in their unique ability. When cornered, they violently shook their heads, flinging crimson fruits toward their adversaries. Surprisingly, the fruit held no poison but offered a delicious, watermelon-like sweetness that surpassed Reiji's expectations. Once his craving for the fruit was satiated, the population of tray ants neared extinction. Undeterred, Reiji forged ahead, descending another fifty floors with seemingly effortless ease. Yet, the labyrinth's depths showed no sign of relenting, stretching endlessly downward. Reiji's Current Stats Name, Reiji Sukahiro Age, 17 Gender, Male Level, 31 Strength, 1030 Vitality, 1260 Defense, 1050. Agility, 1300. Magic, 1750. Magic Defense, 1750. Skills, Language Comprehension Physical Resistance Dark Magic Efficiency Spear Proficiency Darkness Affinity Darkness Manipulation Spell Melding Increased Mana Recovery Stealth Image Composition Necromancy Shadow Manipulation Detect Presence Detect Magic Dark Lords Hockey Mana Manipulation Try Elemental Affinities Iron Stomach Lightning Field Air Dance Gale Claw Poison Resistance Paralysis Resistance Petrification Resistance Reiji possessed 12 shadows out of the 50 his capacity allowed. Finding suitable monsters worth transforming into shadows had proven difficult, as they offered no usefulness, power, or intrigue. Although Reiji had discovered the stairs leading to the next floor, a location on this floor stood out as distinctly different to him. An ominous atmosphere pervaded the space around a room at the very end of one of the side passages. It contained a set of majestic double doors, each three meters tall, with a cyclops statue on each side. Intriguing, Reiji murmured as he approached the imposing doors, attempting to push them open. However, his efforts yielded no results. Undeterred, he tried an alternative approach. Placing his hand on the door, he infused it with mana, activating his lightning field ability. A sudden jolt of red lightning surged through the door, forcefully throwing back his hand. Smoke whisked up from his singed fingertips. Cursing under his breath, he swiftly consumed some ambrosia to mend his injuries. Within moments, a deep roar echoed through the room, resonating with immense power. Quickly retreating, Reiji observed in awe as the two cyclops statues came to life, 
demolishing the walls that had encased them. Their petrified skin swiftly regained its color, transitioning from gray to a dark shade of green. These cyclopes perfectly embodied the fantastical descriptions associated with them. Each wielded a colossal sword, nearly four meters in length, seemingly conjured from unknown origins. Presently, they struggled to free their lower halves from their stone prisons, driven by an unwavering determination to eradicate the unwelcome intruder. Wasting no time, Reiji's shadow expanded behind him, and his loyal shadows emerged from its depths. With a simple command of go, they sprang into action, engaging the cyclops on the right. Out of all the shadows under his command, it was only the claw bear and the scar-faced twin-tailed wolf that exhibited significant growth, reflecting their exceptional progress. Reiji couldn't help but marvel at their development. Even though these monsters possess higher levels compared to the others, I have been diligently focusing on raising the levels of all my shadows, he contemplated. Not only have they been fortified by my overall increase in strength, but also by the augmentation of my mana capacity. With my improved mana control and enhanced stats, I possess an ample reserve of mana to regenerate and further empower them. Reiji's relentless dedication to nurturing his shadows had yielded impressive results. Leading the charge was the formidable claw bear, a towering creature with a muscular frame and razor-sharp claws that left deep imprints on the ground. With unwavering determination, it lunged at the cyclops, conjuring powerful gusts of wind with each swipe of its claws, aimed at striking its target. Following closely behind the claw bear was the scar-faced twin-tailed wolf, a sleek and agile creature that moved with remarkable speed. Crackling with electrifying energy, its two magnificent tails released bolts of lightning that arced through the air with deadly accuracy. The strikes from its tails were directed at the cyclops, gracefully dancing through the air as they closed in on the creature's head. Among Reiji's formidable allies stood his newest shadow, a giant frog. Despite its imposing size, the creature exhibited remarkable agility. With its throat filled with toxic gunk, it unleashed a relentless barrage of poisonous projectiles toward the cyclops. The viscous gunk struck the cyclops eye with precision, allowing the potent toxins to swiftly infiltrate its system, wreaking havoc on its massive frame. Writhing in agony, the cyclops was temporarily paralyzed and rendered vulnerable within the wall as the poison coursed through its veins. Sensing the opportune moment, the rest of the army swiftly moved in to deliver the final blow. Displaying calculated brutality, the claw bear unleashed its gale claw technique, tearing through the air with lethal force. While the pack of twin-tailed wolves simultaneously released a synchronized lightning field, enveloping the cyclops in a torrent of electric bolts. The devastating impact struck true, targeting the cyclops' weakened eye socket and shattering it, reducing it to a grotesque mess of mangled flesh and shattered bone. The violent force caused the wall behind the cyclops to quiver, and the scene was marred by dark splatters of blood on the wall behind it. The cyclops on the left stared blankly at its now-deceased companion. Meanwhile, the fallen cyclops twitched momentarily before collapsing forward, causing the entire room to tremble as its massive frame crashed into the ground, raising a dense cloud of dust. I'm sorry, but I'm not kind enough to wait for you to break free, Reiji remarked calmly, his words laced with a hint of ruthlessness. The remaining cyclops displayed a blood-curdling expression on its face as it turned its gaze toward Reiji. Though it remained silent, its contorted features clearly screamed, How dare you, you bastard! Reiji maintained an unwavering stare, meeting the cyclops' gaze with absolute stillness. After a prolonged moment, the cyclops grew weary of the impasse and unleashed a thunderous roar before charging at Reiji. However, before it could cover even five paces, it abruptly face-planted into the ground, collapsing with a resounding thud. You two make for an interesting pair. And as such, you're going to become one of my shadows, Reiji declared, a touch of amusement in his voice. Approaching the fallen Cyclops, Reiji halted, his face mere inches away from its vacant eyes. With a deliberate gesture, he extended his hand, forming a gun-like shape with his fingers and aiming it at the Cyclops' head. Concentrated mana gathered around his fingertips as he softly muttered, bang. To his surprise, an unexpected occurrence unfolded before him. The cyclops' body emitted a brief glow, and its skin seemingly repelled the bullet that was meant to end its life. Perplexed, Reiji's eyebrows furrowed as he voiced his confusion, hmm. It didn't take him long before he realized it was his special magic. 
you're just making this all the more worth it, however don't get cocky you're still breadth my feet after all. Though it was still face down on the ground, the cyclops smirked contemptuously at him. Unfazed, he retracted his hand and aimed a kick at the cyclops' head. Thanks to his steel leg skill, Reiji's kicks were as powerful as the kickmaster rabbits had been. His foot traced a neat arc through the air before slamming into the cyclops and turning it over on its stomach. He then pressed his spear to its eye. Without being able to discern the cyclops' exact emotions, Reiji sensed a hint of panic emanating from the creature. Ignoring its distress, he focused his attention on his own actions. Coating his spear with a layer of mana, he swiftly thrust it forward, piercing through the cyclops' eye and driving it deep into its skull. Descending from the lifeless body, the shadow soldiers seamlessly merged back into Reiji's shadow. Taking a moment to catch his breath, Reiji proceeded to carve off a portion of meat from the cyclops while once again examining his status to understand its skill. Diamond skin, huh? A pretty useful ability. I believe it's time to give you a more significant role than just guarding a door for an unknown period. Arise, Reiji commanded once again, and the shadows obediently swirled around their bodies, enveloping them as they emerged from the ground. Standing tall with their swords at the ready, they knelt before Reiji, bowing their heads in reverence before finally merging back into Reiji's shadow. Turning towards the door with curiosity, Reiji carried the two fist-sized mana crystals and placed them in the designated indents. They fit perfectly, and after a brief delay, dark red mana began pouring into the magic circles. A distant snapping sound reverberated through the air, and the light in the room started to fade. Simultaneously, mana diffused through the space, causing the walls to glow with radiant light. The sudden brightness overwhelmed Reiji momentarily, but he quickly adjusted and cautiously pushed open the door, his senses on high alert for any potential traps. The room beyond the door greeted him with pitch-black darkness, devoid of any visible light sources. However, his night vision combined with the spill of light from the previous room allowed him to discern his surroundings to some extent. The interior of the room resembled the marble-like substance he had encountered in the church cathedral. Two rows of sturdy pillars stood at regular intervals, extending all the way to the end of the room. In the center stood an enormous cubic slab of rock, it is surface glossy and gleaming under the reflected light from the room behind. As Reiji's foot made a clicking sound against the pavement, a faint and hoarse voice rang out in the distance. Is anyone there? Chapter 29 Is anyone there? A faint, hoarse female voice asked. Coming to a sudden halt, Reiji's eyes widened in surprise upon hearing the unexpected voice. He hadn't anticipated encountering anyone down here in the depths of hell. Straining his eyes to pierce through the darkness, he could make out the figure of a person in the distance. The girl was trapped, her body buried in the rock up to her neck, with strands of golden blonde hair hanging lifelessly in front of her face, reminiscent of a ghost from a well-known horror movie. Despite her disheveled appearance and the obscuring veil of hair, her beauty was still evident. Reiji's surprise stiffened his posture, realizing that she was far from ordinary. The girl seemed equally astonished by his presence, her red eyes peering through the gaps in her hair with a mix of shock and disbelief. After a brief silence, he turned away, determined to leave. Sorry. I'll just leave now, he said, preparing to close the doors once more. However, before he could do so, the girl with blonde hair and red eyes called out to him with urgency. Her voice was hoarse and weak, likely from years of disuse, but the desperation in her plea was palpable. W8. Please. Help me. Reiji responded with a curt and heartless reply, don't wanna, before refocusing his attention on the doors, showing no willingness to engage further with the girl's plea. The girl's desperation persisted as she pleaded, WHY. Please. I'll do anything, so. Despite her limited mobility, she managed to raise her face to meet Reiji's gaze. However, his response remained cold and dismissive. Why would I free you? For all I know, you could be a world-level threat poised to bring destruction upon release. Your presence in the deepest pits of hell is far from ordinary. Furthermore, you were sealed and guarded with utmost caution. In this labyrinth where everything is crumbling, nothing exists apart from the seal that holds you captive. 
So, unless you have something worthwhile to say or a way to prove that you won't kill me the moment I approach you, I bid you farewell. Reiji's argument held merit. Encountering a sealed individual deep within the labyrinth, guarded by formidable creatures, and of unknown origin raised valid concerns. Regardless of the girl's outward beauty, it was a matter of practicality to ignore her plea, setting aside moral considerations. With a resolute expression, Reiji continued walking towards the doors, unfazed by the girl's desperate calls. Her pleas echoed through the chamber, filled with hopelessness and longing, but they fell on deaf ears. Reiji remained steadfast in his decision, determined not to be swayed by sentiment or unknown risks. As he reached the doors, his hand outstretched to close them, the girl's voice trembled with a last shred of desperation. No. She called out, her voice choked with a cough. I'm not a threat. Please, just wait. Reiji persisted in pulling the double doors closed, intending to shut out her pleas entirely. However, just before he could seal them shut, her words managed to reach his ears, causing him to pause. If only he had been a fraction faster, he could have avoided hearing those final words. I was betrayed. He heard, whispering through the narrow gap of the still partially open door. His hand froze in its motion, and a flicker of curiosity sparked within him. Betrayal. It was a word that held weight and stirred emotions within him. Reiji couldn't help but entertain the possibility that there might be more to this girl's story than he initially assumed. Reluctantly, he released his grip on the doors, allowing them to remain slightly ajar. Reiji scratched his head, a gesture of contemplation, as he approached the girl. Despite his decision to give her a chance, he remained vigilant, his muscles tensed beneath his clothing, ready to react to any potential threat. Shadows swirled within his shadow, a shimmering mist that added an aura of caution to his demeanor. With each step he took towards her, his senses heightened, his eyes scanning the surroundings for any signs of danger. He maintained a safe distance, not yet fully trusting her words. It was a delicate balance between curiosity and self-preservation, a testament to his experience in the treacherous depths of the labyrinth. Standing before her, Reiji maintained a guarded posture, his arms crossed, and his gaze fixed on her. There was a slight tinge of amusement and skepticism in his voice as he spoke. I suppose the saying, curiosity killed the cat, holds some truth. All right, you claim to have been betrayed, but that still doesn't explain why you find yourself in this deep corner of the labyrinth. Few can venture this far, so unless you have the desire to remain trapped here, I suggest you start providing answers to my questions. The girl seemed shocked that Reiji had actually come back. She stared fixedly at Reiji through her dirty golden locks, crimson eyes gleaming in the darkness. He began growing impatient at her continued silence. Hey, are you listening? If you don't want to talk, then I'll just head back now, he said brusquely and turned on his heel. The girl came back to her senses with a start and quickly began speaking. I am one of the original, atavistic vampires. Because of the extraordinary power I was gifted with. I worked hard for the sake of my country and my people. But then. One day. My retainers all. Said I wasn't needed anymore my uncle. Said that he would be king in my place. Was fine with that. But because I had so much power everyone was afraid of me, they thought I was dangerous. They couldn't kill me. So they decided to seal me here instead. That's why. She spoke haltingly but desperately, her parched throat making speech difficult. Hmm, Reiji hummed, contemplating the girl's story. It was clear that she had endured a cruel and unfortunate fate. However, certain aspects of her narrative sparked a nagging skepticism within him. Unable to ignore his doubts, he decided to ask them directly. Why couldn't they kill you? Reiji asked bluntly. Are you immortal by any chance or do you possess a high-level regeneration ability? The girl hesitated for a moment before responding, her voice still hoarse and weak. I heal automatically. No matter what kind of injury it is, it'll just heal by itself. Even if you cut my head off, I'll regenerate eventually. So essentially a walking cheat code, Reiji mused as he cupped his chin, his gaze still fixed on her. If what she was saying was true then Reiji himself stood no chance of killing her. Though that's a different story. 
immortal beings can still be killed and are defeatable. The way of doing so is by attacking the soul and sealing them away. So you're telling me that you were sealed here due to your people being afraid of your regeneration ability? That too, but. The main thing was that I could control mana. Directly, without a magic circle, the girl explained. Reiji nodded, absorbing her words, and replied simply, I see. The girl's ability to manipulate mana directly resonated with his own experience. Since his descent into this realm, Reiji had honed his skills in mana manipulation. However, in her case, the ability became an incredibly potent asset. While others wasted precious time preparing circles and reciting incantations, she could unleash magic effortlessly and with great power. It was evident that engaging her in combat would be a one-sided affair, given her immense advantage. Adding to her formidable abilities, she possessed immortality. Please, save me. Her soft plea filled the air, reaching Reiji's ears as he delved deep into contemplation. He remained silent, his gaze fixed upon her. Time seemed to stretch as they locked eyes, an unspoken connection forming between them. Each held a mixture of hope and uncertainty in their gazes, engaged in a silent dialogue that transcended words. Eventually, Reiji broke the prolonged silence, his hand absently scratching his head in a gesture of unease. With a deep sigh, he made a decision, his resolve taking shape. Placing his hand on the cube that held the girl captive, he asserted his intention to intervene. His mana surged through his veins, flowing into his outstretched hand as ominous darkness seeped into every crevice, marking the surroundings with its presence. He carefully avoided the girl's petrified form, ensuring that she remained untouched by the darkness he commanded. With meticulous precision, he marked every inch of the interior, infusing it with his power. Once satisfied that every part had been marked, Reiji stepped back, creating a safe distance between himself and the statue. His eyes sharpened with focus as he clenched his fist, his voice resonating with authority, shatter. As Reiji's command echoed through the chamber, his clenched fist released a surge of power. The darkness that had permeated every nook and cranny converged on the statue, enveloping it in an oppressive aura. The air crackled with anticipation as the tension reached its peak. In an instant, the statue shattered into countless fragments. The sound of shattering stones reverberated through the room, filling the space with a cacophony of destruction. As the rocky encasement crumbled and dissolved, the girl's delicate features began to emerge. First, her modest breasts came into view, followed by her slender waist, graceful hands, and shapely thighs. With each passing moment, the remaining fragments melted away, revealing her completely naked form. Despite her emancipated state, there was an undeniable allure in her physique. However, her newly liberated body lacked strength and vitality. Overwhelmed by the ordeal, she slumped to the ground, utterly exhausted. It was evident that she lacked the energy to stand on her own, her weakened form seeking respite from the arduous experience she had endured within her stony prison. Reiji carefully sat the girl down on the floor, supporting her weakened form. Taking a moment to recuperate, he drank from his container of ambrosia, replenishing his drained mana reserves. The sturdy stone that had encased her was unlike anything he had encountered before, demanding a significant amount of mana to destroy. As he brought down his container from his lips the girl put her hand over his own and grabbed it. Her small, slender, and fragile hand trembled as it intertwined with his own. Giving her a sidelong glance, Reiji noticed that she was gazing directly at him. Behind her expressionless face, her crimson eyes held a multitude of emotions. In a soft and quivering, yet powerful voice, she conveyed her gratitude, saying, Thank you. Reiji remained silent in response. He could feel his long darkened heart stirring with a faint glow. Silently, he sat there, holding her hand, pondering the length of time she must have endured in that desolate confinement. According to Reiji's knowledge, vampires had become extinct centuries ago, at least according to the history books he had perused in the royal library. The fact that she had lost the ability to speak and show emotions during her time in this solitary confinement spoke volumes about the extent of her imprisonment. What's your name? She suddenly whispered to Reiji, her voice barely audible. It's Reiji. Reiji Sukahiro. What's yours? Reiji introduced himself before asking for her name. 
He was expecting a long, regal name, but instead, she shook her head and uttered a simple request. Give me one. Reiji, in turn, simply stared at her. It wasn't difficult for him to understand her request. She wanted to leave behind her original name, her last name, and the life she had before being betrayed. She simply wished to forget and start afresh. As he gazed back at her, he could sense her anticipation. Reiji let out a sigh, racking his brain in search of a suitable name. He wasn't particularly skilled at naming things, as evident from his magic names and technique names. However, at that moment, a name popped into his mind. Reiji looked at her and, at that moment, a name came to mind. You, he said, meeting her expectant gaze. It means, moon, in my language. The moon represents darkness, night, and mystery, much like the nature of vampires. Your pale and ethereal appearance also resonates with the moon's characteristics. She blinked in surprise at his words. It appeared that she hadn't anticipated him having a specific reason behind choosing the name. While her expression remained devoid of emotion, her eyes sparkled with a glimmer of happiness. Hmm. Then, from today onwards, I shall be you. Thank you. I'm glad you like it. Anyway. Ha. Huh. As the girl, now named you, expressed her gratitude, Reiji untangled his hand from hers and removed his coat. You watched him with a hint of confusion. Here, wear this. We can't have you walking around naked forever. Oh. You instinctively accepted the offered coat and glanced down at her exposed body. Just as Reiji had pointed out, she was completely devoid of clothing. Blushing, she pressed the coat against her body and then looked up at Reiji, teasingly saying, You pervert, Reiji. Reiji glanced at her, unfazed by her remark. Oh please, don't flatter yourself. It's called being considerate. I wouldn't want you catching a cold or causing a commotion with your current attire, or lack thereof. He raised an eyebrow, a mischievous glint in his eyes. But if you prefer to keep going on naturel, I won't stop you. Just be prepared for the consequences. Yu's eyes widened slightly, realizing the implications of her remark. She quickly shook her head and blushed deeper, understanding that Reiji was just teasing her. And no, thank you. I'll gladly accept the coat, she replied with a hint of embarrassment, quickly wrapping the coat around herself for modesty. As you struggled with the coat, Reiji took a moment to drink some ambrosia, feeling a surge of strength coursing through his body. His mind sharpened, and he instinctively activated his sense presence ability to assess their surroundings. However, his senses suddenly went on high alert as he detected a powerful presence in the room. And to his astonishment, it was directly above them. Stop it, Reiji simply uttered, his voice carrying an air of authority, as his shadow extended, expelling a shadow soldier. Yo! It reverberated throughout the entire room. Chapter 30 Lifting you off the ground, Reiji swiftly hoisted her onto his shoulders, firmly grasping her hands as she dangled behind him. Their gazes aligned toward the impending clash, and her eyes widened in shock as she witnessed the confrontation between the two colossal beings. Seems like it's taken a liking to you, you, Reiji remarked, his attention fixed on the creature before them. The monstrosity stretched nearly five meters in length, boasting four arms, each ending in menacing razor-sharp scissors. Its eight clacking legs propelled it with an eerie rhythm, reminiscent of a scorpion's skittering movements. Two tails, tipped with stingers, completed its formidable appearance. Reiji suspected that the stingers contained potent venom. This creature surpassed any foe he had encountered thus far, yet a grin crept across his face, fueled by the prospect of a new ally. Nevertheless, there were several factors to consider and experiment with during this encounter, providing a valuable opportunity for observation. Reiji stole a quick glance at the girl clinging to him. Showing no signs of fear despite the intimidating scorpion's presence, her gaze fixated solely on him. Her eyes exuded tranquility, reflecting an unwavering acceptance of her destiny. In the depths of her silent gaze, a profound trust was forged, surpassing the need for words. The level of trust she bestowed upon Reiji, a complete stranger, made him question how long she had been trapped in this place. Reiji reflected, even after my downfall, it seems that positive emotions haven't entirely left me. 
He acknowledged the transformation he had undergone and felt gratitude for it. However, saving her only to abandon her now would be meaningless. Reiji shifted his focus back to the intense confrontation between the scorpion and his cyclops shadow. Taking a moment to evaluate the situation, he examined the stats of his summoned creature, which he had neglected to do earlier. Elite Grade, Cyclops Level, 1. Reiji thought to himself, not bad. Although he was the most powerful soldier he had initially reanimated, he was only slightly stronger compared to his more prominent creations like the Claw Bear and Twin-Tailed Wolf right now. It was a common occurrence for reanimated monsters to be weaker than their living counterparts. The Cyclops bellowed with fury as it charged toward the scorpion-like creature. Its massive fists swung through the air, aiming to crush its opponent with sheer force. The scorpion retaliated with lightning-fast movements, its scissors clashing against the Cyclops' thick hide. The clash of titans echoed through the chamber, each blow shaking the ground beneath them. Amidst the battle between the Cyclops and the scorpion-like creature, Yu, who had been observing the fight, couldn't contain her curiosity any longer. She turned to Reiji and asked, Reiji, what exactly is that shadow you've summoned? It's unlike anything I've ever seen before. Reiji cast a quick glance at her and responded, who knows. But that shouldn't be your concern right now. The entity's presence won't endure indefinitely. It's currently being pushed back. The Cyclops lunged at the scorpion with immense force, its massive fists swinging in a wild display of power. The scorpion, however, proved to be agile and evasive, dodging the incoming strikes with calculated precision. The clash of their titanic forms echoed through the chamber, reverberating with each collision. Blows were exchanged, each landing with a thunderous impact. The Cyclops, with its sheer size and brute strength, managed to land a few hits on the scorpion, causing gashes in its chitinous armor. But the scorpion retaliated with its venomous stingers, striking at vulnerable points on the Cyclops' body. Despite the Cyclops' resilience, the tide of the battle gradually shifted. The scorpion's agility and venomous attacks began to take their toll. The Cyclops staggered, its movements becoming sluggish as its strength waned. It fought valiantly, refusing to yield, but it was clear that its defeat was inevitable. With one final strike, the scorpion pierced through the Cyclops' chest, causing it to let out a thunderous roar of agony. The mighty creature crumbled to the ground, its body disintegrating into particles of darkness that returned to Reiji's shadow. As the dust settled, Reiji's shadow reformed, reclaiming the essence of the fallen Cyclops. Observing the scorpion, Reiji pondered over its abilities and displayed strength. Poison needles, formidable defense, decent agility, and powerful claws. A well-rounded creature with exceptional defensive capabilities. It appears to be on par with my current strength. Let's see. Hey, you, Reiji called to her, that thing's defense is tough. I'm going to need some assistance over here. Reiji. Trust in me, you whispered, her lips brushing against the nape of his neck. In a sudden act, she sank her teeth into his flesh, causing him to jolt in surprise. A tiny, sharp pain pierced his skin, followed by an inexplicable sensation of energy being drained from his body. Instinctively, he wanted to throw her to the ground, but then he remembered her earlier revelation about being a vampire. It dawned on him that she was feeding on his blood. Supporting her body, Reiji wrapped his arm around her while she drank his blood. She twitched in surprise, but soon she hugged him even tighter and buried her face into his neck. Utilizing his aerodynamic ability, Reiji took to the skies, skillfully evading the scorpion's venomous needles. With swift precision, he raised his hands toward the scorpion, causing the shadow beneath it to ripple and sway as if under his command. The amorphous darkness sharpened into wicked, blade-like appendages that extended from below, aimed directly at the creature's vulnerable underbelly. With a swift and precise thrust, the shadowy tendrils pierced through the scorpion's thick exoskeleton. The creature's piercing shriek of pain tore through the air, a chilling sound that echoed through the chamber. The scorpion writhed and convulsed, its massive form trembling with fury and agony. Its instinctual response to the attack was to retaliate with all its might. Ignoring the pain, it swiftly scuttled towards Reiji, its eight legs propelling it forward in a furious rampage. Ksha! The resounding roar of the scorpion reverberated throughout the chamber, 
causing the ground to tremble and warp under its influence. It possessed a unique form of magic, granting it control over the surrounding earth. Reacting swiftly, Reiji raised his hand, summoning a multitude of fireballs that hovered motionless above him and you. Meanwhile, the scorpion unleashed its spiked cones, aiming directly at them. The scale, strength, and offensive prowess displayed in the scorpion's manipulation of the earth surpassed anything Reiji had encountered thus far in the dungeon. Using aerodynamic once more, Reiji shot up into the air near his spell, causing the scorpion to gaze up at him, unaware of the impending danger that lurked below. Silently and swiftly, ethereal chains materialized from the shadows, snaking around the scorpion's torso and body with meticulous precision. The chains hovered in the air, their ghostly forms shimmering with an otherworldly glow. They remained still for a moment as if teasing the scorpion with their presence, before slowly starting to tighten, applying gentle pressure against the creature's exoskeleton. The scorpion, consumed by the intensity of the battle, remained oblivious to the ethereal restraints that ensnared its form. Oblivious to its impending doom, its projectiles closed in on Reiji and Yu. But with a flick of his wrist, Reiji directed his finger downwards, causing the fireballs to intensify in heat. A radiant glow emanated from the orbs, illuminating the sky and partially blinding the scorpion, impairing its sight. Seizing the opportune moment, Reiji uttered a single incantation, explosive scattershot. With those words, the unleashed spell surged forth, heralding a cascade of explosive energy aimed directly at the scorpion. Instincts raging, the scorpion swiftly recognized the immense threat posed by the impending attack. With the intention of erecting a resilient earth wall to mitigate the impact, it found itself abruptly immobilized, pressed forcefully against the ground. A cloud of dust billowed as the creature thrashed about in a desperate bid for freedom. Gripping the chain tightly, Reiji exerted an additional surge of mana into it. Through clenched teeth, he uttered, it's proving more resilient than anticipated. Glancing quickly at the petite figure perched on his back, Reiji inquired, You, are you almost finished? The situation has become more precarious than I initially thought. The creature has revealed its hidden ability, although it seems to be passive. It absorbs my mana, strengthening its durability. The chains are weakening, and once I launch my attack, they will break, giving it some respite. You gently withdrew her fangs from Reiji's neck, her flushed face exuding a seductive aura as she sensually licked her lips, removing the last traces of blood. Despite her youthful appearance, her gesture and flushed complexion emitted a captivating allure. Within moments, her previously emaciated body transformed into a picture of health, radiating vitality. Her once pale, porcelain skin now glowed with newfound radiance. Rosy pink hues adorned her once gaunt cheeks, and a warm, gentle light resided within her crimson eyes as she tenderly caressed Reiji's cheek with her slender hand. Thank you for the meal. Descending to the ground, you rose to her feet and prepared to unleash her spell upon the scorpion creature. Hold on, hold on, Reiji interjected, halting her before she could cast her spell. You can launch it right after, but let me deliver a decisive blow first. It won't take long. Confusion etched across Yu's face as she questioned, I saw your spell earlier, but I don't see it now. Did it fail, or is that chain your spell? Without a word, Reiji lifted his hand before you, counting down from three to one with each finger gradually closing until his fist clenched, signaling zero. In an instant, a resounding explosion shook the chamber, accompanied by the scorpion's agonized screech. The initial impact was swiftly followed by a barrage of explosions, creating a symphony of fiery bursts and dazzling flashes of light. I guess the saying, an explosion is an art, isn't far from the truth, Reiji murmured to himself as he observed the chains dissipating into nothingness. Turning to you, he continued, you can unleash your spell now. Just hold on for a few more seconds. Albeit confused by the sudden appearance of the spell, you nodded, her expression resolute and unwavering. She focused her mana, her hands radiating a soft, ethereal glow. At that moment, an immense quantity of golden-colored mana surged forth from her petite frame. Enveloped in a magnificent golden radiance, her lustrous hair billowing around her, you uttered a single phrase, Azure Blaze. Instantly, a colossal blue-white fireball, measuring at least six or seven meters in diameter, materialized directly above the scorpion's head. Despite not achieving a direct hit, 
the fireball inflicted substantial damage, causing the beast to recoil and emit agonized screeches. However, the vampire princess of the abyss refused to let it escape. Extending her elegant finger, she wielded it like a conductor's baton, guiding the fireball with precision. The blazing sphere dutifully pursued the retreating scorpion, crashing into its form. Gagya. The creature let out a shrill cry, a sound that Reiji had not heard in quite some time. The scorpion visibly suffered under the onslaught. As the fireball collided with its target, the entire chamber was engulfed in a blinding white light, momentarily stealing away everyone's vision. Reiji shielded his eyes with his arm, marveling at the awe-inspiring spectacle of magic. Gradually, the enchantment subsided, and the pale blue fireball vanished into thin air. As the flames dissipated, Reiji's gaze fell upon the scorpion, now convulsing in agonizing pain. Its shell pulsated with an angry red hue, and he noticed that certain parts had fused together due to the intense heat. In awe, he couldn't help but ponder the implications if they were to become adversaries. Her unmatched proficiency and formidable firepower in magic far surpassed his own. Despite his ability to inflict some damage on the monster, it paled in comparison to her prowess. Taking into account the scorpion's augmented state from absorbing Reiji's mana, it was evident that she held the advantage in a magical confrontation. Overall, Reiji harbored doubts about his chances of emerging victorious in such a scenario. Coming out of his reverie, Reiji's attention was drawn to a soft thumping sound. He turned his gaze away from the spectacle to find you slumped on the ground, her breathing labored. It was apparent that she had exhausted all of her mana. You, are you all right? Reiji asked. Nodding weakly, she responded between breaths, mm. Just. Very tired. Grinning, Reiji grabbed his spear and swung it over his shoulder as he replied, Well then, once I'm done here, let's make our way out. For now, just rest. It won't take too long, I assure you. Ksha. The scorpion roared once more, its thunderous cry echoing throughout the chamber. Reiji activated his supersonic ability, propelling himself with incredible speed to close the distance between him and the formidable monster in a single bound. Despite the scorpion's visible signs of pain and rage, its shell fused together from Yu's powerful attack, it was still surprisingly resilient. As Reiji approached, the scorpion immediately retaliated by unleashing a barrage of needle buckshot toward him. Continuing his charge, Reiji skillfully anticipated the trajectory of the moving projectiles, narrowly evading them with calculated precision. Utilizing his aerodynamics ability, he swiftly created an air-compressed platform beneath him, propelling himself into the sky with a graceful backflip. As he soared through the air, a sense of tranquility washed over him, his body and mind harmonizing in perfect unity. Gripping his spear tightly, he focused his gaze on the scorpion's weakened spot, inflicted by Yu's earlier attack. Infusing his weapon with a substantial amount of mana, his eyes sharpened, his heightened senses reached their peak, and his entire being pulsated with unrestrained energy as the surging mana enveloped both him and his spear. And finally, with a mixture of excitement and exhilaration, he bellowed the words that marked the culmination of his preparation, G.A.E. G. The atmosphere crackled with an intense surge of mana as it swirled and converged into a singular point at the tip of Reiji's spear. With impeccable timing, he thrust his weapon forward, channeling the concentrated mana into a devastating attack. The spear shot forth like a bolt of lightning, leaving behind a trail of shimmering energy that marked its path. Its trajectory displayed unwavering accuracy and destructive power. The scorpion, caught off guard by the sudden surge of power, desperately tried to evade the impending assault, but its efforts were in vain. The spear struck its weakened spot with pinpoint precision, unleashing a violent explosion of energy upon impact. The shockwave reverberated through the battlefield, causing the ground beneath their feet to tremble. As the dust gradually settled, revealing the aftermath of Reiji's devastating attack, a gruesome scene came into view. Reiji sat atop the scorpion's head, his expression a mix of exhaustion and triumph. The spear, Longinus, remained firmly implanted within the creature's skull, pulsating with residual energy. Blood oozed from the scorpion's head, mixing with the thick ichor that dripped from its segmented body. The creature's exoskeleton was shattered, revealing torn flesh and organs beneath. 
The impact had left a gaping hole where the weakened spot once existed, the surrounding area charred and mangled. The ground around the fallen beast was a chaotic display of destruction. Deep gouges marred the earth, created by the scorpion's thrashing attempts to escape its impending doom. Shards of rock and debris littered the area, thrown into disarray by the violent shockwave unleashed upon impact. You looked upon the aftermath with a sense of awe and mesmerization. One reason was the sheer magnitude of the attack, unlike anything she had witnessed before. The other reason was the dramatic transformation in Reiji's appearance. His once jet black hair had turned snow white, now marred by streaks of blood. The exhaustion of his mana had caused the illusion in color to dissipate, revealing his true hair color. Reiji let out a deep sigh and turned his gaze toward you. It's time to leave this place. I have some questions I want to ask you, and in return, you can ask me anything. But for now, let's rest. Reiji took a sip of ambrosia, feeling his stamina and mana gradually replenish. He stood up from his position and approached you. We can rest here. The immediate threats have been neutralized, and this appears to be the safest spot within the labyrinth. Getting a nod in agreement, Reiji settled down beside her. Exhausted, she leaned her back against him as they both took a moment to rest. Chapter 31 Reiji and you gathered the flesh from the vanquished scorpion and transported it to a secluded area on the floor. Utilizing his newly acquired proficiency in earth magic, Reiji skillfully fashioned a suitable dome to meet their needs. Additionally, he used the remains of the scorpion to summon another shadow, his most formidable creation yet. Transporting such a large quantity of meat was no easy task, but with Reiji giving you more of his blood to restore her energy, they teamed up to accomplish the feat. Together, their combined strength, bolstered by Yu's body-empowering magic, allowed them to successfully transport the vast amount of meat to Reiji's hideout. Initially, Reiji had suggested using the room where you had been sealed as their new base, but she firmly rejected the idea. Understandably, after spending centuries trapped within those walls, she was tired of the sight and sought a change of environment. Although they were currently confined to this floor until Reiji replenished his supplies, it was crucial for Yu's mental well-being to be away from that room. Thus, they spent their time conversing and getting to know each other better as they scoured for supplies. So that means you have to be at least 300 years old, right, Yu? Reiji casually commented. It's rude to ask a girl her age, she glared angrily at Reiji. It seemed that even in parallel worlds, inquiring about a girl's age was considered taboo. Sighing, Reiji responded, I'm not asking, just stating. Based on Reiji's recollection, the vampires had been eradicated in a massive war that had engulfed the land 300 years ago. It was likely that you had lost track of time during her imprisonment in the silent darkness, but it was reasonable to assume that she must have been at least that old. If she had been sealed at the age of around 20, then she was probably much older than 300. Do all vampires live as long as you? Reiji inquired. No, you replied, I'm an exception. I don't age because of my regenerative powers. According to her explanation, she had ceased to age ever since awakening to her powers at a young age. While average vampires could extend their lifespan by consuming the blood of other races, their longevity typically didn't exceed 200 years. As a point of comparison, humans in this world had an average lifespan of 70 years, while demons could live up to 120 years. Beast men varied in lifespan depending on their specific race, with elves being able to live for centuries. Yu's extraordinary abilities were attributed to her lineage as she had inherited the blood of the ancient atavistic vampires. This lineage had made her one of the strongest beings in the world during her time, and she had ascended to the throne at the remarkably young age of 17. Furthermore, she discussed the details of her powers with Reiji, addressing his curiosity. According to her, she possessed perfect affinity with every element. However, she admitted to being less proficient in close quarters combat. Her preferred approach involved utilizing strengthening magic to enhance her physical abilities, enabling her to swiftly move around while unleashing spells at a rapid pace. Even though she lacked finesse in close combat, her ability to shrug off wounds due to her innate regeneration, coupled with the overwhelming might of her spells, made her a formidable force capable of vanquishing most adversaries. Anyway. On to the most important question. 
You, do you have any idea where we are? Or any idea how to get back to the surface? Reiji asked, his voice filled with curiosity. Unfortunately, I don't have a definite answer to that, you responded with a tinge of regret. It seemed that she, too, was uncertain about their precise location. However, her trailing off hinted at some knowledge she possessed. According to legend, this labyrinth was constructed by one of the Mavericks. Mavericks? Reiji questioned, his curiosity piqued. It was an unfamiliar word to him, one that had not been mentioned in the library books or by anyone in the kingdom. They were rebels who sought to bring about the end of the world, you explained in her usual reserved manner. Her explanations always took time, but Reiji found himself absorbed in her words as he went about preparing dinner and smoking the meat for later. According to the legends, there were seven descendants who conspired together to orchestrate the destruction of the world. However, their plans were thwarted by the gods, and they were forced to flee to the farthest reaches of the earth. The places of their exile became known as the Seven Great Labyrinths, with the Great Orcus Labyrinth being one of them. It was rumored that the maverick who created this labyrinth resided in its deepest depths, which everyone else referred to as hell. It's possible that there might be a path to the surface there, in the deepest part of the labyrinth, you hypothesized, her gaze fixed on Reiji as he built a fire. I see, Reiji murmured, carefully arranging the meat on a cleaned rock slate. It's possible that there may be a teleportation circle at the end of the abyss. All we have to do is conquer the labyrinth and find it. Reiji, what are you doing here? That was the question he had anticipated the most. After all, they were at the bottom of the abyss, the depths of hell were only monsters called home. But that was just the beginning. One question led to another, cascading like a bursting dam. How could he control mana directly? How could he wield the special magic of monsters? How could he consume monster meat without suffering any ill effects? And the most pressing question of all, was he even human? Glancing at you, Reiji pondered for a moment. It shouldn't matter much if I answer these questions, he thought. Surrendering to her relentless inquiry, he patiently addressed each question, providing thorough explanations. He began with the story of his summoning, followed by his conflict with the Holy Church, his descent into the abyss, his consumption of monster meat, and finally, his current presence here. As their conversation continued, Reiji noticed tears streaming down Yu's face, and he became filled with worry. Gently wiping away her tears, he asked with concern, what's wrong? Sniffing, Yu tried to compose herself and said, Reiji. You suffered so much. Just like me. Her tears were a reflection of her empathy toward Reiji's past experiences. Reiji found it somewhat surprising and even slightly amusing that she saw his trials and punishments as suffering. To him, they were tests and stepping stones toward a new purpose he had found in the abyss. Smiling comfortingly, Reiji continued to pat Yu's head and reassured her, don't worry about it. That is all in the past now. There's no point in dwelling on it. My focus at the moment is finding a way out of here and achieving my goals. Yu, still sniffling, closed her eyes, finding solace in Reiji's comforting gestures. However, her eyes widened in surprise when Reiji didn't mention his intention to return home. You're not planning to return home? She questioned, her voice filled with curiosity and concern. Raising an eyebrow, Reiji replied calmly, of course, I will eventually. However, at this moment, that is not my primary goal. There are unresolved matters that require my attention and answers I need to seek. And since you don't have a home to return to, you're more than welcome to accompany me if you wish. You blinked, taken aback by his response. After a moment of hesitation, she timidly asked, I can really come with you. Her voice carried uncertainty, but her eyes glimmered with hope. Reiji nodded, captivated by the beautiful smile that adorned Yu's face. It was a remarkable transformation from her previously impassive demeanor, and he couldn't help but find her absolutely stunning at that moment. Returning his attention to the food he had prepared, Reiji asked, Would you like some? Considering your regenerative abilities and invulnerability, I don't think the monster meat would have any adverse effects on you. Noticing his gaze, you set the slate down and shook her head, saying, I don't need any food. Is it because you drank my blood? Reiji inquired. She nodded in response, explaining, 
we can absorb nutrients through food as well, but blood is more efficient. I see, Reiji nodded, savoring the last bites of his meal. It consisted of scorpion meat, accompanied by the fruits harvested from the tray ants, and washed down with ambrosia. It was a satisfying and nourishing dinner, excluding the monster meat, which was an acquired taste, to say the least. Reiji hummed in thought, sensing a longing gaze from you. Glancing at her, he noticed her licking her lips as if eyeing prey. Why are you staring at me as if I'm something to eat? He asked, cautious about her intense gaze. Your blood tastes incredibly rich. You trailed off, fixated on Reiji. Sighing, he revealed his neck to her, prompting her to approach and sink her fangs into his flesh, drinking his blood. After a short while, she withdrew, satisfied. You know, Reiji began as he prepared for the night, assigning some of his shadows to guard the area. He continued the conversation with you, making his point clear. I'm not a blood bank. I don't possess regenerative abilities, and ambrosia doesn't exactly replenish blood. Nodding in acknowledgement, you responded, I'll make sure to hold back. Reiji returned her nod before arranging their sleeping areas, using the fur of the numerous monsters he had defeated to create makeshift futons. With the glowstone safely stored away, they prepared for sleep and settled into their bedrolls. Chapter 32 Jurassic Echoes Hey, Reiji, you called out, her hands grasping his neck as she perched on his back. You haven't explained what those shadow creatures are. I've never encountered anything like them before. They possess regenerative abilities and seem to be growing stronger with each battle, albeit slowly. The sight unfolding before them showcased Reiji's shadow army engaged in a fierce battle against a multitude of monstrous creatures resembling T-Rexes, creating a scene reminiscent of Jurassic Park. Despite being outnumbered, Reiji's army displayed a clear advantage in terms of strength, particularly with the presence of powerful scorpions and cyclops on the battlefield. Keeping his gaze fixed on the scene before him, Reiji answered her question after some thought. Within the time I've spent with her, she's watched my back more times than I can count, and she always strives to be helpful. Perhaps it's because I saved her from her prison, but regardless, she's someone I can trust my life with. Snapping out of his reverie, Reiji addressed Yu's inquiry. It's a skill of mine, he began explaining. As you witnessed during your captivity, when I slay a monster, I have the ability to resurrect them as my shadows. It's akin to necromancy, but there's a fundamental difference in the nature of their bodies. My shadows are composed of mana, while conventional necromancy involves reanimating physical bodies that can still be killed. As long as I possess mana, my shadows will remain immortal and inexhaustible. That's cheating, you muttered in disbelief. That's quite hypocritical coming from an immortal vampire who possesses affinity with every element and is skilled in wielding most of them, Reiji scoffed in response to use disbelief. Besides, this skill is not without its limits or drawbacks, Reiji explained. The weaker I am, the fewer shadow soldiers I can reanimate and maintain. Additionally, constantly consuming ambrosia to replenish my mana and regenerate my soldiers comes with a debilitating headache. Nodding in understanding, you raised her hand in the air, conjuring spears of swirling flames out of thin air. With precise aim, she launched them towards the horde of monsters. Reacting swiftly, Reiji recalled his shadows back into his own shadow, anticipating the impact of the incoming attack. The ground shook as the spears struck, causing explosions to resonate through the area. The intense heat melted the heads of the T-Rex monsters, leaving them lifeless within seconds. The flower that had been perched on the remnants of the T-Rex's head fell off with a soft plop. As the smoke gradually cleared and the ground ceased its trembling, Reiji let out a sigh of exasperation. Turning to you, he inquired, mind telling me why you decided to unleash that explosive display? With a furrowed brow, you gazed at Reiji, her expression still blank, but her eyes betraying a hint of worry and confusion. Are you annoyed, Reiji? She asked, her voice tinged with uncertainty. No, I'm not annoyed. I was just wondering, Reiji clarified, his tone calm and understanding. He continued, explaining the observation he had made. Lately, I've noticed that you've been displaying more strength and becoming more aggressive in dealing with any threats that come our way. While I don't have a problem with it, 
it does leave me with fewer opportunities to try out the new magic I've been developing. With that, he started walking away from the scene, in search of the next floor. I want to be useful because I'm your partner, you explained. Nodding in understanding, Reiji responded, you're already more than useful, you. There's no need to push yourself. Even though you excel at magic, close combat is my job as the vanguard. I excel in both, but you're better than me at magic. Reiji. Fine, you replied, her expression downcast. Sensing her mood, Reiji gently stroked her hair and said, stop moping. We have company. As Reiji sensed their surroundings, he noticed that about ten creatures had encircled them, leaving no escape route. It became evident to him that these creatures, similar to the twin-tailed wolves, had the ability to coordinate and hunt in packs. However, a question lingered in his mind, did they possess the same innate abilities as the wolves, or was there another factor at play? As the creatures tightened their encirclement, Reiji's shadow expanded, stretching across a vast expanse of dozens of square meters. The moment they set foot on the shadowy surface, sharp tendrils emerged and pierced their torsos, impaling them mercilessly. Blood oozed from their wounds, staining the ground in dark crimson. The vacant gaze in their eyes betrayed the fading spark of life, their futile struggles turning feeble as their bodies slowly came to a halt. With a chilling silence, the lifeless forms collapsed to the ground as the shadowy tendrils retreated back into the darkness, leaving behind a scene of gruesome carnage. Fixing his gaze on the lone surviving monster, Reiji swiftly swiped his hands through the air, summoning a powerful gust of wind that raced toward the creature. With precise precision, the wind sliced through the air, expertly severing the tulip-like appendage sprouting from the creature's head. The raptor-like creature convulsed momentarily, its body spasming before it clumsily tripped over itself and crashed to the ground, now motionless. A heavy silence descended upon Reiji and Yu as they stood there, their eyes locked on the fallen monster. Is it dead? You asked confusedly. Shaking his head in denial, Reiji swiftly responded, No, I specifically aimed to sever the tulip-like appendage from its head without causing any harm to its body. We need to observe it closely now. If my assumption is correct, this creature may hold the key to our escape from this floor. Casting an illusion to conceal themselves, Reiji and Yu observed with anticipation as the raptor's behavior unfolded. After a brief moment of twitching, it gradually rose to its feet, cautiously surveying its surroundings. Its attention was immediately drawn to the crushed tulip petals, and with deliberate steps, it approached and began to trample them, as if seeking revenge for some perceived harm caused by the flower. Yu's brows furrowed in confusion as she tried to understand the raptor's peculiar behavior. However, before she could delve deeper into her thoughts, Reiji stepped in to provide an explanation. He was being controlled, he stated with certainty, his voice tinged with a mix of concern and intrigue. Yu's curiosity deepened as Reiji mentioned the peculiar strength of the monsters on this floor. Clinging on to Reiji's back, she eagerly sought further clarification. Controlled? She inquired, her voice laced with anticipation. Reiji, creating some distance between them and the raptor, lifted the illusion and proceeded to share his observations. Isn't it strange, you? The monsters here, their strength. It's too weak, he mused, his tone filled with intrigue and a touch of suspicion. Yu was caught off guard by Reiji's unexpected remark. Reflecting on their recent encounters, she couldn't help but acknowledge the truth in his words. The raptors and T. Rex had displayed rudimentary movements, easily predictable and dispatched with relative ease. There was something disconcertingly mechanical about their actions, lacking the organic nature she would expect from such creatures. The contrast became more apparent when she recalled the raptor's response to having its flower severed. Its reaction had felt far more natural, as it crushed the petals to dust, exhibiting an emotional response rather than mere programmed behavior. Just as Reiji was about to address you, his heightened sense presence alerted him to a new threat. A surge of monsters was approaching from all directions, forming an overwhelming army that seemed to be closing in rapidly. Reiji's skill in sensing their presence had a range of 30 meters, which could be expanded to 50 by infusing it with additional mana and mental focus. However, the sheer number of monsters outnumbered his capacity to track them all, with more pouring into his range with each passing second. 
Deploying his shadows to engage the approaching horde, Reiji employed his abilities of aerodynamic and sonic step, swiftly maneuvering through the treacherous terrain of the floor. Yu, concerned by his sudden increase in speed, inquired about the situation. Maintaining his composed and calm demeanor, Reiji responded, there was a group of forty monsters making their way towards us. I dispatched my shadows to intercept them. However, it appears that their efforts will be in vain. We now have twice as many monsters converging upon us. Perched atop a cliff, Reiji cast his gaze across the expansive landscape, his eyes fixating on the distant horizon where the raptors could be seen. Maintaining a mental connection with his shadows, he directed them to carry out their assigned tasks while he focused on the imminent challenge ahead. Descending from Reiji's back, you stood by his side, her gaze focused on the unfolding predicament. Concerned, she asked, do you need help? Shaking his head, Reiji cleared his mind, his eyes growing sharp. Mana began to seep out of his body, gathering and coalescing in his hands. I'll be fine. It's time to test the spell I've been working on. However, since it's still in development, a chant will be necessary. With the horde rapidly closing in, the ground trembled under their thunderous footsteps. The menacing growls and palpable bloodlust of the monsters filled the air, intensifying as they drew nearer to Reiji and Yu. Sensing their imminent arrival, Reiji took a deep breath and began his chant. With closed eyes, Reiji delved deep into his concentration, channeling the essence of his spell. He recited the incantation with precision, his voice resonating with a mystical aura. In the depths of shadows, where secrets lie, I summon the sigh of the Grand Knight. As he spoke, his amethyst and black mana intertwined, swirling around him, while the surrounding shadows stirred in response. The darkness converges, growing within, unleash its power, let chaos begin, Reiji continued his chant, his eyes snapping open to reveal a captivating glow of amethyst, intertwined with an eerie darkness. Dark explosion. With those final words, he thrust his hand forward, releasing the accumulated energy in a blinding burst that surged towards the approaching herd. As Reiji's spell took effect, the ground beneath them trembled and quaked, resonating with the surge of dark power. The air crackled with anticipation, and the surrounding shadows twisted and writhed, as if sensing the impending chaos. Then, with a thunderous roar, the unleashed energy erupted in a cataclysmic display. The explosion itself was a sight to behold. A swirling vortex of amethyst and black, it consumed everything in its path. The destructive energy tore through the air, disintegrating the monsters with savage fury. Their bodies were rent apart, limbs torn asunder, and their agonized screams echoed into the void. The agonized cries of the monsters filled the air, an anguished chorus of pain and despair. Their bodies were thrown asunder, propelled by the explosive force, their forms twisting and contorting in a macabre dance of destruction. The ground was scarred and rent asunder, scattered debris and shattered remnants littering the aftermath. Amidst the chaos, wisps of dark smoke curled and danced, lingering remnants of the explosive spell. The air hung heavy with the scent of singed flesh and the acrid tang of magic unleashed. Reiji's amethyst gaze slowly returned to its usual state, the glow receding into his eyes. Reaching for his veil of ambrosia, Reiji swiftly uncorked it and drank the potent liquid, his mind preoccupied with the immense depletion of his mana. Reflecting on the situation, he realized that his spell, being in its underdeveloped state, had consumed an excessive amount of mana, leaving him feeling drained and exhausted. Even his shadow army had retracted during the process, following the safety measure he had previously instructed, returned to his shadow when telepathic communication was lost. As Reiji gradually regained his strength, Yu's gaze was fixed upon the aftermath with a glimmer of fascination. With an excited tone, she turned to Reiji and inquired, Reiji, what kind of spell was that? I've never seen anything like it before. With a satisfied sigh as his mana began to replenish, Reiji withdrew the vial from his lips and proceeded to address Yu's question. It's a form of explosion magic, Reiji explained, noticing the perplexed expression on Yu's face. This type of magic allows me to create explosive forces that can devastate a wide area or inflict lethal damage on an adversary. You should be capable of wielding similar powers, but I advise against it for now, as your reliance on my blood for magic recovery outweighs the effectiveness of ambrosia. It's not my fault that your blood tastes good, you muttered defiantly. 
Besides, consuming your blood is more efficient for replenishing my mana and obtaining essential nutrients. Exhaling in resignation, Reiji's senses heightened as the sound of another group of monsters approached. Acting swiftly, he lifted you onto his back, ensuring her safety, and wasted no time in making their escape from the area, leaving the imminent threat behind them. End